recess at any time. Pursuant to Committee Rule 2 and House Rule 11, Clause 2, the Chair may postpone further proceedings today on the question of approving any measure or matter or adopting an amendment for which a recorded vote for the A's and A's are ordered. Before we begin in earnest, I want to wish our colleague Lucy McBath a happy birthday. I would like to remind members that we have established an email address and distribution list dedicated to circulating amendments, exhibits, motions, or other written materials that members might want to offer as part of our markup today. If you'd like to submit materials, please send them to the email address that has been previously distributed to your offices, and we will circulate the materials to members and staff as quickly as possible. I would also ask all members, both those in person and those appearing remotely, to mute your microphones when you are not speaking. This will help prevent feedback and other technical issues. You may unmute yourself anytime you seek recognition. Pursuant to notice, I now call up H.R. 7910, the Protecting Our Kids Act for purposes of markup, and move that the committee report the bill favorably to the House. The clerk will report the bill. H.R. 7910 to amend Title 18, United States Code, to provide for an Without objection, the bill is considered as read and open for amendment at any point. I will begin by recognizing myself for an opening statement. In the days since the shooting at Topps Friendly Market Store in Buffalo, New York, in the long sad nights since the shooting at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas, and in just the last few hours, as we learned of yet more deadly gun violence in a Tulsa, Oklahoma medical office building, I have turned to a particular teaching in the Talmud. Whoever takes one life, it's as if he kills the entire world. And whoever saves one life, it's as if he saves the entire world. Every life is precious. Let that be the measure of our work here today. When we think about the children in Uvalde, the nine and 10 year olds just a few days short of their summer vacations, let us think about the whole world that was snuffed out when each of them died. And as we address the scourge of gun violence, a blight that killed 45,000 Americans in 2020 alone, let us remember that there are no perfect solutions. We are painfully aware that we cannot do enough today to save all of these lives, but that each life we save is an entire world. H.R. 7910, the Protecting Our Kids Act, links together important, sensible, overwhelmingly popular proposals that will help us to scale back the scope of gun violence in the United States. Representative Anthony Brown's Raise the Age Act would raise the lawful age to purchase an AR-15 semi-automatic assault rifle from 18 to 21 years old. In deeply red Wyoming, the state with the most guns per capita in the union, this is already the law with respect to many firearms. And I note with great sadness that the suspected shooters in both Buffalo and Duvalde were only 18 years of age. Representative Robin Kelly's Prevent Gun Trafficking Act would establish new federal offenses for gun trafficking and straw purchasing, problems she is as familiar with in Chicago as we are in New York, where the vast majority of firearms used in criminal activity are transported into the city from out of state. Representative David Cicilline's Untraceable Firearms Act would ensure that ghost guns are subject to existing federal firearms regulations. A deadly weapon is a deadly weapon, even if you build it from a kit in your garage. A trio of gun storage proposals, Representative Rosa DeLauro's Ethan's Law, Representative Alyssa Slotkin's Safe Guns, Safe, Act, Safe Kids Act, and Representative Sheila Jackson Lee's Kimberly Vaughan Firearm Safe Storage Act would establish voluntary best practices for safe firearm storage and award grants for firearm storage assistance, pro assistance programs. There are nearly 400 million firearms in America today. We should at least ensure that they're stored safely and away from our children. Representative Dina Titus's Closing the Bump Stock Loophole Act would build on existing regulations banning the manufacture, sale, or possession of bump stocks for civilian use. Remember, it was the Trump administration that first enacted this ban on devices that essentially convert semi-automatic weapons into machine guns and serve no purpose other than to maximize carnage, as we learned when they were used in the deadly shooting in Las Vegas that killed 58 people in 2018. Finally, Representative Ted Deutsch's Keep Americans Safe Act would ban the sale, manufacture, and illegal possession 
of gun magazines that hold more than 10 rounds of ammunition. High capacity magazines are designed for mass killing and have been the accessory of choice in some of the bloodiest shootings in our history, including the 2007 shooting at Virginia Tech and the 1999 shooting at Columbine High School. I am reminded that the shooter in Aurora, Colorado in 2012 murdered 12 people and not the entire movie theater only because his 100 round magazine jammed during the shooting. At the outset, let me say that each of these proposals is wildly popular with the American public, although that has not stopped many Republican officials from speaking out in recent days against passing sensible gun safety legislation. Because we know from experience that few events expose the emptiness of the gun lobby's rhetoric, like the mass murder of school children, allow me to rebut some of my Republican colleagues' arguments in advance. Nobody seriously believes that Hollywood or video games are to blame for the epidemic of gun violence in America. Our children watch the same movies and play the same games as children in Canada and England and Japan. But only in the United States do we ask the parents of elementary school children to stand in line so we can match their DNA to the remains of their children, because only the United States is awash in 400 million guns. You say that these deaths were caused by a lack of mental health care? I agree that we need to do more for those in our communities who may be in crisis. And I hope that you will join me the next time we are asked to fund such initiatives. I expect that many of my Republican colleagues will not. But I note again that other countries have people who are just as sick as sick Americans, and that those countries do not experience the gun violence that we do here. You say it's too soon to take action? that we are politicizing these tragedies to enact new policies. It has been 23 years since Columbine, 15 years since Virginia Tech, 10 years since Sandy Hook, seven years since Charleston, four years since Parkland and Santa Fe and the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. It has been three years since El Paso. It has been a week since we learned again that gun violence can reach any of our children and grandchildren at any time, and that no number of armed guards can guarantee their safety. It has not even been 24 hours since the last mass shooting, and who knows how long until the next one. Too soon? My friends, what the hell are you waiting for? You say that none of the solutions proposed here will stop gun violence in America? Well, there, sadly, I agree. This bill will not alone save every life we will lose to gun violence this year but it will save some. It might have saved those children in Uvalde, and whoever saves one life, it says if he saved the entire world. The American people are begging for us to address this crisis. Let us not wait one second longer. I urge my colleagues to support the Protecting Our Kids Act, and I yield back. I now recognize the ranking member of the Judiciary Committee, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan, for his opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, life is precious, especially the lives of children. What happened in Uvalde, Texas is tragic. It is every family's worst nightmare. Our hearts go out to the Uvalde community and especially to the families who've lost loved ones last week in this evil act of violence. And of course, there's what happened yesterday in Tulsa and a few weeks ago in Buffalo and our hearts go out to those families as well. No one wants another tragedy. No one wants this to happen again. That's why it's regretful that Democrats have rushed to a markup today in what seems more like political, political theater than a real attempt at improving public safety or finding solutions. The Democrats never once reached out to us to seek our input on the legislation we are considering here today. Protecting children is not a Republican or Democrat issue. The Democrats cobbled together a package of measures this is not a real attempt, in my judgment, to find solutions. Everyone here knows the reality. Democrats are in control of the House. Anything that you and Speaker Pelosi want to pass, you can pass. And frankly, you've already passed numerous bills related to firearms this Congress. But because those bills are radical attempts to legislate away Second Amendment rights of law-abiding citizens, the Senate has not taken up the legislation, just like it won't take up this bill. What we are doing here is just designed to appeal to Democratic primary voters. The bill won't make our schools safer. It will hamper the rights of law-abiding citizens. 
and it will do nothing to stop mass shootings. We need to get serious about understanding why this keeps happening. Democrats are always fixated on curtailing the rights of law-abiding citizens rather than trying to understand why this evil happens. Until we figure out the why, we will always mourn losses without fixing the problem. Our job is to figure out the why. The bill that Democrats are putting forward today does not help us to understand what's really driving some young men to commit these heinous acts. The bill before us is short-sighted and not solutions-oriented. It's a one-size-fits-all approach that punishes law-abiding citizens while doing nothing to make our community safer. We all want to keep children safe in school, but this bill wouldn't do that. This bill is just another Democrat attack on the Second Amendment, and it's likely just the start. President Biden has said he wants to ban all 9-millimeter handguns. Where does it end? The American people expect and deserve more from us than political charades that rehash old ideas and don't actually solve the underlying problems. Mr. Chairman, we should do better than this. I yield back and look forward to the debate on the legislation. Mr. Chairman. Without objection, all other opening statements will be included in the record. I now recognize myself for purposes of offering an amendment in the nature of a substitute. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 7910, offered by Mr. Nadler of New York. Without objection, the amendment in the nature of a substitute will be considered as read and shall be considered as base text for purposes of amendment. I will recognize myself to explain the amendment. The amendment makes only cosmetic changes and makes no substantive changes to the bill. I urge all members to support it, and I yield back the balance of my time. Are there any amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? For what purpose does Ms. Jackson Lee seek recognition? I'd like to strike the last word. Gentlemen, ladies, recognize. A few minutes before this hearing, I spoke to Mr. Garza. I spent time with Mr. Garza in Uvalde this past Sunday. Amory, just a baby in the fourth grade, Dial 911. She may have saved or tried to save many lives in the pillage, carnage, and death of what was to be a wonderful ending of her fourth year in school. She didn't have that opportunity. Cigars are lost his only child. He pleaded on behalf of broken parents, many of whom who could not speak, for us to do something. For us to do something. Look at the faces. These are not class graduation pictures. They're dead children. Just like the dead grocery store shoppers in Buffalo. Or the people simply seeking a medical appointment in Tulsa. This has been decades of work for many members around this table, including myself. Chairman, H.R. 7910, Protecting Our Kids, is a combination of humanity, courage, decency, and action. I'm holding the Constitution. I don't see a match that's lit the Constitution that has extinguished it. I don't see any elimination of the Second Amendment that needs a constitutional process to even address that question. I asked the NRA, Mr. Lapier, Wayne LaPierre, meet with us. We're in a crisis of death. We have a war on the children of America. I, for one, cannot stand in a stupor of stupidness. I believe it is crucial that what we did some years ago, sit on the floor of the House when we were in Republican control after Sandy Hook, 
just to do something. And here we are again. And I remember the words of John Lewis, who said, where is the heart of this body, the Congress? Where is our soul? Where is our moral leadership? Where is our courage? From Columbine, of which I served at that time, on the Columbine Task Force, to the countless numbers of children that have died because guns have not been stored or guns did not have a device as the storage bills reflect. This is the question of whether or not we as Americans are blind. Do we only see the power and money of gun manufacturers? Are we not sensitive to Boulder, Atlanta, Tree of Life, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, Las Vegas, San Bernardino, Gilroy, Garlic, Washington Navy Yard, Sandy Hook Elementary, Virginia Tech, Aurora, the Sikh Temple, Emmanuel African Methodist Church, or Santa Fe in Texas near my district. El Paso, if I did not mention it. And so today, I'm reminded of the great and outstanding work of my colleagues. I thank you. You have introduced these bills over and over again, and I'll have an opportunity to discuss how important your legislation is, but we are not finished. The assault weapons ban is a necessity. A seven-week waiting period is a necessity. Actions against manufacturers to give civil liability is a necessity. And countering the cycle of violence is a necessity. I end by simply saying Kimberly Vaughn died in Santa Fe. She was 17 years old. Her mother is still in pain in Texas. And I'm calling on all of you to have a sense of humanity, courage, decency. God knows we need action, for it is a sin and a shame on us. Not this Judiciary Committee, Mr. Nadler. You have done great work on the House and the Senate and then to the president's desk. Shame on us if we can't move legislation now. I yield back. General Lady yields back. For what purposes, Mr. Shabbat seek recognition? Move strike layer forward, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you. It's obviously with a heavy heart uh, that we're all participating in this markup today. Words cannot adequately express the horror that all Americans felt last week as we learned of the 21 innocent lives that were lost at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas, which only added to the deep sadness we all felt a short time earlier when 10 people were senselessly killed in Buffalo. Given the shock and the revulsion that we all feel from those two horrific problems, it's easy to understand why we're considering this legislation today. It's only human nature to search for answers and feel the need to do something to address a situation this troubling and this concerning. But the question we need to ask ourselves before we act, Mr. Chairman, is what actions can we take in a constitutionally permissive manner that will actually help make the American people, particularly school children, safer? The most obvious answer to that question is that we can take action to make our schools more secure. After the tragic shooting in Parkland, Florida, former sheriff himself led a bipartisan group of members, myself included, in reauthorizing and expanding the Cop Secure Our Schools grant program. That program provides necessary funds to states and local school districts to strengthen security measures at schools across the country. The money can be used for metal detectors to adopt security plans, to train school officials, to hire school resource officers, including retired police officers, and to help identify students with mental health issues. The students and teachers, but there's always room for improvement. And that's one area where I believe we could be working together to find common ground and make students safer, and it would be immediately. I also think we could work together on methods to better address the mental health crisis that's facing so many of our nation's youth today. Too often, the shootings that occur are perpetrated by primarily young men who feel marginalized 
and who appear to be suffering from some form or another of mental illness. Finding a way to identify these young people earlier and to help get them the treatment that they need before the tragedy strikes is a goal upon which I think we could all agree. As I mentioned earlier, the Secure Our Schools grant money can be used for that purpose. But as we saw in Buffalo, the issue is broader than just in our schools. There was also some agreement on bump stocks, which is why the ATF under President Trump acted to ban them. As most of us know, there's still an ongoing challenge in the federal courts against this ban, which is probably why a provision banning bump stocks is included in the legislation being considered today. I understand the intention here, but I would probably, uh, I think it'd be more effective if we allowed the court cases semi-automatic rifles by those under the age of 21. I think this is another area where some form of bipartisan agreement might be possible. However, considering that a similar prohibition in California was just ruled unconstitutional by the Ninth Circuit of all courts three weeks ago, it would probably be more prudent uh, that we review that decision and try to determine what could be accomplished in accordance with the Second Amendment. Simply moving forward with a provision that even the Ninth Circuit thinks is unconstitutional really isn't doing anybody any good. And that's the crux of my argument against this legislation. The majority is simply acting quickly because they believe it's important to act quickly. In doing so, I'm afraid they are for, they're foregoing an opportunity to actually work together and hopefully produce a better piece of legislation, which is what they're apparently trying to do in the Senate. We could do it in the House as well, Mr. Chairman but not if the majority is so focused on the speed of the legislation rather than its merits. I think we should say, stay focused on the merits. Unfortunately, that's not what we're doing today. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Without objection, a statement from Representative Rosa DeLauro, whose legislation, Ethan's Law, is an important component of the Protecting Our Kids Act, will be entered into the record. Uh, for what purpose does Mr. Cohen seek recognition? Strike the last word. Gentlemen is recognized. This is no rush to action. This has been delayed for decades. I was here 15 years ago when Virginia Tech was the site of a mass killing. And in 15 years, we haven't gotten gun laws changed and reformed. This bill, which is somewhat of a compilation of other laws, all should have been law before, but should be law today. And the Democrats are not rushing to anything. The public is demanding that we take action because they've seen what happened in Uvalde, Texas. They've seen what happened in Buffalo. They've seen what happened last night in Tulsa. It is happening all too often and it's deadly. Assault weapons were banned from 1994 to 2004. It was constitutionally permissible. It wasn't until 2008 in the Heller decision, when Justice Scalia said that people had a right, based on the Second Amendment, to protect their homes with reasonable weapons, and said that that was not something that would prohibit government from having more restrictive laws on people who had mental health problems and or people who had criminal backgrounds or other possible changes in the law. The Second Amendment, like the First, is not absolute. The First Amendment, you cannot defame people. You cannot go into a theater and holler fire. There are limits, and there are limits to the Second Amendment. And assault weapons is one of those limits we've had for 10 years. During that time, we had less mass killings in this country, and we should have it again. Assault weapons are made to kill. The picture that Ms. Jackson Lee had up here of those 19 children, the last time you'll be able or anybody would be able to recognize some of them because when they're hit with an assault weapon, they cannot be identified. They are obliterated, and they need DNA to identify them. They put holes in their bodies so large that there's no way they could survive. They are weapons of war and weapons of death and weapons of destruction that we should not permit out here. And when somebody who's 18 years old and right after their birthday, they go and one of the first things they do is buy an assault weapon, that should be a red flag. 
Where is that person coming from? That's what they want on their 18th birthday is an assault weapon. They got a problem, which means we got a problem, which means those 19 kids and their parents and those two teachers have a problem forever. The NRA has too much of a grip on this Congress and on the Senate. It needs to stop. They're in the business of representing gun manufacturers and selling guns and selling ammunition and not caring about what it does to innocent human beings. They don't care about children. It's not just schools, Mr. Shabbat. My friend, Mr. Shabbat, talked about the school bill. Yeah, it's terrible what happened to Uvalde and in Parkland, et cetera. But it's movie theaters. It's grocery stores. It's anywhere in America. There's something gun crazed about our country that we need to deal with. This isn't going to stop all the killings, but it'll stop some. Will it stop a law-abiding citizen? Sometimes, maybe. Will it stop non-law-abiding citizens? Yes. And that's what we need to see, that there are good background checks and that there are limits on who can get an assault weapon. These are changes that our country wants and that this bill addresses. Bump stocks, the issue with keeping them in the courts, that's an issue about jurisdiction, not about bump stock and the ability of the Congress to outlaw them. It's a, whether justice could do it through rules and regulations. We need to do it by law. And ghost guns should be prohibited. Now there's some new fangled deal that I've come across in the city of Memphis where they've intercepted some, some metal parts that have come in from China that turn pistols into semi-automatic weapons into fully automatic weapons. Customs and Border Protection in Memphis have seized 40 devices recently that turned semi-automatic handguns to fully automatic. Now we're working on that. That should be prohibited too. There's something wrong in America and this committee needs to deal with it today and it will. I appreciate Mr. Cicilline's bill that does ban assault weapons. I had an amendment to do that today because it needed to be debated and it needs to be enacted. But for considerations of Mr. Cicilline's precedence on this bill, I'm not going to offer it today. But we need to pass it, and we need to pass everything here, and it's time that our Republican colleagues stopped offering just thoughts and prayers, but offered solutions and cared about the people who are dying. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back for what purposes the gentleman from Arizona seek recognition? Move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, uh, the day after the Uvalde shooting, I had the opportunity to meet with uh, CBP Chief Ortiz and also talk with marshals who were on the scene in uh, that school. I happened to be in South Texas at that time. And it is, it is not a tragedy. It is beyond a tragedy. A tragedy imputes some kind of um, non-intentional or accidental uh, uh, Events. This this was beyond that. This was a deliberate, malicious, evil uh, event uh, by this this 18 year old uh, young man, and so uh, it's beyond a tragedy, and it most certainly does need to be addressed and needs to be investigated further. There have been multiple multiple uh, accounts as there as there normally would be. Uh, from parents, from law enforcement who was on the scene, um, from Border Patrol agents, who, the BORTAC unit, etc. I hope that we can get to the bottom of exactly what transpired there so we understand it more fully. Um, I, I also express um, more than just heartfelt thoughts towards the families uh, uh, who were affected and, and the community itself that was uh, impacted by this. But I also think it's important, Mr. Chairman, uh, to consider um, a whole host of additional pieces of information. And I'm, I'm throughout the course of the day, I will, I will submit various uh, studies, articles uh, dealing with these gun shootings. For instance, Mr. Chairman, I submit for the record a, a piece entitled Chicago's had most mass shootings in the U.S. since 2018. What's the solution? That objection. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's from CBS Chicago that uh, was, was de discussing that um, post Uvalde. And also, Mr. Chairman, uh, another piece called Chicago had 971 shootings in the first half of the year while violence is trending down from the pandemic peak. It is still way too high. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The left and the Democrats' response to virtually every problem is to take more power and control into the national government and take away individual rights or throw taxpayers' money at the problem, sometimes both. That's why they tend to exacerbate virtually every problem without res resolution. They misidentify the cause of virtually every effect. The misuse of guns for criminal or even evil purposes is another example. Millions of Americans safely and responsibly own and use guns. Previous Democrat-controlled departments of justice have conservatively estimated that guns are used 1.5 million times per year to save lives. I repeat, the Department of Justice under Democrat control and leadership under Democrat administrations have done their studies and conservatively estimated that guns are used 1.5 million times per year to save lives. Other studies have put that number as high as 2.5 million times per year that a gun is used to save life. Most of the time, the vast majority of the time, it is merely by brandishing a weapon that, the, uh, that stops the violent criminal conduct without having to shoot. The idea that disarming Americans who lawfully, legally own guns, the idea that disarming them will produce a safer, crime-free America is simply not true. I will be going into the Australia studies that are, I will go into the 17 nation international studies as we go throughout this day. We will review again in my comments from time to time, the Chicago, Portland, New York City, Seattle, and other bastions of left-wing gun control uh, areas where the public is not safer because of the gun control laws. In fact, they are more at risk. Mr. Chairman, this is an important hearing. I think it's probably premature in relationship and being driven by uh, the response to Uvalde, and I understand that. But I also think that uh, sometimes visceral reactions might overshadow the statement of facts that we need to discuss. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. General yields back for what purpose does the gentlelady from Texas seek recognition? Uh, Ms. Garcia. I move to strike the last word, Mr. Chairman. The uh, gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And for many of us in Texas, our souls are crushed, our hearts are broken, but many minds are wondering, why is this still happening? No, this is not rushing. No, it's not premature. 23 years have passed since Columbine, and the time is now to act. Enough is enough. We cannot allow another disgrace like what happened in Uvalde to tear apart one more community and to tear up more families. Jacqueline Caceres, Makina Lee Elrod, Jose Manuel Flores, Ileana Garcia, Irma Garcia, Asaya Garcia, Ameri Jo Garza, Javier Lopez, JC Carmelo Loivamos, Tess Mata, Miranda Mathis, Eva Mireles, Elitaya Ramirez, Annabelle Rodriguez, Maitai Rodriguez, Alexandria Lexi Rubio, Leila Salazar, Jayla Nicole Silgorio, Eliana Cruz Torres, Rogelio Torres, these are the names of the 19 children and two teachers, innocent lives tragically lost. Children, now angels, watching us from above to see what we are doing. One young man pulled the trigger, but we all have failed them. America has failed them and the other thousands of children that have died as a result of gun violence. 
Republicans are complicit in Uvalde's negligence and neglect to responsibly address comprehensive gun reform. Republicans are complicit in the shooter in Buffalo for encouraging white supremacy and promoting replacement theory. Republicans are complicit of the lives lost at Pulse, Florida for their homophobic and anti-human rights narrative. Republicans are complicit in the massacre in El Paso for their anti-Latino, anti-immigrant narrative and for putting gun lobbying interests above people's lives. House Democrats stand with the victims and their loved ones. We stand to act for the people, not gun interests. We have been consistent. We are not rushing. We have already passed some bills. They're all solutions. They're not premature. We have passed reforms and measures to ensure that we're protecting our communities and most especially our little children, our angels. The community that was assaulted in here in Texas was a predominantly Latino community. So to my neighbors in Uvalde, I say this, no los vamos a olvidar. No vamos a olvidar los nombres y las caras de los 19 niños que perdieron su vida. No olvidamos los responsables de esta tragedia. Seguimos luchando hasta cuando ya pasemos reformas de la Alianza de Armas de Fuego. Gracias. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With that, I yield back. The gentlelady yields back for what purposes Mr. McClintock seek recognition. I to speak on the amendment. Uh, clerk will report the amendment. Oh, the gentleman uh, strikes the last word. The gentleman's recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, the atrocity in Uvalde is shocking and heartbreaking in, in so many ways. The uh, slaughter of innocents is the greatest of all human crimes, and I think it rightly prompts soul searching by all men and women of goodwill for the, for the causes and remedies. It's disturbing, though, some have used this and other recent attacks to justify either partisan attacks like we just heard, uh, or policies uh, as before us today to make it harder for law-abiding citizens to obtain firearms in, in the hope that by doing so, that someday maybe they'll become unavailable to the lawless. Well, I think this overlooks the obvious immediate action that is long overdue in this world of, of sin and woe. You know, if you walk into any bank in this country, you'll see at least one armed guard whose purpose is to protect our money with lethal force. And yet at Uvalde and in so many other school shootings, we were not willing to protect our children with the same force as we protect our money. No one gives a second thought to an armed guard at a bank, yet the left is outraged by the mere suggestion of placing an armed guard at every school filled with innocent children. When are we going to get serious and take the world as it is rather than how we wish it should be? Even for those trained and licensed to carry concealed weapons, it was against both state and federal law to bring a firearm into the Robb Elementary School. Every administrator, every teacher, every janitor obeyed that law. The only person who didn't was the madman. And that, in a nutshell, is the danger of gun control laws. You know, we have more than 50 years of experience now with these laws. They are extremely effective at disarming law-abiding citizens as they were that tragic day in Uvalde. They are extremely ineffective at disarming madmen and criminals as they also were that day. They create an environment where the gunman is king. Now, after every tragedy, politicians rush to pass more gun control laws as, as we're doing today. We've been doing this now for 50 years. If these laws actually worked, wouldn't things be getting better by now rather than worse? The proportion of households with firearms has dropped significantly in the last 40 years. Shouldn't things be getting better and not worse? Meanwhile, we've neglected the obvious. The dangerously mentally ill are not confined and treated as they were in the past. I calculated in California alone, we'd have roughly 100,000 more mentally ill confined in mental facilities today if we maintain the same proportion of the populations in 1960. Those 100,000 dangerously mentally ill are out on our streets instead. Secondly, gun criminals often escape prosecution at the hands of woke district attorneys. Let me give you just one example. Hunter Biden 
illegally acquired a handgun despite being an admitted drug addict, a handgun that ended up being taken out of a public trash can 500 feet from a school. He also lied on his firearms application. Nobody's prosecuting him despite there being no disputes to the facts. Why not? But most obviously and immediately, in almost every one of these atrocities, there was no shoot back. Now, ironically, just such an event happened the very next day in Charleston, West Virginia. A criminal with an AR-15 style rifle approached a graduation party. He fired into the crowd but missed. Moments later, a woman with a concealed weapons permit returned fire and killed him on the spot. You probably haven't heard of that incident because on that occasion, there was a good guy with the freedom to return fire. That freedom was denied at Robb Elementary School. You know, if we could actually banish all guns from all criminals, sign me up. But I suspect that gun laws will be about as effective at keeping guns out of the hands of madmen and terrorists and criminals as our drug laws have been at keeping drugs out of the hands of addicts. The difference is the drug laws don't disarm law-abiding citizens from defending themselves. Gun laws do. The one thing we can do right now, this instant, that will have an immediate effect in stopping such slaughters is to assure that every school has the same protection as your average bank and that every school official with the training and licensing can carry a concealed weapon if they choose. And if we're not willing to take that simple, immediate, and wholly effective step, then we're obviously not serious about stopping these outrages. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose is the gentleman from Rhode Island seek recognition? I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I want to begin by thanking you for this markup and for bringing this really important piece of legislation to the committee. Guns have become the leading cause of death for American kids. Let that sink in, the leading cause of death. And for those who have said, oh, we're rushing this, more than 311,000 students have experienced gun violence since Columbine. So tell the parents who lost children, tell the family members who saw loved ones slaughtered that we're rushing. The real question is, why has it taken us so long? And there's one reason. We don't have Republican colleagues in the fight with us. We passed two bills to strengthen criminal background checks. Our ranking member just described those as radical attempts to take away the Second Amendment to explain Republican inaction in the Senate. That's a bill supported by 90% of the American people. Common sense, as well as closing the Charleston loophole. Enough with these bogus arguments about the Second Amendment. This is about fulfilling our responsibility to keep our constituents safe from gun violence. We have a gun violence epidemic in this country. Over 200 mass shootings, 27 school shootings just this year. And every one of those victims is a child, a sister, a brother, a parent, a loved one of people that we have a responsibility to represent in this country and in this Congress. This set of proposals will significantly reduce gun violence in this country. There's not a single bill we can pass that will eliminate all gun violence. We'd all be for that. But this will make sure that you have to be old enough to have some mature judgment before you can own an assault rifle, that you can't use high capacity magazines that can slaughter innocents at a quicker pace, that we end gun trafficking and straw purchases that help criminals get guns, that we practice safe storage, eliminate bump stocks, and eliminate ghost guns so you can't secretly produce a gun and then do damage. And the ranking member said, well, these bills punish law-abiding citizens. What one of those bills punishes anyone? And even if you think it's some small burden, it pales in comparison to the burden and the punishment that victims of gun violence have had to experience. So save this claim that somehow this is just too much for law-abiding gun owners. It's just not true. And we have an opportunity today, and I was hoping when we came to Washington for this emergency markup in direct response to gun violence continuing to ravage our country, that we would be met with colleagues on the other side of the aisle who would join us in this effort. These bills, the five components of this bill have been introduced for, for a long time, some of them over multiple Congresses. These are not new issues. 
But our approach ought to be different today. We ought to work together in a bipartisan way and pass this bill out of this committee so we can demonstrate to the American people that we are committed to doing everything in our power to reduce gun violence in this country. And, you know, we've heard these same tired arguments that somehow we can't do this because the Constitution prohibits it. That is also not true. The Supreme Court of the United States has said time and time again, that the Second Amendment is not absolute. That Congress and states have the ability, and I would say the responsibility, to ensure that there are appropriate restrictions, both on age, on places where you can bring firearms, or the kind of firearms you can possess. That's long been recognized by the Supreme Court. So don't let our Republican colleagues hide behind this claim that, oh, we'd love to do something. We really know this is a serious problem. We extend our thoughts and prayers, and we would do more, but you know, the Second Amendment prohibits it. That is not true. Their refusal to join us in this effort is a direct result of the power and the resources of the gun lobby in America. And really the importance of just the proliferation of gun sales, because that's how the gun lobby makes its money. And so then they don't want any restriction any limitation on how many guns can be sold and as quickly as possible to anyone who wants them. That's not the kind of America we want to live in. And I think for the sake of my constituents, for the sake of young people, seniors, all victims of gun violence, we have a responsibility to do something. And I hope this is the second package of gun safety bills we'll do. I hope we'll do more. And then it will be incumbent on our colleagues in the Senate to send these bills to the president's desk. And if they don't, it will be clear to the American people who's fighting for common sense gun safety legislation and who is standing in the way. And it will explain why we continue to be a country that has a gun violence epidemic. We cannot allow this to continue. I urge my colleagues to support this act, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purposes, Mr. Bishop, seek recognition? Strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. You know, it's, I was just thinking, so I'm going to take up the gentleman from Rhode Island's uh, challenge. He, he just said that there's really not any significant constitutional issue at stake whatsoever, that the Constitution doesn't prohibit this. Um, it seems to me that um, you'd have to know, wouldn't you? I, mean, I looked at the majority guidance, staff guidance on this, and it has this one sentence about talking about some states having adopted bans on 18 to 20 year olds. Con, uh, if the gentleman will yield, uh, I'm happy I, I, to answer I, I, that. Your time. Let me let me speak to it for a minute so I can uh, thicken the plot. Just a minute, Mr. Cicilline. Uh, you said that uh, or the majority guidance says yet these laws speaking of uh, bans in some states on uh, on semi-automatic rifles being banned to 18 to 20 year olds. So yet these laws have been challenged in the federal courts. They referenced two cases, didn't say anything else about it. Well, I decided to read them. And so the Jones versus Bonta case from the Ninth Circuit, one of the most liberal circuits in the country, federal case, just came down last month that said California's ban on the sale of centerfire of semi-automatic rifles to 18 to 20 year olds violates the Constitution. It says that it goes through this long analysis of the history of the Second Amendment and says those rights to self-defense at the core of the Second Amendment that 18 to 20 year olds are covered by that right. They say, just like virtually every other, in fact, I think every other right in the Bill of Rights applies to 18 to 20 year olds. Uh, and, and there's another case, there's a case from the Fourth Circuit from where I come from. It was vacated for mootness after being issued, but it was an analysis of the federal uh, ban on sales of handguns to 18 to 20 year olds. And it said this came to the same conclusion that the Second Amendment applies. And even the dissenting judge there said, here the majority has done careful historical research and has assembled persuasive evidence that young adults aged 18 to 20 had Second Amendment rights at the time the amendment was ratified. So when we undertake to do something, in the words of the general lady from Texas, isn't it incumbent on the House Judiciary Committee? to consider, to evaluate what the Constitution allows Congress to do consistent with the supreme law of the land? So at least two parts of this proposed hodgepodge raise questions about constitutionality. The ban on the sale of semi-automatic rifles and shotguns to 
18 to 20 year olds, and also the provision about gun storage at home. Heller, by the United States Supreme Court, spoke to that. Why would there be no analysis or no consideration? But there's a willingness to just ram through this package, and the answer is, we don't have any patience for you if you're objecting. The voices are raised, the accusations are made, Republicans are complicit. I can tell you this, and let me be clear, you are not going to bully your way into stripping Americans of fundamental rights. And it also, unfortunately, it follows a pattern that we've discussed before. Just a couple of weeks ago, you ran through a bill concerning amicus briefs in the Supreme Court that would require the disclosure of charitable organization donors in violation of their First Amendment rights of association. I pointed it out then that you had attempted to do the same party, had attempted to do the same thing in 1958 in the NAACP case in Alabama, that you did the same thing, not coincidentally, in California, since we're talking about the California, uh, the Ninth Circuit decision. In another case involving Mr. Bonta, the attorney general out there, just last year, you, you just bl blundered right over that because you don't care. You're, you're, you're cavalier about the leak of the draft opinion from the Supreme Court. You want to pack the Supreme Court. It's not, that's if not the general yield, I'm happy to answer your question. Uh, uh, no, I, I think I've answered the question, but I'd be glad not to accurately. You, you, do you are you you're in the disregard what the Ninth Circuit has said the no, law I, of the I'm land I'm actually is? bound by the Supreme Court of the United States, and I'd like to read the quote to you if you'll allow me, since you raised the question. I, look, I think the issue is what that Ninth Circuit case well, said the, not, on the subject. The United States Supreme Court takes precedence yield. over the Ninth Circuit. I don't yield. You'll have plenty of time. Here's the, here's a great quote. Your allies form mobs outside justices' homes. Yeah, you say you've, look, look, you've got to figure out something else other than stripping people of their constitutional rights. We've got to figure out something else. Assuming that the majority entertains a discussion, but you cannot, the courts have made it pretty clear, you cannot deprive young adults any more than the remainder of Americans of their core Second Amendment right to self-defense by the purchase and possession of weapons that are in common use and prevalent. And I'll say one, well, I'm out of time. Gen the gentleman yields back. Uh, for what purposes, Ms. Dean, seek recognition? To strike the last word, Mr. Chairman. General is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I thank you for calling us to this emergency markup of the Protecting Our Kids Act. Uh, it is timely. In fact, we've all been clamoring for this kind of legislation for a very, very long time. Uh, I, I'm stunned by some of the words that we're hearing on the other side of the aisle. Where is their outrage over the slaughter of 19 fourth graders and their two teachers? Why don't they feel an urgency to do something? I'm reminded of the John Donne poem that ends, do not ask for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. It tolls for us. We have to stop saying, oh, where was the shooting? Tulsa? Buffalo? Uvalde? Parkland? Stop asking for whom the bell tolls. Whose funerals are we watching this week? It tolls for us. Our souls are being drenched out of this society. Before I discuss the important merits of the legislation, let's ground the debate in these last two slaughters. Actually, they're not the last, but the two that were some of the urgency that brought us here. On May 14th, 2020, 10 black people were killed in a racist mass shooting, simply shopping for groceries. Roberta Drury, 32. Marcus Morrison, 52, Andre McNeil, 53, Aaron Salter, 55, Geraldine Talley, 62, Celestine Cheney, 65, Hayward Patterson, 67, Catherine Massey, 72, Pearl Young, 77, Ruth Whitfield, 86. It's untimely that we're here. What's untimely is being slaughtered in a supermarket by an 18-year-old with an assault-style weapon that he bought himself, too, 
sort of as a birthday celebration, with hundreds of rounds of ammunition. You're worried about restricting that purchase and that slaughter, and you're not worried about the untimely deaths of 10 black people in a supermarket. And only 10 days later, 19 children and two teachers killed, and I know you heard the names, but I'm going to say their first names again. McKenna, Layla, Miranda, Nevea, Jose, Xavier, these are all 10 and 11 year olds, I should be saying. Tess, 10, Roleo, 10, Ellie, 9, Elihana, 10, Annabelle, 10, Jackie, 9, Uzia, 10, Jace, 10, Mate, 10, Jalia, 10, Amari, 10, Lexi, 10, Alethea, 10, and their teachers, Irma, 48, and Eva, 44. As we have heard, one of the children called twice, at least twice, said, send the police. One of the children recounted how she took the blood of her dead friend lying near her and smeared herself with that blood to pretend to be dead. What have we taught our children? This is on our watch. Where is the outrage? I will tell my friends on the other side of the aisle who for some reason stand against these common sense measures that would save lives, not all lives, but would save lives. You're way behind the curve. Gun owners, Americans, by and large, want these measures. I don't know what bubble you're living in. I guess surrounded by a powerful gun lobby trying to hold on to your seats. But the America is way ahead of you. The outrage is real. We didn't learn it after Columbine. We didn't learn it after Sandy Hook. Please, God, let us stop the shame on our country. Pass these laws. Say that an 18-year-old cannot go in and slaughter our children or black people because they don't like black people. Join us. Join us in saving lives. We couldn't have a more important job to do. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. General Lady yields back for our purpose. This is a gentleman from Florida seek recognition. Strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. I, I don't, I will confess, I don't know much about the gun lobby that my uh, colleague referenced because I don't meet with any lobbyists. I don't take their donations uh, and I don't take any donations from any of the political action committees that are for or against any of these measure, measure, measures. But I can speak for law abiding gun owners who are very concerned about some of the bills that are before us. It is reflexive and it is irresponsible to consider bills while we're still trying to figure out what happened in some of these circumstances that you suggest animated the need for this hearing. The chairman referenced Uvalde in the first moments of this hearing, but yet we're still deciphering key elements of the law enforcement response, of the physical plant, of points of intrusion. And it is not kind and it is not compassionate to tell people that you're doing something to help them when in fact you have no idea whether or not this legislation that you fashioned would in fact do that. I would suggest that it's potentially cruel to tell people that they've inspired a response to a tragedy when in fact that response won't work. But who would wanna be associated with such a thing? My colleagues asked the question, where's the outrage? I would observe that perhaps outrage isn't the most responsible and pensive way to write a bill, to address a problem. I heard on Sunday, Senator Chris Murphy praise the Florida legislation in response to the violence in Parkland. And while there's a lot in that legislation I didn't like, mainly the gun control, there were provisions that I think we could work on that have made schools safer in Florida. For example, no longer leaving schools as gun-free zones, 
as soft targets in many cases, has improved the force multiplier for law enforcement. In fact, of Florida's 67 counties, 45 have opted into the Sentinel program we created in our state to get rid of the gun-free zones and to allow former members of our military, former tactical operators, former members of law enforcement to be there for their children to keep them safe so that we don't have to relive these tragedies. There was also more training that was actually required, mandatory, rigorous in Florida. That would be something that we might want to think about and might want to encourage. But it is similarly irresponsible here in the Judiciary Committee for us to just ignore the jurisprudence that's happening around the country. When you have the Ninth Circuit, the Fourth Circuit, developing law around the notion that you can't just deprive someone of their Second Amendment rights who's, who's uh, committed no offense other than not having achieved the age of 21 once they're an American adult. I sort of like uh, Congressman Massey's legislation that uh, maybe everyone who's a voter or on their way to vote uh, ought to have the opportunity to carry a firearm to ensure that they're not subject to any intimidation. I heard uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Cohen, talk about uh, the need to pass this legislation despite the fact that it will stop law-abiding citizens from being able to exercise their right. And I guess that is the accepted collateral damage. What, what people need to hear is that stopping law-abiding citizens for, from exercising their rights is okay even in a world in which we're not making school shootings less likely because we're not appropriately tailoring the remedy to the problem. We've got all this ghost guns and gun tracking legislation up today. Were any of these school shootings, uh, were, were any of these guns ghost guns? You know, and so it seems to be sort of gun control in search of a tragedy to lash onto to animate the desire to have more gun control. And, and uh, I, I believe the gentleman from Tennessee also said, well, it'll also stop the non-law abiding. And, and perhaps we should realize that our laws don't have their own fiat, right? They, they, they aren't uh, in and of themselves determinative of human behavior. And to suggest, you know, I, I was watching uh, the NBA Finals, and I heard Shaquille O'Neal observe that in the communities that he's familiar with, uh, the access to guns is not the problem. Anybody can get the guns. And, and maybe if that's true, and he was speaking of, of course, non-legal ways to get guns, maybe we ought to focus on the circumstances that, uh, that caused these people to commit these shootings. Maybe we ought to get rid of the gun-free zones that are causing this scourge of violence. And maybe we ought to really put the victims first, not through virtue signaling, but through pensive, thoughtful legislation. Gentleman yields back for our purposes, the gentlelady from uh, Georgia seek recognition. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. Gentlelady is recognized. We are paying for gun violence every single day of our lives. We are paying for the weapons of war on our streets with the blood of children sitting in our schools. We are paying for unfettered access with mothers and fathers waiting in line for a DNA test, forced to find out if it's their child that's riddled with bullets and maimed beyond recognition. We are paying for this deadly culture with the lives of the American people, with the lives of who we in this room are sworn to protect. Do we have the courage right here in this body to imagine the phone call parents cross Uvalde received last week, the phone call that confirms our fear, our singular fear that my child is dead and that I was unable to protect them because I know that phone call. Parents across the country know that phone call. It's a sucker punch to my stomach every time I learn there's another phone call. A phone call that brings you to your knees when the desperation will not let you stand, that leaves you gasping for air when the agony will not let you breathe. And for days and for months and for years, you cry out to God in your grief. 
Was my child afraid? Did he feel the pain as the bullets ripped through his skin? How long did it take him to die? Was it quick or did he suffer? My son Jordan was only 17 years old when he was shot by a man with a gun who didn't like the loud music that he was playing. I had dreamed of who he would become. I had dreamed of watching him walk across the stage for his high school graduation, filled with excitement for college, hope for his future, and dreams for the world that only a teenager can have. The same racially motivated violence that took my son, that murdered 10 black Americans in Buffalo, is being replayed with casual callousness and despicable frequency. Since last week, when 19 children were gunned down at their desks, we have lost over 700 Americans to gun violence. Last night, four Americans were murdered as they worked, murdered while they tried to mend, murdered while they tried to keep families whole. Are we okay with this as a nation? Is this the status quo that we all accept? What rights do we give our children as we bring them into this world? What rights has God given them as they grow in our homes and in our hearts? Do we enjoy the right to study in our schools without the fear of massacre? Do our children have the right to live free from the trauma that only stepping over a friend covered in blood could ever bring? Do parents enjoy the right to drop their kid off at a school and expect to see them come home? Do we as a nation have the God-given right to live free from this scourge of gun violence, of senseless suffering, of death and despair. Because we cannot keep doing this. An entire generation of children are learning that the adults they look up to cannot or will not protect them. We all agree that the status quo is unacceptable. We all understand that the murder of our children cannot continue. And we have solutions that a majority of American people believe in. They are common sense compromises that will keep American children alive. Solutions to protect our kids, to keep guns out of the hands of those who should not have them, and to stop our neighbors from being slaughtered in our schools, in our churches, and in our supermarkets, throughout this nation's history, our elected leaders have risen to the task. And we have the opportunity to do this again right now as a nation, to do the right thing and address this moment in history. Because this is the time right now. This is the moment. It may be the only moment that we have. We are facing the challenge of our lifetime, and this is the issue of our era. And we must summon the courage to do what is right, the courage to protect our kids, and the courage, my God, we have to have the courage to protect America. And I yield back. General Lady yields back for our purposes. Mr. Massey seek recognition. I move to strike the last word. Gentlemen, is recognized. Today, we're debating a gun control bill that's actually six gun control bills in one. And why are there six? Because none of them work. If you take six that don't work and put them together, they're not going to work. You can't make up for ineffective bills by having more than one or half a dozen of them. Each and every one of these gun control bills in this single title is unserious and unconstitutional and suffers from the, the problem, the inherent problem that almost all gun control suffers from. And that is criminals do not obey the law. They do not follow the law. Who, who here today thinks that criminals are gonna read the Safe Storage Act and, and you know, some gang member is gonna say, oh, I better lock this gun up or else they'll come and take it. Who here today thinks that a 19-year-old criminal is gonna obey the, the restriction on age 
for uh, having a gun. Nobody here believes this. These are unserious, but they're worse than that. They're gonna compromise the rights and the safety of individual citizens, law-abiding citizens. Let me tell you the story of Nikki Goser, who's testified here in Congress, and she worked for me in my congressional office. Nikki watched her husband murdered, get murdered in front of her, viciously, in a gun-free zone, while her licensed firearm was in her car outside of the restaurant. She, that haunts her today. Ben and her had just recently been married and they just wanted to be in this restaurant and they followed the law and he was murdered by her stalker in front of her. Now she went on to get the laws changed in Tennessee to get rid of that gun-free zone. But that's one example, just one example of how all the rest of these are gonna fail. The criminals do not follow the law. And the biggest thing we could do that nobody on the other side of the aisle is talking about today is to quit advertising our schools as soft zones, soft targets for defenseless teachers, defenseless staff, and students who aren't being defended. Congress itself in 1990 passed the Gun-Free School Zone Act. It's done more, it's cost more lives than it has saved. Now, some states have been able to override the Gun-Free School Zone Act and create their own areas. And in those states and those school districts where that's happened, where they've allowed qualified teachers and staff to carry, there hasn't been a single mass shooting in one of those schools. There hasn't been a single shooting of one person in one of those schools. The biggest thing we could do here today is to repeal the 1990 Gun-Free School Zone Act so that the default condition in this country is not to advertise every student as a target. Now, to Mr. Cicilline's point, he was talking about the Supreme Court. You know, in 1995, the, the Gun-Free School Zone Act was struck down. Why was that? Because this document does not contain the authority to implement a gun-free school zone act. So what did Congress do? They resuscitated this unconstitutional bill by putting in a provision that says, well, as long as the gun is involved in interstate commerce, well, then we have the authority. Well, I wonder if that's the case with all six of these useless bills in here today, because only two of the bills say that. It's actually two of the bills say it only applies to firearms involved in interstate commerce. Does that mean the other four? are unconstitutional, or it actually means all six are unconstitutional and they're trying to save two of them with the provision that killed the Gun-Free School Zone Act in 1995. By the way, they, they overturned Mr. Lopez's conviction and he went on to serve in the Marines, the one who was convicted of violating the Gun-Free School Zone Act. But Congress came back and resuscitated it and uh, unconstitutionally so, but there, there is a conflict between these six bills. Some of them recognize the constitutional flaw and some of them don't. And I want to close with this. Some of my colleagues have said that the uh, assault weapons ban from 1994 to 2004 reduced mass public shootings by 40%. They, they make up a number a lot of times, but I'll take whatever number they use. Do they know that sales of AR-15 style weapons went up during, from 1994 to 2004, because it was just a cosmetic ban. So if the, if the assault weapons ban had any effect, how did it have an effect? The ownership and sales and transfer of AR-15 style weapons went up during that period. So I would just close by saying, you can't make a good law by putting six bad laws together. It's not gonna work. It will infringe on our constitutional rights and the Democrats don't seem to care. I yield back. Gentlemen, he back. What purpose does Mr. Johnson of Georgia seek recognition? I move to strike the last word. Gentlemen, is recognized. You know, it's been nine days since we lost 21 souls in Uvalde, Texas. 19 children and two teachers. We can't ignore our problem, which is out of control gun violence in America. We must lead, we must act, and we must act now. Acting now will take courage, 
each of us on this committee should call forward some semblance of courage, like the courage that was on display last week by those brave Border Patrol agents who put their lives at risk to stop the carnage in Uvalde. I asked my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, can you put aside your thirst for raw power and muster the courage to stand up for our kids and against the NRA? My friends, history will not forget those politicians and the phony patriots who cared more about maintaining their grip on power and serving the interest of the NRA than they did about protecting our kids from out of control gun violence. Columbine, Sandy Hook, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, Virginia Tech, UC Santa Barbara, and the list goes on and on. And none of these heinous atrocities moved Congress to act. We must not let Uvalde be the same. Our, our constituents need to know that we hear from them and we will act on their behalf. The fact of the matter is that more than 311,000 students have experienced gun violence at school since Columbine. This violence, this carnage, cannot be what America is all about. And the time for minor reforms is gone. Congress must take comprehensive legislative action to stop the murders of our children. In the name of all who have perished at the hands of a firearm, we must do something. In the name of Columbine, let's crack down on straw purchasers. In the name of Route 91, let's ban bump stocks. In the name of Sandy Hook, Pulse Nightclub, El Paso, Texas, and Dayton, Ohio, let's ban high capacity magazines. In the name of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, Buffalo, and Uvalde, let's raise the age of purchase to 21 years of age. This misguided pledge that some of us have of allegiance to guns and yes, to the NRA, it must end and it must end now, not tomorrow, not next year, but now for the people of the United States demanding meaningful, effective action, let's pass the Protecting Our Kids Act. And with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back for our purposes, Mr. Tiffany, seek recognition. I move respect the last word. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you. Anytime we address gun violence, we should also address the state of affairs of our society. We should address crime and mental health. We must also address the family unit, forging the future of our society. Look at the story of the young man who did so much damage in Uvalde, Texas. None of the latter seems to get any attention from this body, and the knee-jerk reaction is to always punish law-abiding citizens for the sins of the few. The answer is always to place more restrictions on the masses instead of holding the individual accountable. The problem is not being addressed today. The majority, instead of working in good faith across the aisle to find real solutions to these problems, are now here talking about protecting our kids with a bill that does little of that. This bill ignores the real mental health crisis in the country. It ignores the countless failures by the FBI and local jurisdictions in failing to act on actionable information. It ignores how the defund the police movement influenced school districts across the U.S. to rid themselves of school resource officers and police. It ignores the school systems trying to replace the family by withholding information from parents about their own children. This social experiment going on in our military, our schools, and our society is contributing to this mental health crisis. 
the deterioration of family values, and our skyrocketing violent crime rates. The question was posed by the lady from Pennsylvania. What have we taught our children? It is a very good question, and it's not being answered today. Unconstitutionally changing the age for ownership of a rifle from the 18 to 21, as has been so um, clearly stated by others on the committee, does little to address the root causes I've described. Neither is creating a gun owner database through the IRS, one of the provisions of the six in this bill. After all, the IRS has not had a great track record of keeping confidential information secure, has it? Moving the goalposts, as often is done, only gets some talking points. Real solutions required reaching across the aisle and addressing all of these issues, not messaging that exploits tragedies to try and take away our rights and eventually have to be struck down by the courts. And I really think that the majority should be honest here today with the American public, and you should come clean. And you should propose the amendment, which is what you really want, which is to repeal the Second Amendment to the Constitution, because that is really what is afoot and has been over the decades as we've had this robust argument here in our country for a long time. Come clean, tell the American people what you really want to do, Mr. Chairman, and that is repeal the Second Amendment. And I would just close by this. Josiah Garcia has been mentioned a couple times during this hearing. Um, God bless that young man, and may he rest in peace, along with all the others that perished in Uvalde. But I would also cite Josiah uh, Garcia's uncle, who said, do not politicize this. Do not polit politicize this before all the facts are known about what went on at that Uvalde school. Uh, with that, if I have any colleagues that would like time uh, yielded to them, I'd be happy to do it. I'd, I'd like you to yield to me if you wouldn't mind. I'm a colleague. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I yield back to oh. you. <laughs> wow. Gentlemen, yield back. Gentleman from New York, Mr. Jones, is recognized for five minutes. I move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the chairman of the full committee for convening this markup during recess so that we can advance the Protecting Our Kids Act. This is life-saving legislation, and it cannot wait. I'm proud to co-sponsor this bill, and I'm proud to support it today in committee. As the youngest member of this committee, I need to address my Republican colleagues on behalf of the generations of young people whom Republicans have condemned to grow up in fear that they will be gunned down at school. When I was just 11 years old, something that then seemed unthinkable happened. Two students killed a teacher and 12 of their classmates at Columbine High School. I was afraid, all of us were. But still, I had hope that by the time I was in high school, nothing like the shooting at Columbine would ever happen again. I had faith that adults would step up. I never imagined that mass shootings, let alone school shootings, would become our new normal. Yet that is exactly what has happened. What was once unthinkable has come to feel, for many Americans, unstoppable. Since Columbine, more than 311,000 children have experienced gun violence at school. There were more school shootings last year than in any year since 1999, the year of Columbine. And there have been more than 200 mass shootings this year already. The leading cause of death of American children is now gun violence. Behind every one of those statistics is the story of a person, often a child, who mattered. Before we even had time to grieve for the 10 people murdered by a white supremacist in Buffalo, New York, my home state, another gunman killed 19 children and two adults in Uvalde, Texas. 
four children are orphans because their mother made the ultimate sacrifice, not on the battlefront in Iraq or in Eastern Europe, but in the classroom. And their grieving father died of a heart attack thereafter. A girl named Nevea, heaven spelled backwards, is in eternal rest at the age of 10. A badge of honor has been awarded posthumously for heroism, not to a police officer, but to a Girl Scout, murder trying to call for help. To the parents who mourn and the children who fear, all you have to offer are more guns and apparently the ridiculous idea of fewer school doors. My generation and the generations who have followed know that this epidemic of gun violence is not unstoppable. It is a choice, a choice you could make differently at any time, a choice between our lives and your guns. Time after time, we have given you a chance to do something. After Columbine, after Sandy Hook, after Parkland, and time after time, you have chosen to put your right to kill over our right to live. But your selfishness and your indifference have not killed our hope. You have transformed it. Before, we believed that you might do what the people overwhelmingly support and help advance common sense gun violence legislation. Now we know that it is up to us to save ourselves from you. We did not choose this fight. We had our own dreams for our lives, the same as you did when you were kids, but we can't let you get away with this anymore. Enough is enough. Enough of you telling us that school shootings are a fact of life when every other country like ours has virtually ended it. Enough of you blaming mental illness and then defunding mental health care in this country. Enough of your thoughts and prayers. Enough. Enough. You will not stop us from advancing the Protecting Our Kids Act today. You will not stop us from passing it in the House next week, and you will not stop us there. If the filibuster obstructs us, we will abolish it. If the Supreme Court objects, we will expand it. And we will not rest until we have taken weapons of war out of circulation in our communities. Each and every day, we will do whatever it takes to end gun violence, whatever it takes. What we will do is not fail the children of this country the way that you have failed us. The generations of Columbine, Sandy Hook, Parkland, and Uvalde. I yield back, Madam Chair. The uh, gentleman yields back for our purposes. The gentleman from Ohio, C. Greg English. Move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now we know. Now we know where they want to go. We just said it. End the filibuster, expand the court, forget the Constitution. Now we know. Democrats blame guns. They criticize the NRA. They call Republicans names. But let's be honest. They've told us what they want to do. Their real beef is with the Second Amendment. Their real beef is with the Second Amendment. Think about what this bill does. Mr. Massey just outlined the six bills thrown into one. What this bill does, it tells law-abiding citizens when you can get a gun, what kind of gun you can get, what accessories you can get for your gun, and where and how you have to store it in your own darn home. That's what this bill does. This is an assault. This is the start. This is the start. We know it's the start because Ms. Jackson Lee, the first person to speak on their side, said this, we're not finished. This is just the beginning. Their goal, plain and simple, is to get rid of the Second Amendment. Joe Biden said it the other day. He said he wants to ban nine millimeter handguns. Michael Moore said it last week. Time to repeal the Second Amendment, he said. We know where the Democrats want to go, and they don't care about the Constitution. Mr. Bishop pointed that out just a few minutes ago. They know the age limit in this bill is unconstitutional. We just had a decision last month from the most liberal circuit in the country said it's unconstitutional. They know the storage provisions are unconstitutional. The Heller decision said so. They don't care. Forget the Constitution. They want to... They want, to, they want to change the country in so many dramatic ways. The gentleman from New York just talked about getting rid of the filibuster, packing the court. We know they want to pack the court because the chairman of this committee introduced a bill 14 months ago to pack the court. And the worst of it is, the worst of it is, this bill would not address the tragedies we have seen unfold around the country in the last couple weeks. 
would not stop the terrible events that we saw, wouldn't harden schools. In fact, the spokesperson for the president just said last week, hardening schools is not something President Biden wants to happen, not something he believes in. I find that astonishing, but that's what she said. This bill would not stop the terrible events. It wouldn't harden schools, but it will sure take away the rights of the American people who follow the law. That's what this is all about. And it's such, it's just so wrong. But it is part of the pattern we have seen. And again, as Mr. Bishop pointed out a few minutes ago, this is the Judiciary Committee. You would think there would be the proper respect for the Constitution and for decisions reached by our circuit courts. Nope, nope, we are so focused on taking away people's liberty. It's, it's frightening to me when you put it all in context and you think about what they what the Democrats are trying to do to First Amendment liberties, now to Second Amendment liberties, this is what frightens the American people. And that's why we should vote this bill down. And we should come together as a bipartisan, bipartisan, in a bipartisan way to figure out what we can do to help make schools safe, make sure that people are properly trained there, make sure the facility is the way it needs to be. We're all for that, but we're not for taking away this. We're not for ending the, taking away Second Amendment liberties, not for ending the Second Amendment like they want to do. Mr. Chairman, I would yield to the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Bishop. I thank the gentleman, I thank the ranking member. Quote, we must dismantle white supremacy in all aspects of our society, and that means moving funding away from police departments and toward programs that improve public safety by helping to address the roots of systemic inequality. The gentleman from New York, the gentleman who just told us who he is, and I believe him. except what the gentleman from New York described is annihilating the Second Amendment without repealing it in the manner contemplated by the Constitution of the United States. Would the gentleman yield? Understand what we are up against because he just Would the told gentleman us. yield? My he time. just told us. Would the gentleman from and Ohio I believe yield? him. I yield back to the gentleman from Ohio. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. I wasn't aware that uh, Michael Moore was a Democratic member of the House. For what purpose does the gentlelady from uh, Washington seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. Gentlelady is recognized. Mr. Chairman, we originally called this markup to make a vow to the families of the 21 people, including 19 children and two teachers who were murdered last week in the 27th school shooting this year. A vow to the families of the 10 people killed in a supermarket by an 18-year-old gunman in Buffalo, New York, just two weeks before Uvalde, Texas. A vow to the families of so many mass shootings who have channeled their anger and their grief into pushing for action from Congress to take life-saving measures by passing legislation for common sense, necessary life-saving gun reforms through the House of Representatives and demanding that the Senate act to stop the insanity of mass shootings that plagues our country. And yet before we could even have this hearing today, before the funerals have been held for those who died in Uvalde, just last night, America experienced another mass shooting at the St. Francis Medical Building in Tulsa, Oklahoma. At least four people died, people who themselves were working to save lives, people who were parents who left behind children, people who should be alive today. Reports from the scene detailed a shooter carrying two guns, one an AR style semi-automatic rifle like the one used in the Ovalde massacre, but just yesterday, carrying those two guns through the medical buildings before the shooting began. And because of Oklahoma's open carry law, hospital personnel were unable to do anything before the shooter began his rampage. And while we don't know the details, let me remind you that Republicans in their never ending pursuit to increase the number of guns on our streets and in our schools pass laws in Oklahoma so that no permit is needed to purchase a firearm from a private individual, no waiting period is required to purchase a firearm, and no firearm registration is required in the state. In Oklahoma, anyone over the age of 21 can openly carry a firearm, including an AR-15, without a license or registration. 
Weapons that can cause mass devastation are subject to less common sense safety measures than cars or motorcycles. The children of Uvalde are all of our children. The parents in Buffalo and Oklahoma are all of our parents. This is our responsibility and it doesn't have to be this way. Today, we have a chance to say no more, to refuse to allow our schools and our supermarkets, our hospitals and our theaters, our public places turned into war zones where children hide terrified under desks or in closets or doctors in medical facilities don't know if they are going to save a life or have their own taken away. Do not tell me that the answer to this is to put even more guns on the streets or to militarize our schools or our theaters or our hospitals with metal detectors and cops. Do not talk about taking away fundamental freedoms when what we are doing by refusing to pass sensible reforms is taking away the fundamental freedom for children to go to school and play and live. And don't tell me that the answer to this is just about mental health. We certainly have mental health challenges that we have to respond to, but countries around the world have similar mental health challenges, but no other modern wealthy country has these mass shootings as we do. What sets us apart, sadly, is the enormous number of guns and lack of regulation around guns, and most importantly, the lack of political will from Republicans to respond to these mass shootings. When other countries have had a ma major mass shooting, they have responded and it has worked. In March of 1996, Great Britain experienced the deadliest mass shooting in its history at an elementary school. The shooter murdered 16 children and their teacher and injured 15 others. And in response, the British parliament banned high caliber pistols. Since then, there has been not a single shooting in the UK. Six weeks later, the deadliest single person mass shooting in Australia and the third worst in the world occurred in Tasmania, killing 35 people and wounding 23. Australia passed sweeping reforms, including banning nearly all semi-automatic rifles and shotguns and launching a program to buy back over 600,000 firearms. And since then, there has been only one mass shooting in Australia. Other countries have responded to gun violence with decisive action that effectively wiped away mass shootings. And meanwhile, the United States makes up 4% of the global population, but close to 15% of firearm deaths worldwide. So do not tell me that we don't know what works. We know what works. We know that what we need to do is to pass this bill and say yes to saving lives for our children and our families. Let's do what is right. Does the gentlelady yield back? I do. The gentlelady yields back. For what purpose does Mr. Stubbe seek recognition? I would strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. In the filibuster, expand the court, take away your constitutional rights under the Second Amendment. Well, we just heard that that's exactly what the Democrats want to do here today and in the House in this coming week. On Monday, Biden stated a nine millimeter bullet blows the lung out of the body. And I quote, so the idea of these high caliber weapons is of there's simply no rational basis for it in terms of thinking about self-protection. So you can't protect yourself with a nine mil, I guess, according to Biden, only a 22 uh, round ammunition would be sufficient. Then the White House walked back that statement uh, and said he supports a ban on the sale of assault weapons, which there's no such thing, and high capacity magazines. High capacity magazines. I'm going to come back to that in a second. Yesterday, Speaker Pelosi, speaking at an anti-gun rally in San Francisco, stated, we will have a hearing markup on an assault weapon ban. Their plans and their intentions are clear. They want to take away law-abiding citizens' ability to purchase the firearm of their choice, and don't let them fool you that they are not attempting to take away your ability to purchase handguns. They're using the magazine ban to do it. Last year in 2020 and 2021, the Glock 19 was the highest sold handgun in the United States. It comes with a 15 round magazine. That gun would be banned. Right here in front of me, I have a Sig Sauer P226. Comes with a 21 round magazine. This gun would be banned. Here's a, here's a 12 round magazine. This magazine would be banned under this current bill. It doesn't fit because this gun was made for a 20 round, 21 round magazine. This gun would be banned under this bill. Here's a Sig Sauer 320. It takes a 20 round magazine, takes a 20 round magazine. 
Here's a 12 round magazine that would be banned. It doesn't fit because it would be banned. This gun would be banned under this bill. Here's a gun I carry every single day to protect myself, my family, my wife, my home. This is a XL six hour P365. Comes with a 15 round magazine. Here's a seven round magazine, which would be less than what would be lawful under this bill if this bill were to become law. It doesn't fit. So this gun would be banned. I hope the, gun, the gun is not bill. loaded. I'm at my house. I can do whatever I want with my guns. Here's a so point that of order. Is exactly what the Democrats want to do. Now let's just take the policy objectives that they're trying to accomplish and look at the municipalities that have actually passed it. Maryland, Washington, DC, Cook County, Illinois, all have some of the strictest gun country laws in the country, including limiting magazines to only 10 rounds. By comparison, in Florida, there are significantly less restrictions and no limits limits on magazine size in the state of Florida. Would the gentleman so yield for question? Are these laws Would the Let's look at the yield homicide for rates in major cities and anti-gun jurisdictions that have magazine bans. Would the gentleman yield for question? The state of Florida, where we have freedom and the ability to carry whatever firearm we want. Mr. Jackson, the gentleman Florida, yield for question? Largest city by area in the state, in my state. Would, would the gentleman yield for question? Yes or no? No, I'm trying to get my okay. point across in the two the minutes that no. I have left. General won't yield. The murder rate was more, now let me start back over and I hope you give me my 10 or 15 seconds back that you just took. Jacksonville, Florida, the largest city by area in my state, the murder rate was more than half, half of DC or Chicago in 2021. And you are four times lower, uh, and, and it was four times lower than in Baltimore, Maryland. All jurisdictions that have a magazine ban, you're safer in the state of Florida where we don't have it. If you live in Tampa, Florida, near my district, or in Orange County, where Orlando is located, in 2021, you were roughly three times less likely to be murdered here in Florida, in Orange County, or in Tampa, than in Chicago or DC, where they both have magazine bans. And you are a whopping five times less likely to be murdered than in Baltimore, Maryland, than in Tampa, Florida, or Orange County. Additionally, the state of West Virginia is instructive on this point. West Virginia has some of the most gun-friendly laws in the country, including permitless carry, no magazine restrictions. For purposes of comparing apples to apples, West Virginia also faces some struggles and has poverty levels comparable to nearby Baltimore and Washington, DC. Yet someone is nine times less likely to be murdered in West Virginia than in Baltimore and approximately five times less than in DC, according to the most recent numbers in those jurisdictions. These anti-gun cities, particularly ones with magazine bans, have some of the highest crime rates in the country, and they are growing worse. These laws do nothing to stop crime, and no one here thinks they will actually stop mass shootings. This is a push to take away your right to carry whatever firearm you please to defend yourself. So I hope our colleagues in the Senate are paying attention. A magazine ban will not allow you to carry these type of handguns because they don't have the capacity to take such a small magazine. I yield back. Gentleman yields back for purposes. The gentleman from Florida seek recognition. I move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I uh, just returned from uh, traveling to visit with uh, other governments in Europe who have been receiving Ukrainian refugees who have been standing up to Russia. It was an important series of meetings, but every single meeting started with expressions of sympathy and condolences and questions about how it is that the United States continues to have this horrific gun violence problem. I thought it would be important just to respond to some of what we've heard and to make clear what we're actually doing here. First of all, to the ranking member and to Mr. Bishop, they I, I so resent being told that I don't care about the constitution. We all do, and you know it's not true. Yes, there's a Ninth Circuit decision. There are also other circuits who have come down the other way. And when you refer to Heller, I think it's important to point out the words of Justice Scalia in the Heller decision when he said, like most rights, the right secured by the Second Amendment is not unlimited, who then went on to, uh, to explain exactly how. So let's at least be clear that what's happening here first of all, is the constitutional. Now let's talk about what we're trying to do. We already passed legislation to, to require a, a check of one's background to make sure you don't have a violent history. There's nobody who's watching this 
who thinks that if you have a violent history, you should be able to buy a firearm. That's just straightforward. That's, that's what we already passed. And that's what the Senate needs to bring up and pass. And look at what's in this bill. Raise the age for purchasing a semi-automatic rifle from 18 to 21. Let's also acknowledge that in America, you can't buy a handgun unless you're 21. That somehow hasn't been brought up today. By the way, you also can't buy a drink and you can't buy tobacco unless you're 21 either, but you can go in and you can buy a, a semi-automatic assault rifle, which by the way, for every time someone sits in this meeting and says, well, nothing we're doing here would have prevented this. Well, actually, if we had a law that said you have to be 21 to buy, then these uh, two AR-15s would not have been purchased. So that's, that's what the 18 to 21 is. Also, Florida, my own Florida, raised the age to buy a gun to 21. It's a really important step that we can take. Also, we'll be voting, before we get back to this, we'll be voting on, uh, on red flag laws, which Florida passed, which have now been used 5,800 times to make sure that people with violent histories don't do harm to themselves or to others. Florida did that. We want, we want federal offenses for gun trafficking and straw purchases because we don't want people to feel that they're able to simply bring guns to cities that don't, uh, that don't have restrictions, don't buy them where they don't have restrictions, take them to other cities. We're tough on crime in this committee, right? We all ought to be supportive of cracking down on gun traffickers who put people's lives at risk. Safe storage of firearms. Look, if you have a, a child in your house, my guess is for every one of my colleagues on this committee who owns a firearm, you store it safely. But shouldn't everyone, if they have a child in their house, have to store their firearm safely? That's what this bill does. Bump stocks, let's remember what bump stocks are. Bump stocks in Las Vegas allowed the shooter to fire off his gun as, to, rap, to, to do it more rapidly, to do it almost as a fully automatic rifle. Well, President Trump wanted to get rid of those, we're getting rid of them here. Everybody ought to be supportive of that. And then finally, on high capacity magazines, all we're doing is limiting the capacity. And we're not banning guns. We're not taking anyone's guns away. We're not taking anyone's magazine away either. We're limiting it. And you know why? Because when a shooter goes into a school and has to reload or goes anyplace else where there are mass shootings, which is everywhere, and has to reload, it provides an opportunity for someone to stop him and stop the killing. That's what that's about. And I'll finish with this. Look, I completely agree. We ought to be working together on school safety issues. We ought to pass the Luke and Alex School Safety Act. We ought to pass the Eagles Act. But this isn't just about schools. This is about these horrific mass shootings that happen everywhere. We ought to pass Jamie's law that, that my my constituent, Fred Gunberg, who lost his daughter, Jamie, uh, has worked so hard on to require background checks on ammo. There's a lot that we can do. And finally, when Governor Abbott says that there's a problem at getting access to mental health care, we should surge mental health care professionals into every underserved committee, community in our country. You should all work with us. Everyone should work to get that done. This is a reasonable, bill, a reasonable piece of legislation that will help to save lives. It's important that we do it. We owe it to every family who continues to suffer as so many in my community continue to. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your bringing this uh, bill forward for markup and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlemen, yields back for our purposes. Ms. Deming seek recognition. I'll we'll just write the last word. General ladies recognized. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. My, my colleague from North Carolina, um, had the audacity to talk about bullies. Well, I think bullies showed up on January 6th and trampled all over the United States Constitution. I think bullies are trying to take away a woman's right to choose. I think bullies all over this country are involved in gerrymandering and trying to suppress the right to vote. So if you wanna talk about bullies, let's talk about those things. You know, it has been very interesting listening to this uh, discussion. As, as a former police chief, a former crisis negotiator, the commander of the critical incident management team, I, I, I hardly know how to describe or begin to understand why people who have the power and the opportunity to do good, to make a difference, 
just simply refuse to do so, come hell or high water. And Lord knows we have seen hell come over and over again, whether it was Columbine, Sandy Hood, Virginia Tech, Las Vegas, El Paso, all our churches, Mother Emanuel, Sutherland Springs, in our movie theaters, our synagogues, grocery stores, the Pulse nightclub that just happens to be in my district, Parkland, Uvalde. And as my colleague said, before we can even get this hearing started today, a hospital in Oklahoma. Now we all know that law enforcement is expected to do something to respond quickly and enforce the laws. Well, guess what? We as members of Congress are responsible for writing those laws and we have watched hell come time and time again, over and over again, and simply have failed the American people. Well, I don't know about my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, but I am certainly not proud of that. Mr. Chairman, is there anyone really on this committee? Because sometimes it's hard uh, to tell, is there really one who really believes that it's okay for an 18 year old to purchase an assault weapon or an assault style weapon that can do unimaginable damage to the human body and also be able to purchase thousands of rounds of ammunition. Is there anyone on this, in this committee, on this committee who really believes that that is okay? The Am Ammunition Background Check Act, known as Jamie's Law, which uh, my colleague, Mr. George, just mentioned. Jamie was a young woman with her whole future ahead of us who lost her life at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. Mr. Chairman, I, I ask my colleagues to not wait another day. And let's just sit back and see who's going to be killed next. Who's going to die next in a mass shooting. Just as we expect law enforcement to do something well, with our power comes responsibility too. The American people are expecting us to do something. Let's don't sit back and wait for the next child in this country to die in their classroom. Mr. Chairman, I believe that there is no country with a greater ability to protect our children than the United States. And there's been several people talking about Florida, talking about Parkland and laws that Florida passed. Well, let me be clear about this. It was the Republican led legislation who thought that children dying at Parkland was ridiculous and shameful and appalling. And it was that legislation that raised the age, that legislation that imposed a three day waiting period and that legislation or legislators that passed red flag uh, laws. Somehow through it all, through all of the politics that we see play today, they remembered as we talk about constitutional rights, they remembered the rights of our children not to die by gunfire in the classroom. But you know what? They don't spend all of their time in the classroom. They go to church, they go to the balls, they go to the movie theater, we will be held accountable for acts of omission and commission. May heaven help us. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. General Lady yields back for our purposes, Mr. Buck seek recognition. Right, the last word. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, it, it is terribly sad what's happened in this country in the last few weeks and in the last few years, frankly. I. Um, was a federal prosecutor when Columbine happened and, and was uh, part of a group that went into the school uh, the day after. And what I saw was terrible. I had young children in school and it impacted me and, and uh, those with me and, and frankly, all of America. Uh, living in Colorado, I've also uh, experienced the uh, Aurora school shooting, or I'm sorry, the Aurora theater shooting up close. And 
uh, certainly recently the, the Boulder uh, grocery store shooting. But one thing I've learned from law enforcement and one thing I've learned from being in, uh, involved in, in uh, these, these particular shootings and also uh, uh, observing what's, what's happening in uh, our country, uh, these laws will not help the situation. Um, and, and then frankly, I will vote against these, uh, the bill that, that has been proposed. Uh, it is a problem when we tell the American people that we have solutions and we don't have easy solutions for what's happening right now. We need to hold hearings. We need to examine the underlying causes. There are some uh, ideas that I think would be helpful in terms of uh, hardening schools and uh, some other ideas. Gun-free school zones have been a failure. Uh, Gun-free zones have been a failure. The Aurora Theater shooting, there were uh, a dozen uh, premieres of the Batman movie the night of the Aurora Theater shooting um, in within a few miles of where that shooting occurred. That shooting occurred in a gun-free uh, zone, um, and the other uh, uh, premieres were not in gun-free zones. Uh, did the shooter take that into account? I don't know. But it's clear that disarming Americans is not a way to reduce gun violence. Uh, we have seen assault weapons bans. The assault weapon ban that was in place, the federal assault weapon ban that was in place for 10 years, we saw a violent gun crime increase during that time. It did not reduce violent gun crime uh, in America. These bills that have been presented, the, the Safe Storage Act, Ethan's Law, Safe Guns, Safe Kids Act, Closing the Bump Stock, uh, Keep Americans Safe Act, would not have prevented what happened um, in the last three shootings and, and uh, many other uh, shootings. We have a serious problem involving family, involving drugs, involving mental health uh, in this country. We have gone the wrong direction in the last 40 or 50 years. Uh, we have become a less safe society generally. Uh, blaming the gun for what's happening in America is small-minded. It is uh, unfortunate that, that we can't come together as a group of, of well thought through uh, legislators that want to deal with this problem, pointing the fingers at each other and saying, well, you're only doing this because you're trying to gain political points on, on the heels of a, a dangerous shooting. And then for you to tell us that well, we're controlled by the NRA, I voted against the NRA, I'll vote against the NRA when I think they're wrong. I'm representing my constituents. In rural Colorado, uh, an AR-15 is a gun of choice for killing raccoons before they get to our chickens. Uh, it is a, a, a gun of choice for killing a, a fox. It is a, it is a gun that you control predators on your ranch, on your farm, on your property. Uh, the idea that, that somehow we're going to deny access to, uh, I think there are 20 million AR-15s in circulation in this country. Um, it, it, it makes absolutely no sense and it's unfortunate. Um, I think that uh, there are other answers. Uh, we've certainly in Colorado, we have discussed the, the possibility of uh, uh, in incentivizing veterans who come back from uh, the military or discharged from the military to uh, go into education and teach and, and be able to uh, carry guns uh, in a school um, as a teacher, as an administrator, as a coach, uh, trying to help to, to strengthen our, our system. I think we've got to get beyond the, the finger pointing at this point. I think we've got to get to the point where we're uh, holding hearings. And I hope when Republicans take the majority in November, that in January, we will start to hold hearings and come up with answers, answers that are meaningful, not answers where we tell the American public we've solved the problem. We're going to make sure that there's no guns in schools. So law abiding citizens don't have guns in schools, but criminals do. We want to make sure that we get to the bottom line of a very complex and very serious problem that this country faces. And I hope we do uh, in the future. It's obvious to me that right now that's not what's intended. And it's sad. And I yield back. Gentleman yields back for what purposes? The gentleman from uh, California seek recognition? Strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. 19 kids are dead. 19 children are dead. And so to my Republican colleagues, I ask, who are you here for? Are you here for our kids, or are you here for the killers? Because if you were here for the kids, you would do all you could to protect the next school shooting that's about to happen. And we know it's gonna happen in America. 
You would vote to raise the age on purchasing an assault rifle. You would vote to ban high capacity magazines. You would vote to require safe storage. And you would vote to address ghost guns, which are ravaging communities across America. But if you're here for the killers, you would do everything to make it easier for the next school shooting to happen. And Mr. Jordan, to say we are trying to dramatically change the country, dramatically change the country, if trying to make sure that no more kids are put in the ground with a Superman coffin means dramatically change the country, guilty. That's why we're here. Kids are going in the ground today, and you call that trying to dramatically change the country. Why aren't you trying to dramatically change the number of dead kids going into the ground, Mr. Jordan? Who are you here for, the kids or the killers? My Republican colleagues are here for carnival games. They say it's about mental health. Okay, we try and fund mental health, they vote against it. They say it's about schools. We try and fund the schools, fund the teachers. They vote against it. They say it's about policing. $300 million in the American Rescue Plan for community policing. They all voted against it. And they don't want to listen to the police. If they listened to the police, they'd listen to the major cities' chiefs who have called for background checks, red flag laws, banning bump stocks, and banning high-capacity magazines. My favorite, it's about the family. We need to address the family issues in America. But we don't want to help feed a family. We're going to make it harder for kids to live on food stamps. We don't want to help a family learn. We're going to go after teachers in America. We don't want to help kids go to college. We don't want to give them jobs. We're going to vote against the infrastructure and jobs bill. And then they say that laws don't work. But they have no problem crafting laws to take away a woman's right to make her own health care decision. That law must work. They have no problem going after laws to ban drugs. There's plenty of laws on the books to ban drugs. But no, it's all about the person. Laws don't work when you have evil in our country. That's what they tell us. And then they tell us that we're in a country where you have violent video games, mental health problems, schools that can't be secured, and too many gun-free zones, and their solution to that is to put more of the most dangerous weapons into that mix. That's insane. They're also out of touch with the overwhelming majority of gun owners in America. An organization called 97% just put out a poll that said among gun owners, and they only polled gun owners, 86% support background checks, 76% support safe storage. 67% support red flag laws. Those are gun owners. So who are you here for? Our kids or the killers? I'm here for people like Alex Navarro. She's a Moms Demand Action leader in the San Francisco Bay Area. And last week, after I convened a meeting among my constituents and people like Fred Guttenberg and Dr. Joe Sacrin, an emergency room physician at Johns Hopkins, Alex Navarro told my constituents that her six-year-old daughter, after Uvalde, after seeing the images behind me, said to her, Mom, what picture are you going to use for me? What picture are you going to use for me? That's what children are asking their parents across America, because they don't believe they're going to come out alive. What picture are you going to use for me? We're supposed to be the protectors. We're supposed to be here for the kids. And so to my colleagues today who flew in town, came to work, got ready to argue, my question is, why did you come here for, at all? Why did you come here at all? If you're not here for the children, why don't you go to the funeral of the killer? Because that's the only place where the killer is being celebrated. We're here to get things done and protect our kids. What's your job? I yield back. Gentlemen, yields back for what purposes, Mr. Government seek recognition. Back the last word. Gentlemen is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't think uh, that it's very effective for the children to have people on the other side of the aisle come in and accuse Republicans of being complicit in murder 
and that we put our right to kill over others' right to live to infer by rhetorical supposed questions, who are you here for? We must be here for the gunman is an outrage. How dare you? You think we don't have hearts? It's just that when we look at the things that you're doing and you're trying to do to America, we've seen the carnage. I mean, for heaven's sake, let's, let's take example. Democrats control the major cities that have the worst murder rates. That's right. Your ideas have been shown to get people killed. Are you here for the murders, the murderers in Chicago, in Philadelphia, in these other major cities? Because you're wanting to do nationally what is being done by Democrats in those big cities. We care about people. We care about their lives. And lives have been so trivialized. We care deeply. How dare you? How dare you? You arrogant people attributing murder to those of us that want to do things to stop it because we've seen what your ideas do. They create more murder. Okay, let's look. Rochester, New York. These are cities that set the all-time high homicide rates in 2021. This is what you're shooting for, apparently, figuratively speaking. Rochester, New York. Uh, they had a record homicide rate of 80. Not that big of a city. Philadelphia, 524 last year. Uh, and by the way, all of these are, are Democrat mayors. Louisville, Kentucky hit a homicide, high homicide rate. Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Austin, Texas, Indianapolis, St. Paul, Portland, Albuquerque, Tucson, Columbus, Jackson, Mississippi, Atlanta, New Haven, those were all Democrat ideas they control. They've done so many of the things that Democrats in this committee want to do. We're not alleging you don't care. We're just telling you that your ideas have gotten people killed, not saved lives, for heaven's sake. And then you want to be arrogant and accuse us of murder and of not caring? We care. And if, if you could just possibly get off any kind of arrogant stepladder that allows you to look down on us and look back historically. Thomas Jefferson was not at the Constitutional Convention, but, but he said in a letter, if I could change one thing, it would be to require bills to be on file for a year before they're voted on because he understood the mistakes that are made when you rush and make big decisions out of emotion. That's what we're trying to prevent so that we can save lives and keep people from being killed. For heaven's sake, I, I, I think back historically, we had a president in Franklin Roosevelt that on D-Day led the country in a six to eight minute prayer for our troops. And now we had a president come on after Uvalde and, and he used God's name in vain. Most of us would consider it. It was used as an interjection, not as a source from whom to beg for wisdom like this country did for most of our history. And since the 60s, we really started having these mass shootings. Perhaps there was something in the 60s, maybe some Supreme Court decisions that gave rise to people being taught in school. It's whatever you think feels good. Well, it's time to get common sense back and to look historically about where people are being murdered in record rates. And don't repeat that like the Democrats are trying to do. Let's do common sense things that will save lives. I'm out of time, so you're back. Chairman Mio's back for purposes of Ms. Scanlon seek recognition. Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. Chairman, ladies recognize. I, I do want to respond first to Mr. Gomer, and I'm sorry that he and many of his colleagues didn't think it was important enough to be here today. 
But I did want to respond to his allegation that Philadelphia's homicide well, rate the lady is yields, no. I will so not. I, can I will why not I yield. Couldn't get there. Why my the gentle lady does, does not yield. The gentle lady does not yield. The time is hers. I waited. For I wanted hours. to respond. Gentle lady does not yield. I wanted to respond to Mr. Gomert's allegation that Philadelphia's homicide rate is the fault of Democratic leadership in that city. Apparently, he doesn't understand that the Commonwealth's Republican legislature for decades has blocked city leadership from passing the types of common sense gun safety laws we are considering today. So to the broader question, like most Americans, I am sickened and sick to death of the gun carnage we experience in this country every single day. I will not sit idly by watching preventable tragedies play out over and over again, day after day, year after year. Whether the children and teachers slaughtered in Texas last week, the community members murdered in Tulsa last night or Buffalo the week before, or the more than a dozen people gunned down in Philadelphia during the Memorial Day weekend. In cities and towns across the country, we are mourning too many people whose lives have been cut short, including children whose lives had barely begun. We are not helpless here. We can change this. We can pass gun violence prevention laws that are constitutional and save lives. All it takes is political courage, a willingness to put Americans' lives above gunmaker profits. Over two decades ago, after the Columbine shooting, I rejected helplessness and hopelessness to organize members of my community to join the Million Mom March here in DC. Since then, I've supported groups like Moms Demand Action for Gun Safety and Ceasefire PA and candidates who are willing to advocate for gun safety laws. And in 2018, I came to Congress along with many of my colleagues sent here by our constituents to pass common sense gun violence prevention legislation. And I'm not alone. The majority of my constituents and fellow Americans have decided enough is enough as well. They are demanding action from federal and state lawmakers. Gun violence is a big, multifaceted problem, but doing nothing is not a solution. The profits of gun manufacturers cannot be worth more than the lives of our children, our neighbors, our teachers, our doctors, our seniors. The Protecting Our Kids Act will address some of the key enabling conditions for gun violence and make changes that are constitutional, that will make America safer, and that are supported by law enforcement. This is not about repealing the Second Amendment or taking away the guns of responsible gun owners. I want to echo Mr. Deutsch in reminding our colleagues of Justice Scalia's opinion in Heller, in which he said that like the other rights secured by the Bill of Rights, the right secured by the Second Amendment is not without limits. Or as other justices have noted, the Constitution is not a suicide pact. This bill before us is not about being pro-gun or anti-gun. It's about desperately needing to stop gun violence. To my colleagues who oppose each and every common sense gun safety measure, do not insult Americans, our children, our teachers, or the memory of all those we have lost by offering thoughts and prayers with no action. Year after year, decade after decade, as the Bible tells us, faith without works is dead, and we are here to work. Do not insult Americans by offering hollow solutions like turning schools into armed fortresses when you won't spend the money to remove asbestos or lead from those schools. Do not insult Americans by advocating to arm teachers and guidance counselors and librarians when many of our schools don't have enough money to hire guidance counselors or librarians or enough teachers. And do not insult Americans by saying that fortifying schools is the solution when our children and the rest of us have to face the prospect of gunfire on the way to or from school and work or the supermarket or the hospital or the movie theater or our churches, mosques, and synagogues. I refuse to tell our children there's nothing we can do, that they must be sacrificial lambs to a twisted theory of armed Second Amendment liberty that is decoupled from personal responsibility. Our children know as well as we do that something can be done. We know it in our guts. Our children deserve to learn and grow in safety, and we have the power to give our kids a more hopeful and bright future. This weekend, America's National Youth Poet, Poet Laureate, Amanda Gorman, offered us a hymn in which she says, may we choose our children over chaos. May another innocent never be lost. Mr. Chair, I yield back.
Gentlelady yields back. For what purpose does Mr. Johnson of Louisiana seek recognition? Thank you. Move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We've heard some really outrageous and even very revealing things today. Mr. Jones said several minutes ago that we Democrats are seeking to abolish the filibuster and expand and pack the Supreme Court. We'll do anything necessary, he said, and that's what we know this is about. On Monday, President Joe Biden looked into a camera and said that he wants to ban nine millimeter handguns. This is uh, one of the most widely purchased and used handguns by the citizens, law-abiding citizens of this country. In 2018, retired liberal Supreme Court Justice John Paul Stevens called for the repeal of the Second Amendment. And in recent days, liberals in Hollywood and even on Capitol Hill have started to echo that drumbeat once again. Our colleagues have made some outrageous claims here in, the, in, in this hearing today, been listening since it started. They claim, for example, that raising the purchasing age for semi-automatic rifles and shotguns to 21 will reduce school shooting. But as has been noted, this action has already been ruled unconstitutional by the liberal U.S. Uh, Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, no less, when they struck down a California law imposing similar restrictions on gun purchasers or purchases for 18 to 20 year olds. Would the gentleman yield uh, today? Our, our, I will not yield. Today, they've claimed that uh, Republicans don't care about gun violence. We've heard this breathlessly over and over and over, and that's just outrageous. House Republicans have worked tirelessly to combat gun violence and have enacted meaningful laws to put more resources into mental health, to provide training for guidance counselors, to fund grants for law enforcement while the other side was trying to defund it and provide money to harden schools. As has been noted today, President Biden apparently is not uh, in favor of that idea. And that just seems crazy to anyone who looks at it objectively. Today, our Democrats have claimed that gun-free school zones promote school safety, but arming teachers and school administrators would mean well-trained adults would be at the ready to protect themselves and the innocent children in their care. The depraved shooter in Buffalo a few weeks ago wrote in his manifesto, quote, areas where carrying a concealed weapon or outlawed or prohibited may be good areas of attack. Yeah, obviously. And of course, tragically, the elementary school in Uvalde banned people from carrying firearms. Yesterday, I interviewed for my podcast, Pastor YJ Jimenez. He's a, a, a pastor there on the ground who is ministering to the people of that West Texas community who have suffered uh, from such unspeakable loss. His calming presence and clear conviction in national interviews has captured the attention of millions of Americans because he has spoken to the root causes for all this modern violence and bloodshed. America has a heart problem, he said, and he's exactly right. As Mr. Buck noted a, a few moments ago, what we're seeing right now is the results of decades of decline with the secularization of American society, the open assault on religion and morality and absolutes, and the breakdown of law and order. We're seeing the results of all this on young people in critical settings, in the culture at large, and of course, in our schools. And it's an inevitable result of decisions that we've made in this culture. Yesterday, a New York Times survey was published that found that 94% of school administrators today say that students are suffering from anxiety and depression. And 88% report that students are having trouble managing their emotions. You know, Thoreau said there are thousands hacking at the branches of evil, the one who's striking at the root. This hearing today was called for this hastily pulled together hodgepodge of Democrat bills that have been sitting on the shelf and will do nothing to solve the real problems at hand. This is hacking at branches for the simple purpose of making a show while the root problems remain unaddressed. That's what we should be working on. That's what we intend to work on. That's what we will work on when the Republicans retake the majority. We'll address the root causes. I hope we can. God help us to do that. I'd, I'd like to yield my remaining time to Mr. Gomer if he uh, desires that, to address the false claim that was just made about him. Mr. Gobert, are you still with us? Yes, I am, and I appreciate my friend from Louisiana. Uh, I waited for hours at the DFW airport, uh, but uh, there were problems with the flight. That's why I'm not in DC. But just like we've heard on so many other allegations, uh, they're without basis, without knowledge. But one thing we've learned uh, repeatedly, when Democrats accuse Republicans of things, whether it's colluding with Russia, uh, it's often gaslighting and, and tells us more about what's in the conscience of the accusers. 
And I would also remind my colleagues, I didn't know in 2016, but when the Democrats took the House floor, they obstructed an official session of Congress, which is a felony. And that's what most, uh, many of January 6ers were charged with. I yield back. Yield back, thank you. Gentleman yields you. back for the purposes. Gentleman from Colorado seek recognition. Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I just, I'd be remiss if I didn't respond at least briefly to my colleague, uh, Mr. Johnson. Uh, we have extended debates from time to time on the Constitution and, and our competing views of the constitutionality of different provisions. But I have to confess that I have seen Republicans do something today that I never thought I would ever see, which is apparently praising the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and taking the position that uh, a Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals decision is the final word on the constitutionality of a given provision. Of course, I've served on this committee long enough to remember uh, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle complaining about the Ninth Circuit year after year after year and making the case that simply because the Ninth Circuit had ruled something unconstitutional did not mean uh, as a dispositive matter uh, that uh, the, the statute in question uh, was unconstitutional. But in any event, I will digress. Mr. Chairman, I want to Would say- Would the gentleman yield for a moment? Holding... The gen... I'll, I'll yield to the chairman, of course. Yes, uh, I simply want to point out that the so-called liberal Ninth Circuit that made that decision, uh, the panel was composed of two Trump appointees who uh, decided uh, on the majority and one Clinton appointee in the minority, um, and other uh, circuits have decided to the contrary. So talk about this so-called liberal Ninth Circuit is, uh, uh, is historical, but no longer the case. I yield back to the gentleman. I, I thank think the, the chairman, I, I agree. I, you know, I think the chairman makes a salient point. And again, apparently the new standard for my colleagues on the other side of the aisle is that a singular panel decision from the Ninth Circuit is the final word on the constitutionality of a given state statute. Uh, uh, no, you know, notwithstanding the potential on bonk consideration to follow or potentially an appeal to the Supreme Court. In any event, I wanna say thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this critically important emergency hearing. Our hearts are broken for the children of Uvalde, Texas. They are broken for the people of Buffalo, New York, and they are broken for the countless Americans that are being murdered each and every day in our country. Mr. Chairman, as you well know, the level of gun violence in our country is not normal, and we cannot stand for it. It is time, long past time, for this Congress to finally act and to start saving lives. My home state of Colorado has experienced the pain and the tragedy of gun violence far too often. In 1999, I was 14 years old when my high school was put on lockdown because 10 miles away, two shooters had entered Columbine High School and murdered in cold blood 13 innocent teachers and students. From Columbine to a movie theater in Aurora to the STEM school in Highlands Ranch, and as was mentioned previously, to a grocery store in my community last year where 10 innocent people were murdered at a grocery store in Boulder, Colorado. Countless lives lost, children, parents, Coloradans, and Americans. The high schoolers who experienced Columbine are now grown up, and yet 23 years later, our kids continue to face gunfire in the places where they are supposed to be safe. Columbine was once considered to be the deadliest shooting in United States history at the time. And that, as we all know, is no longer the case. From Sandy Hook to Uvalde, far too many communities have been plagued by the scourge of gun violence. As policymakers, we have the opportunity today to do our part in stopping this violence. We have got to do more. We have to act. And today we are doing precisely that. The Protecting Our Kids Act makes common sense changes to our gun laws that'll save lives. The safe storage requirements, which we passed in Colorado last year, raising the age required to buy semi-automatic rifles from 18 to 21, another common sense measure that I've co-sponsored since I came to Congress. There is more that we can and we must do. And I will certainly keep pushing for the same every day because Boulder can't wait any longer. Colorado can't wait any longer. And our country certainly can't wait any longer. So I thank the chairman again for bringing this bill up for markup today. And I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back for what purposes, Mr. Shabbat seek recognition.
Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report the amendment. Mr. So Chairman, I reserve Chairman, a point of order. And avoid is reserved. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 7910 offered by Mr. Chairman. I move that the amendment be considered as read. The, the, I'll make that motion. The, the amendment will be considered as read, and the gentleman is recognized for five minutes to explain his amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as I mentioned in my opening state, uh, there are several ways uh, in which I believe that we could work together uh, to find some bipartisan solutions to this crisis. And this amendment is one of those possibilities. Following the shooting in Parkland, uh, Florida, as I previously mentioned, uh, former Sheriff Congressman John Rutherford led a bipartisan group of members, including myself, uh, in reauthorizing yeah. the cops through our school's grant program. Mr. Chairman, I think somebody is uh, 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 unmuted out there that should mute. Gentlemen, we'll proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, that program provides necessary funds uh, to states and local school districts to strengthen security measures at schools across the country. Uh, the money can be used for metal detectors, for example. Um, it can be used to adopt uh, security plans. Uh, it can be used to train school officials. Uh, it can be used to help to identify students uh, who have mental health issues and get those students the treatments that they need, among other things. Uh, and, and oftentimes, teachers uh, can be trained both on how to identify uh, those students who may ultimately become uh, dangerous with or without a weapon, uh, or also how uh, these particular incidents ought to be handled, or, you know, how doors can be locked and kept locked in a whole range of other ways to make our schools safer. Um, one of the additional items the grants could be used for uh, is hiring school resource officers to help protect our schools. In particular, um, I think that uh, we should be looking to hire retired uh, police officers. And uh, following Parkland, I met with the, uh, the head of our local FOP here in Cincinnati, and that was his suggestion. And that was the reason that I had initially uh, offered this and why I've been pushing for this uh, since that time. Um, and we'd like to see that expanded, uh, not just retired police officers, uh, but also honorably discharged uh, military personnel. Um, and they could also serve as uh, resource officers where needed. Um, I know for certain that there are at least a handful of school districts uh, in my district in the greater Cincinnati area that either cannot find any school resource officers uh, or cannot find as many as they'd like to hire. Uh, because of lack of available personnel uh, that have the necessary training. Obviously, I, I won't name those uh, districts or those schools and expose any potential security vulnerabilities, uh, but I'm sure that if this problem exists in Cincinnati, it exists in other parts of the country as well. Fortunately, we have a fairly expansive group of highly trained security experts readily available, and that's our retired police officers and honorably discharged military personnel. Placing highly trained and professional individuals in our schools is one of the easiest and safest methods to bolster school security. And no one is better trained and better equipped uh, to handle potential school shootings than, than those folks, the police officers uh, and military personnel. My amendment expresses the sense of Congress that more states and local school districts should consider employing retired officers and military personnel um, where it's appropriate as school resource officers. Hiring retired uh, police officers uh, and uh, retired uh, military uh, personnel uh, to provide school security is a common sense step uh, to better secure our schools. And it could be achieved almost immediately. Most importantly, doing so could go a long way towards protecting our students who are in school to learn, not to become victims. Mr. Chairman, our nation's schools have become soft targets for any would-be killer uh, who has gotten access to a gun. We even advertise with a sign uh, that the murderer to be uh, will be the only person on the scene with a gun. Uh, it's almost like a welcome mat. Uh, we need to do a better job of protecting both students and teachers uh, and other personnel at our schools because they're all vulnerable uh, from those frequently and unfortunately 
uh, increasingly uh, frequent threats. Um, adopting this common sense amendment would be a significant step, I believe, uh, in the right direction. And it's something we could do um, right now. And I think this is something that really would make a difference because uh, hopefully we will be, uh, if this passes and is part of the bill, members will read the bill. Um, members can reach out uh, to school districts and schools in their, in their own communities and make them aware that this money is available for them to harden the schools. That would actually accomplish something. I yield back. The general yields back. Does the general lady insist on a point of order? I withdraw my point of order. I the point of order is withdrawn. I recognize myself in opposition to the amendment. This amendment is uh, based on the belief that the way to protect students is to have a good guy with a gun, as Republicans often say, to stop the bad guy with a gun. Uh, but I believe that phrase was coined by the multi-million dollar gun lobby's dealer, Wayne LaPierre, after a shooter killed 20 little children in Newtown, Connecticut. For the past 10 years, we've seen time and again that that concept has been proven wrong. A catchy saying designed to hide the truth, that Republicans refuse to help protect Americans from people we all agree should not be allowed to possess a weapon, as we're hearing today. In Uvalde, there were seven good guys with guns, and they didn't feel they could st go stop that bad guy. The gunman in Buffalo killed a good guy with a gun. We have tested that theory, and there's 31 dead people in these two attacks alone because we failed that tax. test. Texas is filled with good guys with guns. Texas laws are so pro-gun lobby that companies need to swear they won't discriminate against the firearm industry. In Texas, there are over 8,600 federally regulated licensed firearm dealers, and according to Rand, 37% of Texan adults lived in a household with a firearm between 2007 and 2016. Again, Texas is filled with good guys with guns, but that couldn't save the lives of those 19 children and two teachers. It's time to try something new. Republicans are the same people who told us that more good guys with guns keep kids safe. Then they told us that armed officers in schools would keep kids safe. Then they told us more shooter drills would solve the problem. Then they told us again that armed officers in schools would solve the problem. Each time they've been proven wrong. Children have been murdered. How many children have to die before we stop taking them seriously? This amendment goes in, a, in the wrong direction, and I therefore oppose it. I yield back. Who seeks recognition? No one. For what purpose does Mr. Swallow seek recognition? I'll strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I understand the sentiment uh, that Mr. Shabbat is bringing to this. I'm the son of a retired police officer. I have two brothers who are police officers, and our law enforcement family is just horrified by what happened at Uvalde. It's also unconscionable that police officers waited outside of a classroom as children were being slaughtered and 911 calls were being made from inside that classroom pleading for their lives. But what we have come to see across America is that our law enforcement are just outgunned. We're a country of unrestricted weaponry that continues to put the most dangerous weapons in the hands of the most dangerous people. So we could hire 100,000 retired police officers, but if we are a country that has over 100 million assault rifles, they're just outgunned. And that's what we saw in Ovalde. And tragically, in 2016, in Dallas, Texas, five brave police officers, SWAT-trained police officers, were murdered by a killer with an assault rifle. So I think we've debunked the idea that the answer to a killer with an assault rifle is to have more, quote unquote, good guys with guns. The good guys with guns are outgunned by the bad guys that we've given guns in our country. And so that's why we're addressing the root of the problem here with these six pieces of legislation. And with that, I'm gonna to yield to my uh, colleague from Rhode Island, Mr. Sicily. I thank the gentleman for yielding. I'd just like to add a couple of uh, thoughts. And the first is, I don't think there is a single incident, and, I, and maybe there's one, but I've not found one, of a, 
assailant using an assault weapon that was stopped by a person with a gun. Uh, so this is a, just, I mean, maybe there's one of the thousands and thousands and thousands of shootings. But the truth of the matter is school resource officers are an important response to school safety. I was a mayor of a city. We hired school resource officers. But what I also know is it requires special training to be a school resource officer, and it's up to local communities to decide where that's appropriate, what schools they want to use school resource officers in. And so having someone who's a retired police officer or someone who used to be in the Army may not actually be the best person to be in that position. And in addition to that, I think the COPS program that you reference here requires the hiring of police officers. And so I think we're urging the sense of Congress is actually to violate the requirements of the COPS program. So I don't think internally the amendment can work. The COPS program is specifically for police officers. I think there are good reasons that it be current police officers who are current training, who really understand what a school resource officer does. It's not about just plunking down a law enforcement person in a school. And I do think it creates the impression that that's the source of gun violence in schools. It's not. So I uh, strongly uh, support the chairman's position and oppose the amendment. And yield back to the gentleman from California. Thank you. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman, does Mr. Massey seek recognition? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wish to speak on the amendment. The gentleman is recognized. Well, the, the Democrats, I don't know if they're just uh, in willful ignorance of what happens in this country or they're being deceptive today, but I am, would like to introduce into the record a list of cases where concealed handgun permit holders have likely stopped mass public shootings. This is from crimeresearch.org. It was published May 27th, 2022. Without objection. I'll read from this list and, and I'm gonna run out of time, but I'll try to make each of these summaries brief because there are dozens of instances, even though the media doesn't want to report them, sometimes they get reported just, just this week. Last week, May 25th, 2022, uh, Charleston, West Virginia. Here a man with an extensive criminal history started firing an AR-15 style firearm into a crowd. Fortunately, a woman who was legally carrying a gun was there to stop the attack. She shot the attacker. It ended before anybody got hurt. South Fulton, Georgia, May 3rd, 2022. A teenager started firing his gun at multiple people. There was a large number of people present at the park because of an anti-violence riot. South Fulton, Georgia, this comes from a news report. Meadows said, the men involved in the shootout with Hambrick have been cooperative and will likely not be charged since the teenager fired the first shot. After having reviewed most of the witnesses' statements, it appears that the descendant, Mr. Hambrick, discharged his weapon first, and as a result of that, there was an exchange of gunfire between him and two individuals, good guys with a gun. Portland, Oregon, February 19th, 2022 homeowner allegedly confronted participants at a racial justice demonstration Saturday night before pulling out a handgun and shooting multiple people in the crowd, leaving one woman dead and several others injured. The shooting ended when a person with the group of demonstrators who is licensed to conceal carry a firearm fired back, striking the homeowner in the hip. Again, a good guy with a gun stops the shooting. Lancaster, Pennsylvania, October 17th, 2021. On Sunday, October 17th, four people were injured after a fight between two teenagers at Lancaster Park. City Center Mall escalated into a shooting this past weekend. A 16-year-old who was illegally carrying a gun started the shooting, but it could have been much worse were it not for concealed handgun permit holder. A bystander armed with a gun intervened in, in the shooting shooting one of the participants, the unidentified bystander who legally possessed a firearm had heard gunshots related to the fight between two males that knew each other, police said. The bystander remained on the scene until security and police arrived. Syracuse, New York, August 31st, 2021. The district attorney credited a property manager with saving the lives of several individuals after he pulled out a legally possessed nine millimeter handgun, the very gun that Joe Biden wants to ban, and fatally wounded a man who opened fire on a crowd outside a building. San Antonio, Texas, August 11, 2021. A woman who crashed into a parked car in San Antonio's West Side neighborhood climbed out of her vehicle and began shooting indiscriminately at people who came out of their homes and rushed to aid her. The armed resident fired back and shot the driver to death, ending the violent threat. 
to the neighborhood. And that was a good guy with a gun, or good gal with a gun sometimes. Fort Myers, Florida, July 22nd, 2021. A man who was a convicted felon and illegally possessing a gun fired multiple shots into a crowd before a bystander returned fire. When the bystander confronted the attacker, he stopped attacking and threw his gun in a parking lot. Fortunately, no one was injured in the attack. Chicago, Illinois, July 4th, 2021. It seems likely that if the concealed handgun permit holder hadn't intervened in this case, there would have been at least three deaths instead of just the one woman. Uh, Arvada, Colorado, June 21st, 2021. The attacker and two other people were killed in this attack. A good Samaritan who was killed in a shooting in Alvarado, Colorado. He did not hesitate. He didn't stand there and think about it. He totally heard the gunfire, went to the door, saw the shooter and immediately ran in that direction. I just want to make sure his family knows how heroic he was. Toronto said he witnessed Hurley confront the gunman. Mr. Hurley shot him. I think I heard six shots from his gun, maybe five. Police chief said Hurley is a true hero who likely disrupted what could have been a larger loss of life. I'm running out of time, but Fort Smith, Arkansas, May 15th, 2021, Zachary Arnold, 26, fatally shot Lois Hicks, 87, in her apartment, then began shooting at other people in neighborhood apartments. Wallace A. West, 58, used a rifle, not a concealed handgun, to stop the attack. Uh, Metairie, Louisiana, February 20th, 2021, having murdered two people and wounded a couple of others, it's clear that the attacker intended to kill as many people as possible. The quick response by people with concealed handgun permits stopped the attack. I could go on forever. I'm submitting this document. Hopefully my colleagues who sit here and keep saying that a good guy with a gun never stops, a bad guy with a gun will read this document. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back for our purposes, gentlelady from Texas, seek recognition. Strike the last word. And lady is recognized. I always look forward to working with the gentleman from Ohio, and uh, I recognize the intent behind uh, this legislation. I would offer to him that the very essence of his amendment is already covered. There's already opportunity to do that for school districts to define who they bring into their school. I think it's worthy to take note of the fact that the Robb Elementary School had a good guy with a gun that was nowhere to be found. Tragic. I think it's worthy to understand that good guys with guns can wind up killing, like a little girl going to dinner in Houston, and some good guy who was robbed way out of the way, began to chase her vehicle, driven by her dad, and shot at it. She is dead. So no matter how we try to circumvent to protect our kids, good guys with guns that can already be handled by school districts and other entities clearly is not the answer. Why are we running away from the crux of the matter? Why are we running away from 19 dead children and two beloved teachers and her husband who just died of a broken heart? Why are we running away from Buffalo, white supremacist, hatefulness, and a good guy with a gun, has, which has been mentioned, but there was body armor and an automatic weapon. Why are we running away from this style weapon as being unnecessary on the streets of America? Why are we running away from bump stocks that help kill 59 in Las Vegas? Why are we running away? Or am I to not be concerned about my officers, HPD? This is the real ghost gun that shot my police officers in Houston. Why are we running away from this? I appreciate the gentleman's effort. You'll hear me again. The police have told you that what we're doing is correct. Major chiefs, ban bump stock. Reinstate the assault weapons ban. Ban high capacity magazines. Everything that we're intending to do. My good friend Ohio said, I said we're not finished. You're absolutely right. We're planting the seeds, not hysteria. 
planting the seeds. I'm standing on good ground. I'm siding with Justice Scalia in the Heller case. Why? Because he indicates there's no unlimited use of guns. He clearly said, or the opinion, along with Miller, find support in the historical tradition of prohibiting the carrying of dangerous and unusual weapons. These are dangerous and unusual. Someone asked me, are you against all assault weapons? Well, there's a long list in the assault weapons legislation that we're thinking about that are exempted. It's not all of them. So that's why I argue for a seven-day waiting period on automatic weapons. But it's good for my friend, my other friend from Ohio, Jabot, to talk about what schools need to do. They're going to be looking at schools. There is a long document that I will hold up about school security that we've already put forward on the federal level. They have a monster a load of plans. But a good guy with a gun was missing in action at the elementary school as the parents are crying and saying. A mother said she was blocked from going in to get her children. She went around the school and broke in. We'll get more facts about that. But the issue is there are tools. But why are we sidestepping the crux of our problem? The fact that guns are not stored, the fact that there are uh, ammunition that should be restrained, uh, the fact that we have trafficking, that the age is ludicrous, and that's why the parents have asked me over and over again, why was an 18-year-old getting a gun? And the grandmother who saw this child get it, his gun was not stored or locked up. Maybe he bought it, but maybe the parents should have had the key. They did not, or maybe when he bought it, there should have been some devices for storing. So again, I'm not going to say anything about Mr. Shabbat's amendment other than it can already be done. And it's not on the crux of what we're doing today. Mr. Cabot sent out a message for them to utilize existing law. But you are moving away from what we're dealing with, the killing with these guns and munition needing to pass the Protect Kids Act. We need to pass it now. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentlelady yields back. What purpose does Mr. Jordan seek recognition? Strike the last word, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> gentleman is recognized. I, I would yield to uh, the, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Chabot. I thank the gentleman for uh, yielding. Um, the good guys with the guns here that we're talking about are retired police officers. These are the most highly trained people with weapons that a community can possibly have. It's, these are people that we've trusted uh, to keep us safe, keep our families safe in the past, generally for 25 years or so. Uh, these men and women retire oftentimes in their early 50s or so, uh, and they're able to work. Uh, many of them work another 15, even, even 20 years. Um, it just seems to make sense uh, that places that I think we all agree we need to protect, uh, that's schools, and most importantly, the precious lives within those schools, both the uh, students and the teachers, that you have the best, the most highly trained people of all to protect them, and that's the police officers. Now, we've expanded it to also uh, retired and former military personnel who are honorably discharged. Now, you know, you, you can have people involved in the military that have problems as well and left under unhonorable circumstances. We're not talking about those folks. We're talking about folks, both our police officers and our military personnel that our tax dollars have paid for to train to have this expertise. Why not use this expertise for a decade or even two decades to protect the most important resources that we have in this country? And that's our, our children. I'm a former school teacher myself. I taught the seventh and, and eighth grade in an inner city school. Uh, it's been quite a few years ago and we were fortunate that we didn't have uh, one of these types of incidences occur while I was a, a teacher there. Uh, and most schools don't have that happen, but unfortunately, far too many do. And what my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have proposed today are a number of items. Many of them will ultimately be declared unconstitutional 
who are almost identical cases have already been declared to be unconstitutional, yet that's what they're pushing ahead here. I'm simply suggesting that we make it more, uh, more that we let people that could actually get these folks to protect our children within their schools, give them more information about it, make it uh, more known to them that, that, these, that this is available um, and that these resources are, are there. There's other things, of course, that we can do to protect uh, children in those schools too. It's not just police officers. That's an important part of it, but there are other parts of it. And again, I wanna compliment uh, uh, John Rutherford, a former sheriff, one of our colleagues from, from Florida, who had a lot of experience in, in this area as former law enforcement himself for pushing not just the uh, police officers, but also um, you know, metal detectors as an option. Uh, more training for the teachers uh, to try to identify those troubled students who might ultimately down somewhere down the road um, participate in, in some sort of incident like this where they target fellow students um, or, or younger students or, or anybody for that matter. Um, so, I mean, that makes sense. It also makes sense to train our teachers uh, and our administrative personnel uh, is that when you have a circumstance like this that's happening, what's the best way that you can do to save lives? So all of those things are important. Those are things that we can and are doing right now, but we can do a lot more. And, and I would suggest, uh, you know, my colleagues, rather than opposing this, which I think is a very common sense thing, which would actually make a difference, uh, I'd say you ought to adopt this and make uh, at least something good in, in, in this bill. And I'm willing to discuss some of the other things that my Democratic colleagues have, have proposed here. Um, but overall, as a package, um, I just don't think it's helpful. Um, I think it, it just, it focuses on, well, we've done something, but unfortunately, I don't think it's going to make anybody any safer, especially since a lot of it's going to be probably thrown out as being unconstitutional in any event. We know this is constitutional. We know that tax dollars are already going to this uh, let's make it, let's let schools be more aware. Mr. Chairman, I cannot hear him. We and, lost and his I'll... audio and we're waiting for it to be uh, uh, restored and we've stopped the clock. Mr. Shad, not, not, now you can be heard. Okay, proceed. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure uh, uh, exactly what we're uh, dropped off at, but uh, I pretty much concluded. Uh, I would just urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to support this common sense amendment, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Texas seek recognition? Ms. Escobar. Mr. Chairman, I'd move to strike the last word. Gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I first wanna say that my heart goes out to Buffalo, Uvalde, Tulsa, and the innumerable communities like my own of El Paso, Texas, communities that have suffered the carnage and trauma of gun violence. I've been listening to my Republican colleagues on this committee for the last two hours as they desperately try to rationalize their inaction and their unwillingness to support our legislation. I'd like to speak directly to the American public Let's be very clear about what the two sides are actually arguing for. Republicans are trying to convince you that anyone who wants a gun should have unfettered access to one, whether you want to take a weapon of war into a state that outlaws them, whether you want to be armed with a ghost gun, or whether you're an 18 year old who wants an assault style weapon, but who isn't even old enough to drink. You're hearing it over and over this morning. They believe that the only way to solve our gun crisis is by flooding our neighborhoods with more guns. If you want a glimpse at the kind of dark vision they have for America, just look at my state of Texas, which is a perfect example of what they want. In Texas, after the slaughter in El Paso, the governor, Greg Abbott, promised to change our laws. And he did, he loosened them in order to move closer to the dark vision today's Republican Party has for America. In Texas, the age for access to certain guns was lowered
from 21 to 18. In Texas, you can now open carry. In Texas, you don't need training. In Texas, you don't need a license. And mind you, this is in Texas where law enforcement begged the state not to do this. And where many school districts have their own police force already, including the school district in Valde. Once again, proving that a good guy with a gun mostly doesn't stop a bad guy with a gun, especially when that bad guy has high capacity magazines and a, an, an assault style weapon. The guns my Republican colleagues want in our neighborhoods don't just pierce flesh, they destroy it. They shatter muscle, shatter bones, shatter nerves. Their vision of America is one where everyone has a gun. And you heard one of my Republican colleagues describe the Wild West shootouts happening across America as though he's perversely proud of this. The other solution they want is to ensure every public location is hardened. And then we continue on this spiral of violence that is as unique to America as these deadly gun laws are. Not only did none of Greg Abbott's looser gun laws prevent more mass shootings in Texas, but his approach has hastened them. And my Republican colleagues will continue to blame everything else. They'll blame mental illness, video games, single parents, the list goes on and on. But what's the common denominator in gun violence attacks? It's the guns. Democrats aren't asking for anything unreasonable. And in fact, we're following the lead of the American public. I'm following the lead of the majority of my constituents, as well as the victims of gun violence after the August 3rd, 2019 shooting in El Paso. People who have told me over and over again, they want us to do our job. Americans are tired of their children dying. Americans are tired of being afraid to go into grocery stores, outdoor concerts, and now hospitals. To my Republican colleagues, look at Texas, a state that has tried it your way. There's blood everywhere. To the American people, there is an extremism that has gripped the Republican party. They're addicted to it. They're slaves to it. They post ghoulish photos of themselves with weapons of war and use it as their Christmas cards. They photograph their children with those weapons. They participate in congressional hearings virtually adorned with them. As they continue with their destructive behavior, it's up to serious legislators to listen to the public, do our job, make people safe. I'd love for Republicans to join us, but when they do not, the American public must take heed of which party protects them, protects law enforcement, and protects their children, and which party chooses its ghoulish obsession over all else. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. General Lee, the yields back for purposes, Mr. Big seek recognition. Move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the, the uh, Ms. Jackson Lee, who reminded us that the crux of today's hearing is to protect children at schools. And um, I think that is really important. And I think the reason that Mr. Shabbat's amendment is so important, and the reason I support it, is because it does get at the crux of why we are here today, whereas the six bills that are rolled into the, the Democrats' bill today doesn't get at that. It just doesn't, it simply doesn't get at that. When you add um, retired police officers and honorably discharged retired veterans to the, to the folks that can come in and help defend schools, you are actually increasing the likelihood that somebody who wants to attack them will be deterred. As Mr. Johnson of Louisiana previously recited today, the manifesto written by the shooter from Buffalo said that he was effectively looking for gun-free zones. What a school police officer presence would do would provide deterrence. And really, that is the crux of what we're talking about here today. How do you deter criminally violent people from going in and committing mass shootings and mass murders? So it seems to me perfectly rational um, to adopt the Shabbat Amendment. Now, I, I will add to some of the 
that the times that people do stop, people with guns do stop bad people, criminally evil people from committing heinous crimes. The Department of Justice has done studies, and their, one of their studies said that on average, about 1.5 million times a year, people with guns stop violent, heinous acts. In other words, they deter and save lives. They deter violence and save lives. That's what Mr. Shabbat's amendment gets to. I think of, of um, a guy named Stephen Williford. Uh, he was the guy who stopped the mass shooting in its act in Sutherland Springs, Texas. I had a chance to, to visit with him with several other members of Congress. He said his biggest regret was that he had to, it took him 30 seconds or so to get his weapon out of his gun safe to go over and engage the uh, demonic gunman at Sutherland Springs. He believed that had he been able to get over there even 30 seconds sooner, he would have saved four or five lives. That's important to put these things in context. Um, the reality is we know that people with guns and their presence deters bad actors. Does it deter all bad actors? No, but it does deter bad actors. And it deters uh, uh, angry, malevolent um, people with murderous intent. That's why Mr. Shabbat's amendment is so important. It actually adds to and expands the pool of people who are qualified to come in and help defend our schools. So if the crux of this is really to deter um, people who will shoot up schools and provide safety, and, and I believe that's what we're talking about here today, then this amendment is wholesale and whole on and should be adopted. But if the crux of today's hearing is something different, the way uh, the gentleman from New, New York was talking about, and actually several others have talked about, is it's really to ultimately lay the predicate for taking away the Second Amendment and taking away guns, whether they be an AR-15 or whether they be a nine millimeter handgun, well, then that's an entirely different matter and that should be resolved in a completely different hearing. But if you're talking about deterrence, then Mr. Shabbat's amendment should be adopted and that's why I support it. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. What purpose does Mr. Johnson of Georgia seek recognition? Um, move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Today, we're here for the children, for the kids. We're talking about protecting our kids from out of control gun violence in America. You know, it was almost 10 years ago, December the 14th of 2012, when Sandy Hook took place, a 20-year-old armed with an assault weapon murdered 20 children between the ages of five and six and killed six teachers. And at that time, the head of the NRA, Wayne LaPierre, uttered words that Republicans continue to march to today, and that is that the only way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. It hasn't worked in the schools since Sandy Hook. I watched last week, the Nation watched a press conference, um, Governor Abbott of Texas recounting what allegedly occurred at the school where 19 children, 19 more children, murdered by a guy with a long gun, an 18-year-old. And Governor Abbott was interrupted by my former colleague, Beto O'Rourke, who was just frustrated at what he was hearing. You see, the governor was not telling the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. He talked about the governor, that there was a 
school resource officer, a good guy with a gun who tried to stop the bad guy with the gun. But that turned out not to be true. It was actually 19 good guys wearing white cowboy hats with guns. And they weren't able to stop that 18-year-old with a more powerful weapon than the one that they had. And so today, we're talking about reining in this out-of-control gun violence, which prevents our children from being able to feel secure as they go to school. You know, over the last 10 years, uh, we've had a series of, of uh, events in this nation where there have been good guys with guns who weren't able to stop the bad guys. Two weeks ago in Buffalo, New York, 10 people murdered, including an armed security guard and former police officer who shot at the gunman, but the gunman had a bigger gun than he had. And he was this brave former police officer who put his life on the line, and we thank him for that. But he lost his life trying to protect others. Bad guy with a gun, one. Good guy with a gun, zero. <coughs> in 2017, police and security guards were present both at the route 91 Harvest Music Festival in Las Vegas and in the hotel where the shooter was perched and carried out that mass murder. 58 people killed and over 800 injured. Bad guy with a gun, two. Good guy with a gun, zero. In 2016 at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, an armed security guard shot at the gunman before the gunman went into the club, ultimately killing 49 people. Bad guy with a gun, three. Good guy with a gun, zero. In 2018, a shooter killed 10 people at Santa Fe High School in Texas, even though there were two officers who were on site, and one was wounded trying to stop the gunman. Bad guy with a gun, four. Good guy with a gun, zero. It's We've listened to my colleagues on the other side recount a series of situations where individuals own, uh, armed with handguns uh, protecting themselves and the lives of others were successful. And I can't argue with that other than to point out that they didn't do it with assault weapons. They, were, they had handguns. Earlier in 2018, a school resource officer was on the campus at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, but he couldn't stop the gunman from killing 17 high schoolers. Bad guy with a gun, five. Good guy, good guy with a gun, zero. When will we stop relying upon this failed notion that the only thing that stops bad guys is good guys. Congress can stop some bad guys with some good legislation, and that's what we're here to do today, and with that, I yield back. General Meals, back for purposes, Mr. Broy, seek recognition. I uh, uh, want to ask to speak on the amendment. The gentleman is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll have more to say on the underlying measure uh, in a little bit. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of comments um, just because there's been a lot of reference to what did or did not occur in Uvalde. Um, the district I represent uh, does not uh, contain Uvalde. Uh, it borders uh, Texas 21. Uh, I know a lot of uh, the people in the community in Uvalde um, and uh, including some of the, uh, the folks uh, involved. Um, I got a phone call last Tuesday because I had been trading messages uh, uh, with the mayor of Uvalde and um, then we missed each other. And so then I just asked the mayor what was happening and the mayor texted me and uh, pulling it up here and he said, well, this is before we knew anything. The reports weren't out. He said, the reports were, it looks like 18 to 20 young kids, the quote, asshole shot them and stacked them like firewood. Um, we've all been um, 
reeling since then, uh, knowing what that meant to a community, a close-knit community like Uvalde. Um, and it's horrific and it's the face of evil. I don't know um, whether or not a resolution or a sense of Congress uh, by my friend from Ohio will, will make significant difference. Um, but I do know I appreciate what the gentleman is trying to focus on, which is how do we, how do we uh, prevent um, bad actors from carrying out bad acts? And then what do we do in that? And how do we respond to it? Uh, there's a lot of commentary going on about what police did or didn't do in the school in Uvalde. And I would just ask for members to um, respect the process of looking through and determining the facts before we pass judgment. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Gates, made the point that uh, there are still a lot of um, unknown facts and there's still uh, investigations underway, state, federal, and local. Um, I've gotten multiple different accounts, even in the last two days. Uh, we saw yesterday, for example, the day before, the report of the propped open door by the teacher turned out not to be exactly accurate. The door had been propped open, or at least the facts as I currently understand it, the door had been propped open when the teacher went out. That was a violation of protocol, no doubt. But then when she heard gunfire, allegedly went in and knocked the prop out, uh, but then the door didn't lock. Right? Well, that's a fact that I don't even know, like go pursue that fact. My point is the entire country was then saying, well, what's wrong with this uh, teacher who propped this door and then that caused, well then imagine, and I happen to know some facts about this, what that meant to that teacher when everybody's out across America saying how, you know, blaming her uh, and then now focus on the police and blaming, you know, 19 cops or seven cops or three cops. I get a different quote from every person talking about it standing in the hallway, like they're sitting around their thumb up their rear uh, while bad things are happening. Well, that's not true uh, fully based on what I understand from a number of accounts. I'm not here to defend the officers on the scene. I'm not here to criticize the officers on the scene. I'm here to say that let's wait on the damn facts because these are people and we ought to be making sober judgments about what actually occurred and making policy accordingly. Because what if the hardening and the steel doors were actually part of the difficulty of entering. What if the key wasn't accessible and there wasn't appropriate uh, timing and training for getting the key? I don't know. There are a lot of facts that I'm still waiting to reserve judgment on. I would just ask that our colleagues, both sides of the aisle, to be honest, but uh, I've heard it uh, from my Democratic colleagues today making judgments about cops standing there. And I, I don't believe that was true for the vast majority of the law enforcement on the scene who were trying to get access to and try to protect those kids. Um, and they don't need, deserve to be lumped into one group. Uh, we can make determinations about who made what decisions when the reports come out and then uh, pass judgment accordingly. But we're still getting reports and facts on that. I feel really strongly about that. And I, I believe that no matter where this occurs in the country, get the facts and then figure out policy. There have been a number of things that have been raised about AR-15s. And I don't know how much time I have left because I don't have a clock in front of me and I apologize for not being in person. Um, I couldn't get a flight to work out for me this morning uh, as I intended. Um, I, and I have more to say about it, but you know, a lot is being said about the AR-15, uh, about being a weapon of war uh, and what all it can do. And that, you know, going through concrete, going through cinder blocks and you know, ripping people apart. And that it is a weapon of war, but the fact of the matter is, it, it's more accurate to say that a Remington 700 bolt action rifle or 30 odd six are weapons of war more than the the uh, AR-15, which is not. Now it's like it's obviously a cousin uh, to some degree, but it is a semi-automatic weapon. And I've heard reference to automatic weapons. The gentleman lady from Texas referred to automatic weapons. Well, you can't get an automatic weapon without a permit. It is a semi-automatic weapon, uh, and I've heard a lot of people here saying, "Well, why can't you get on board with this legislation?" Because, well. Uh, it's just limiting a magazine or limiting the, uh, um, the time of the gentleman has expired. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Georgia seek recognition? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word in opposition to this. Gentlelady is recognized. Thank you.
You know, I am just so really frustrated that our colleagues on the other side uh, with their responses to the slaughterings in our schools and, you know, their answer is to provide more people with guns rather than taking guns out of the hands of people who absolutely should not have access to them. And as we know, there were 19 officers outside of the classrooms at Robb Elementary where a gunman executed child after child after child, one for each child that was taken away from us. This false notion of good guys with guns does not work. That has been disproved over and over and over again. In Buffalo, New York, a security guard with a gun, a retired police officer, in fact, heroically tried to defend the shoppers in the Topps grocery store. But he was shot down by the gunman with an assault weapon. Turning our schools into fortresses is just absolutely not the answer. We cannot ignore our duty to protect our children from being massacred. Yes, improving school safety is vitally important, but sensible gun safety is the fastest way to keep our families safe. Trust me, I am a survivor of gun violence. I am a survivor, a mother of senseless gun violence. We are teetering here in America on the brink of being one of the most civilized, violent nations in the world. If we want to invest in our schools, invest in the mental health of the children and teachers who fear each and every single day that they're in school, they're going to be the next site of a mass shooting. It is imperative that we focus on ensuring that guns are not in the wrong hands so that we are operating on the offense in preventing these shootings from happening in the first place rather than acting in defense and only offering thoughts and prayers once they occur. And I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. For what purpose is Mr. Buck seek recognition? Speaking uh, on behalf of the amendment. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Wait a minute, I, I, I first want to uh, thank the gentleman from Ohio for bringing the amendment. And uh, obviously, the, the, my Democrat colleagues make a, a point that uh, not every time a good guy has a gun does he stop a bad guy with a gun. Um, but it does happen on occasion. Um, not every time that someone uh, locks up a gun in a home do they stop someone uh, in a nearby school from entering and, and firing a gun. Uh, none of these measures that the Democrats have proposed today stop all violence. Uh, Mr. Shabbat's amendment is intended to help. It's not intended to, and, and nobody suggests that it does, uh, eliminate all chances of violence. But I want to uh, respond to the gentlelady from Texas when uh, she talked about the dark vision uh, that Republicans have. Um, I, I, uh, I think a lot of people in this country are offended that uh, the, the lady would uh, go that direction. Um, first of all, she, she said that uh, anyone who wants to own a gun, uh, Republicans believe anyone who wants to own a gun should be able to get one. I don't believe that. I don't think most of my Republican colleagues, if any, believe that. I think that uh, anybody who has been convicted of a dangerous uh, felony, a violent felony, should not have a gun. Um, I think it's quite obvious uh, that there are people in this country that uh, have forfeited their right to guns. As, as, as has been mentioned before, the Second Amendment's not absolute, and, and we should take that. Um, but the gentlelady talked about a dark vision that Republicans have for America, that, uh, that somehow a good guy with a gun is um, uh, not able, uh, uh, is not enough to, to stop a bad guy with a gun. Well, you, well, the Democrats have taken away the ability of a good guy to have a gun in a school uh, to, to stop uh, bad guys. A teacher who wants to bring a gun to school, uh, an administrator, a coach, others can't do that right now. 
But I also think that, you know, if you want to point out dark visions for America, um, I, I think when the Democrats argue uh, for an open border, what they're arguing for is to allow dangerous uh, gang members to come across that border, MS-13 and others. And they have. Uh, when they open the border up, they allow uh, dangerous drugs to come across the border, like fentanyl. Leading cause of death for 18 to 45-year-olds in this country is drug overdose. Um, that is a direct relation that is directly uh, uh, occurs because of the open border policies of this administration, particularly Secretary Mayorkas. When you open a border, you allow terrorists to come across the border. When you open a border, uh, I think it was Mr. Cohen who mentioned earlier about the gun parts that, that are coming in from China that allow a semi-automatic weapon to be uh, converted into an automatic weapon. That happens by opening a border and letting it come across. But we don't hear Democrats talk about that as a solution it, to close our border and to get a grip on uh, the terrible things that have been happening as a result of that. Uh, they, you know, the, the Democrats uh, have, have promoted a culture of death in this country with their views on abortion. We have late-term abortions, absolutely horrific late-term abortions that somehow the Democrats think, uh, you know, can happen in a vacuum and that it won't have an impact on the rest of society. We have uh, uh, people being paid not to work. Um, and oftentimes, those people are, are also using drugs, getting money from the government to buy uh, the drugs. We have uh, gas prices skyrocketing in this country. Are those uh, the dark vision of the Democrat Party? I don't think so. I think they're bad policies that have been made by the liberal progressives in the Democrat Party. But I don't think that they're dark, po they're dark vision uh, of the Democrats. And I think what we have to do is make sure we get away from the kind of language that the general lady from Texas used to accuse Republicans of having some kind of dark vision. We care deeply about what's happening in our schools. We disagree that these shallow, uh, inconsequential bills will have an impact on that. What I'm asking for, and what many of my colleagues in, in uh, Congress are asking for, let's have some meaningful discussion on how to get to the bottom line, how to, how to address, not the gun, but the person behind the gun, how to address the, the sickness, the evil that we see in our society that, that will allow us to get to the point where uh, we are a, a safer country. And I thank the gentleman from Ohio for offering one small piece of that. Um, and, and really disappointing that the Democrats won't acknowledge that it is a small piece, but it is a positive step in what we can do. With that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from uh, Rhode Island seek recognition? I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. <laughs> I first want to say, in response to the gentleman from Texas's comment about why don't we just wait till we understand all the facts of Uvalde with some more um, investigation underway, he acted as if we've had two shootings in America, two mass shootings, and we're coming to respond to that. We are responding to thousands and thousands and thousands of shootings in this country over the last decade. And so what, we're, what have been developed here are developed in response to a gun violence oh. epidemic. And the well, idea, well, the no, I seconds. will not yield. The idea that we should wait while we can have families that have yeah, lost loved ones who are expecting Congress to respond. The time belongs and the to idea, the as Mr. Roy suggested, wait that we should just wait to find out. We should be respond. We've waited too long already. I'm not we failed to, to respond the to the cries of people the all across Please this island. country who have asked and demanded that Congress act. So, no, we shouldn't wait. We shouldn't wait another second. We shouldn't wait another yeah, minute, another day. We should about. act now. The second thing is my friend that. and colleague from Colorado just made reference to these, this suite of bills as shallow and inconsequential. Shallow and inconsequential. I'm going to go through just a few pieces of this. Ghost guns were used in a shooting in Santa Clara, California that killed three people and injured three others. Ghost guns were used in November of 2017 in Rancho Tehama, California that eight injured 18 people. Another shooting in Santa Monica, California that killed six. Bump stocks were used, as we all know, in Las Vegas that killed 60. Shootings that involved people under 21 years of age. Robb Elementary School, as we know, Uvalde, Texas, Topps Friendly Market, 10 were killed. 
22 were killed in Uvalde. Santa Fe High School, 10 were killed, 13 were injured. Parkland, Florida, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, 17 were killed, 17 injured. Newtown, Sandy Hook Elementary School, 27 people, children were killed. And Columbine, 15 people were killed and 24 were injured. Those individuals would not have been able to buy the gun they bought if the bill that we're going to pass today were the law. Safe storage, the list goes on for pages. So to say inconsequential, when it would have saved the lives of many, many people, and as Chairman Nadler said, even if it's one life. So to say it's inconsequential, and then to say let's talk about border security and abortion, because all we want to do is avoid responsibility to act in the face of gun violence in this country. Shame on our colleagues. If you don't want to talk about it, you don't want to address it, don't come to the hearing. But honor the memories of those who we have lost to gun violence by taking this issue seriously and being committed to finding solutions. You think a grieving mother or father who's watching you wants to hear you talk about abortion and border security? We're trying to respond to gun violence that led to the death of their child? That's what this hearing's about. These families, and sadly, there are thousands of families across this country who fall into this category, who have suffered unspeakable pain because Congress has failed to act, and our Republican colleagues in the Senate in particular, in blocking any progress in reducing gun violence in this country. We owe it to their memory. We owe it to the oath that we have taken to protect our constituents, our most solemn responsibility. And people talk about the Second Amendment. We've heard it again today. It's, the, it's a constitutional amendment. You can't touch it. That is not true. The Supreme Court of the United States has told us that. Well, the gentleman you? The Supreme Court of the United States has made it clear that Congress has the authority to impose reasonable restrictions well, the to protect you? the life and the safety and the security of those we serve. In another? the same way you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. There is no constitutional right that is absolute. It is balanced with responsibility. With the gentleman you And so all point? these claims about, gee, we wish we could do something. We wish we could remove America from this terrible distinction of being a country that, that has a gun violence epidemic unlike any other country in the developed world. And by the way, if more guns were the answer, we live in the safest country in the world. There are more guns in America than people. Our country is awash in guns, and it has produced more and more and more death and more gun violence. So that's not the answer. We've tried it. It doesn't work. We need real solutions so we can go back to our districts and, and demonstrate to the people we serve we've taken some action that's going to make a difference and help protect lives in communities all across this country. And with that, I yield back. Gentlemen, yields back. Uh Gentlemen from Florida, for what purposes, gentlemen from Florida seek recognition? Strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. He said it right there. What they're upset about is the number of guns in the country. This isn't about, you know, modest age restrictions that are unconstitutional. It's not about better record keeping. They want fewer guns. They think that the answer is fewer guns. And that is what is creating a lot of discomfort among our fellow Americans who cherish their guns and cherish their Second Amendment rights and have actually committed no Do They crimes. cherish their children, have, Mr. They, Gates? You know what? Their children aren't the ones at risk as a consequence of law-abiding gun owners. All children in America are at risk. That's what you get wrong. It's not law-abiding gun owners, David. Okay. Were those children in Uvalde the law, the law, the law, at risk? So here's the, the tension. Time. Here's the tension, okay? You guys are spasming into this reflexive response, and you, and you call it an emergency hearing, right? And the basis for the emergency is what happened in Evaldi. And we all agree it was awful and tragic, but you, you are not providing the thoughtful solutions that would actually reduce the likelihood of that. When you make an argument in the Judiciary Committee for a change in the law, there are two components. You have to demonstrate a need for the change, and that what you're bringing forward will actually affect that in a positive way. And it's the second part of the argument where the bills you've presented today undeniably fail. Yeah, and in Florida, I would suggest we had a process that's a little bit better than what we've observed here. In Florida, following Parkland, every, every Floridian wanted to reduce the likelihood that that could ever occur again for precisely the reasons that animate your passions today. But instead of you know, rushing to town, stumbling bills together, 
We got our very best sheriffs, our very best police chiefs, former members of law enforcement, people with tactical experience, even parents of slain children. And we put them on a board to review the a school shooting as if it were an airline crash, dispassionately, thoroughly. And then as a consequence, what we saw was actually a failure in law enforcement, that the sheriff in Broward County was so recalcitrant in not doing the training, that the on-the-ground law enforcement were so uh, derelict in their duties that children died that didn't need to. And so Governor DeSantis rightly fired that sheriff, replaced them, put better training in, more money to harden our schools and our synagogues, our, our houses of worship across the state of Florida, and we're safer as a consequence. So it's not that we're particularly here to talk about abortion or the border. We understand we have to make these things less likely, but whether it's you, you holding an emergency hearing to respond to a leaked draft opinion that's not even final, or now when the Congressman Roy from Texas says, gosh, before you have the emergency Uvalde hearing, maybe we ought to figure out what happened in Uvalde so that we can ma make that frequency um, less likely to occur. Uh, I think there's also a balancing of interests here that the American people need to understand. You say, if it, if it saves one life, if it saves anything that saves one life is totally worth doing, and certainly every loss of life is tragic, and certainly every preventable loss of life is tragic, but Mr. Cohen gave up the game earlier when he said, we acknowledge on the front end of this hearing that there will be deprivations of liberty to law-abiding people, that we will at times stop law-abiding people from doing what is otherwise constitutionally illegal, constitutionally legal. So while I certainly want every American to safely store their firearms, while I certainly want every American to be trained on the safe storage of firearms, I'm not entirely sure that the Congress of the United States is the appropriate entity to tell Americans how to store firearms and then punish them as a consequence. And if the result of all of this is there's, there's a, you know, you know, a life or two that we save, you know, and the result is, like, how many tens of millions of Americans are you willing to deprive of their constitutionally guaranteed liberty in order to achieve that objective when there might be a more narrowly constrained, appropriate way for, um, act, for you know, uh, gun enthusiast groups, hunting clubs, local government states to try to educate and encourage proper safety uh, of the storage of firearms. So again, we, we share your goal of making these shootings less likely, whether they be in our schools or elsewhere in our communities, but we don't think that, that in the name of you know, saving one life, that fundamentally constraining the rights of all Americans is necessary, especially when we are still awaiting the results of the review of what happened in Evaldi that shocks the conscience of all of us. So please spare us the, like, the spirited screaming. We, we want to stop the violence. We just wish you would listen to some of the ideas that we think would help. And you know, from my standpoint, if you hold schools out as gun-free zones, as soft targets, you make those school shootings more likely. And I don't think you want to do that. But I think that if we got rid of the gun-free zones and if we empowered people that could be helpful, we might see a reduction in violence. I yield back. The gentleman yields back for what purposes the gentleman from New York seek recognition? Move to strike, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman is recognized. The gentleman from Florida said that he and the, his Republican colleagues want to stop the violence in this country. Uh, but it's difficult to believe that when there are common sense steps that Congress can take and they are unanimously obstructing those approaches. I want to elaborate something that my colleague, Mr. Cicilline, said earlier today, uh, because it is clear to me that the more my colleagues misinterpret the Second Amendment and the Supreme Court's decision in D.C. versus Heller, uh, the more they are giving up the fact that they've not actually read those documents. Let's start with the Second Amendment. The text is clear. The amendment protects the collective right of the people as a whole to possess arms solely for the purpose of forming a well-regulated militia. Now, last time I checked, the National Guard doesn't depend on teenage boys owning semi-automatic rifles with high-capacity magazines. Notice that while the Second Amendment is explicit that the government has the authority to regulate the use of arms, the Second Amendment does not include a single word, not one word, about an individual right to own a gun. In fact, the claim that the Second Amendment protects an individual's right to own a gun is so indefensible that even the conservative former Chief Justice Warren Burger, a Nixon appointee, no less, 
had once denounced it as, quote, one of the greatest pieces of fraud on the American public he had ever heard. No wonder the Supreme Court never recognized an individual right to own a gun from the ratification of the Constitution in 1789 until 2008 when the Roberts Court's far-right majority issued its 5-4 opinion in Heller. So let's talk about Heller. Yes, Heller did set a constitutional baseline that there is a right to own a handgun for self-defense in the home. But even in that egregiously mistaken decision, even in that decision, the court made clear that we can still regulate gun ownership and possession, particularly in sensitive places, as well as prohibit an individual from possessing firearms. As the late Justice Scalia's opinion explains, quote, like most rights, the right secured by the Second Amendment is not unlimited. And, quote, the right was not a right to keep and carry any weapon whatsoever in any manner whatsoever and for whatever purpose. In fact, Justice Scalia went out of his way to emphasize that the sort of measures we are considering today would be plainly constitutional. He wrote, quote, nothing in our opinion, nothing should be taken to cast doubt on laws forbidding the carrying of firearms in sensitive places such as schools and government buildings or laws imposing conditions and qualifications on the commercial sale of arms. And he continued that, quote, another important limitation on the right to keep and carry arms is that only, quote, the sorts of weapons protected were those in common use at the time. The Constitution does not condemn us to allow weapons of war to flood our neighborhoods. Make no mistake about that. My colleague's desperate citation to an outlier ruling by two Trump appointees in one circuit and when have they ever been fans of the Ninth Circuit, as my colleague, Mr. Nagoose, pointed out earlier, does not change the reality of what the Supreme Court has said. That is why even more circuits have upheld age restrictions on firearm purchases. The Fifth Circuit has twice upheld restrictions on particular weapons for 18 to 21 year olds. The Supreme Court declined to weigh in both of those times, allowing the Fifth Circuit to be the final word in upholding these age restrictions. And the First and Seventh Circuits have upheld age restrictions as well. Activist, Trump-appointed judges may be trying to change settled law, just as they are trying to roll back decades of settled law upholding the right to an abortion. But don't believe the lie that they are, that they are selling, a lie so radical that even the far-right Roberts Court hasn't endorsed it. Age restrictions are nothing new, and they are consistent with the Second Amendment. So I, I've heard enough, and I think I speak for my Democratic colleagues when I say this, of ill-informed, bad faith, constitutional misinterpretations, the Constitution is no obstacle to protecting our kids in America today. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. Uh, for what purpose does Mr. Bishop seek recognition? To uh, speak on the amendment. Gentleman is recognized. And in response to the uh, comments just made, I'm, I'm glad this comes together this way because I've been wanting to knock down some canards and some straw men, arguments that have been offered by the majority. But to that point, with well, the points just made by the gentleman from New York, who earlier made clear, that because he said it literally, that he will use all means necessary to reverse the, res the, the Supreme Court, not through the processes of the Supreme Court, court by, but by changing it institutionally, by packing it, by getting rid of the, uh, the uh, filibuster, institutional, over, overriding institutional norms as usual. But to the point just argued, the central holding of Heller is that the Second Amendment confers an individual right. That is the core of Heller. It's what the left went berserk about because you don't want that right to be recognized. Mr. Jones then comes forth making my argument perhaps better than I can, saying that his main objective is to see to it that that individual right recognized in Heller no longer continues to apply. Sir, and, when did and I, he, and he, well, the gentleman yield? Let me finish. No, I won't. You, you, you had a great opportunity there. That you are now the misconstruing. Statement, the statement has been made by Mr. Cicilline, by Mr. Deutsch, by Mr. Jones, by the President of the United States, that the Second Amendment is not absolute, that it's not without limits. No one has contended that it is without limits. But Heller gives clear indications to what limits are permissible. You read from some of them. What is unlikely, and the Ninth Circuit case falls in the right 
uh, resolution on that, the Fourth Circuit case earlier, the recognition by the dissent by Jim, Judge Wynn in the Fourth Circuit uh, in the same case is that 18 to 20 year olds are covered by the Second Amendment first. And the second point is that bans of widely prevalent firearms and, and, and uh, acquainted mechanisms are, that, that's the problem. You can't do that. Another thing Heller said you can't do is require people to lock them up in their homes so they can't be accessed to provide for their main purpose, which is the right of self-defense of home and hearth. The gentleman yield. That, no, I will not. I'm going to get this out so that somebody hears it. The president of the United States said the other day, Dead children can't the hear. president said another misnomer or another factually in, inaccurate point you couldn't buy a cannon when the Second Amendment was adopted. And actually, it's false. It's been debunked repeatedly, but he keeps repeating it. So when you come in and say, we can't, I'm making the argument, you're, you attribute to those of us on our side who are raising the question of the constitutionality of what you propose. I do not make the argument that the Second Amendment is absolute or unlimited. What I make the point about is Heller held what it held. McDonald held what it held. That was the Supreme Court of the United States. Do you acknowledge that baseline or do you not? Mr. Jones has made re clear repeatedly that he does not. When I, and when we've raised these points about what uh, other courts are deciding about the 18 to 20 year olds being governed by the, being covered, they have a right under that amendment, number one. And number two, that some limitations are impermissible. And those you propose in this bill, Three of them. Yep. I said two earlier. I was mistaken. Three. You want to ban a whole class of weapons to 18 to 20-year-olds, number one. Number two, you want to impose the same kind of disability or disabling requirement mandate in the home of weapons that, the, that Heller said is impermissible. And finally, you want to ban magazines that, have the number, that, are, in, that are predominant, that are prevalent everywhere in the country. Heller said you can't do that. So you've got to contend with why, at least if you say the Ninth Circuit, well, it's great for you guys to cite the Ninth Circuit. You don't respect the Ninth Circuit. Yeah, the Ninth Circuit is liberal. That's why it's so remarkable that even they yeah. have said that this is something that can't be done. You can't ban a class of weapons to people 18 to 20. So I'm glad to undertake things that we can do. Let's talk about them. But when you start talking about things you can't do, and then you couple that with statements that essentially say I'm going to get rid of the Second Amendment will, by any means Will the gentleman necessary. yield? Yeah, I'll yield to what, you. What do you support? Like, what, what are you willing to do to stop the epidemic of gun violence in this country? Because you just referenced that, so I would love for you to articulate the efforts that you would be willing to undertake here's with your first, Democratic colleagues in this chamber today yeah, here's to stop the, the epidemic of gun do. violence in this country, sir. You look at what's happening, and then you actually do things that would address that. Yeah. So you're Let's not going to answer the question why. because you don't There's actually have an approach other yeah, than to yeah. allow the status quo to remain? Yeah. yeah, I wouldn't let teachers prop doors open. I wouldn't, I wouldn't make sure that police are not discouraged from going in and saving a per children who are being assaulted while the assault is going on. I would not intimidate the police and tell them they ought to cease to exist. My time's expired. I can translate that for you. He's willing to do nothing. It sounds right to me. Gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Florida seek recognition? I move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. Uh, thank you. Just a couple of points, uh, Mr. Chairman. First of all, uh, the, the assertion that Heller prevents us from taking the action that we're taking today is, is just a misreading of Heller. And, and, I, and I'll leave it to the scholars to look at what was struck down in Heller and what we're proposing here. And the reference to the Ninth Circuit is, okay, I, under, I understand it's, it's the liberal circuit that my colleagues like to point to. Forget who the judges were in this case. The fact is there are other circuits who have ruled otherwise. And we all know it's the Supreme Court who has the last word. So let's just be clear about that. But I just, I, I, have, to, I, I have to respond to what Mr. Gates said. There, I know that there are, uh, there are families in the room there today who lost loved ones at, in Newtown. And I know that there are people watching all around the country, including a lot of my constituents, 17 families, in fact, whose loved ones will never come home. And the 60 families from Las Vegas and 49 families from 
Orlando and Virginia Tech, the Virginia Tech shooting, 32 people killed, that was in 2007. This idea, this argument that we're rushing into action, that we're not being thoughtful, that we should just take some time to really understand what happened before we respond is another way of saying we have no interest in ever responding, in ever doing anything to stop this gun violence epidemic in our country. That's the message that it's sending. You can't sit there, with all due respect to my colleagues, you cannot sit as a member of the House of Representatives and tell my constituents that it's just too soon for us to rush in to figure out what kind of legislation we should pass. We, we haven't had time to really fully digest what happened in Uvalde or Buffalo or, or any other mass shooting that has taken place in the more than four years since that awful Valentine's Day in Parkland. And when Mr. Gates talks about what the state legislature did, the way he characterizes it is we all got together and we came up with all kinds of things that we could do that, that are so radically different than what we're trying to do here today. In fact, in fact, what the Florida legislature did was come together in a bipartisan way and raise the age to buy an AR-15 to 21, to buy any gun to 21. That's what the Florida legislature did. Let's be clear about it. You know what else they did? They passed a red flag law because they understand that if you give law enforcement the ability to take uh, action so that someone who poses a threat to himself or herself uh, shouldn't have a firearm and that you build in appropriate due process rights, uh, that that's the appropriate thing to do. That's what we're going to do next week also. That's what Florida did. So I, I, it just it just pains it pains me. I think it pains all of us. And, and frankly, anyone who's watching what we're doing here today, to to look at this debate and to and to be told that Congress is just rushing headlong into doing something without giving it appropriate thought. There are people in my community, whom all of you know at this point because they've devoted their lives to honoring the memories of their loved ones who were slaughtered, struck down, taken from them at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. They do not deserve to be told that we have to really dig in and spend more time figuring out how to respond to these mass shootings before we can take action. They don't, no other family who's suffering without a, a loved one, the hole that that leaves forever. What we're doing here today is reasonable. Anyone who looks at, what, at these proposals knows that they're reasonable. And in fact, consistent with what's been done in my own state of Florida, run by a Republican legislature and a Republican governor, let's come together and pass this legislation and help to save lives. I yield back. Gentlemen, yields back for what purposes, Mr. McClintock, seek recognition. Speak on the Shabbat Amendment under the five minutes. Gentlemen is recognized. Thank you. Uh, I, I think the reason we, we don't often hear about mass shootings that were stopped by a citizen with a gun is that they didn't become mass shootings precisely because they were stopped by a citizen with a gun. I, as I said earlier, a mass shooting was stopped by a woman with a gun in Charleston, West Virginia, the very day after the massacre at Uvalde. She couldn't have done that in a so-called gun-free school zone. Is there any other possible way to stop a bad guy with a gun, but with a good guy with a gun? There is no other way. The only question is how long it takes. It has often been said the police can be there in minutes when seconds count. And what we found in Uvalde and before in Parkland, even when the police respond, they don't always act once they get there. Those who are directly threatened by a gunman are those who are in the best position to stop such an attack because they're there on the spot and their lives depend on it. And yet you won't let them. That's stunning to me. 
nor do you seem to be serious about enforcing our laws when they're violated. I mean, that's, that's what we've observed time and again from your woke district attorneys. And if you don't take our laws seriously, what makes you think criminals will? And again, I ask, why hasn't Hunter Biden been prosecuted for violating the law that forbids drug addicts from purchasing firearms, a felony? Remember, his gun, which he illegally obtained by lying on his application, yet another felony, ended up being retrieved from an open trash can 500 feet from the school. So again, I pose the question, what makes you think gun laws will keep guns out of the hands of criminals any better than drug laws keep drugs out of the hands of addicts? MS-13 isn't going to obey your laws. Madmen aren't going to obey your laws. Terrorists won't obey them either, nor will criminals. All your measures do is make it lawfully impossible for law-abiding citizens to defend themselves. So why won't you protect our children in their schools with the same seriousness as we protect our money at the bank? Nobody questions the common sense of having an armed guard at a bank, but leftists somehow cannot see the common sense of having an armed guard at a school. They seem more serious about protecting our money than protecting our children. That's, that's utterly inexplicable to me. And of course, this discussion raises the question of how many bank robberies never happen because robbers know there's an armed guard to return fire, and how many attacks on schools could be discouraged when the gunmen know they're likely to be opposed with lethal force at the front door. You know, the left lives in this fantasy world where all they have to do is pass a law against a criminal from obtaining a gun to have it obeyed. Yet as King Canute demonstrated, there are limits to the efficacy of our laws. The madmen in Uvalde didn't obey them but everyone else around that gunman did, and that made them defenseless. And so he operated with impunity in an environment where the gunman was king. And he knew that was a safe environment for him to do violence, as his own diary noted, because he knew no one would be there to return fire. When are my friends going to take the world as it is and not as they wish it to be? The, the father of modern policing, Sir Robert Peel, once observed that, that the police are simply the extension of the community. That in fact, the community is the police and the police are the community. Every citizen has a right and a duty to uphold the law and protect themselves. The police are there to help. The only difference he said was that the police officers are professional hired to attend to his duty full-time, not to replace the private citizen, but to support him. Mr. Shabbat's amendment makes it more likely an attack can be stopped before it starts and makes it less likely that a gunman will target our schools knowing they can be stopped before they start. And I say again, until you're ready to protect our children with force, you're not serious about protecting our children at all. I yield back. Gentleman yields back for our purposes of gentlelady from uh, California seek recognition. To strike the last word. Gentlelady is recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm really pretty disappointed by some of the rhetoric and arguments and positions that have been advanced uh, today. And I think it's important uh, to just refresh ourselves with some facts. Um, gun violence is now the leading cause of death for the children of America. America is basically the only country in the world that experiences mass shootings constantly on a regular basis. Countries that have regulated assault weapons and taken action uh, have, don't have solved these problems. Take a look at New Zealand and Australia. You know, we have to do something. Uh, Americans are experiencing an unacceptable level of violence because of uh, the prevalence of assault weapons by unstable people. And what is being recommended here is modest, but would do some good. You know, in my own uh, district, uh, we've, we've experienced this trauma. In 2019, at the annual Gilroy uh, Garlic Festival, uh, a young man uh, with an assault weapon, an auto semi-automatic rifle, killed uh, three people and wounded 17 others before killing himself. Now, California has strong uh, gun controls, but he went over to Nevada and purchased the, the, these weapons and then brought them back to California. That's why 
we need to have a nationwide approach. Now, even if we can't stop all gun violence through these measures, the common sense provisions in the bill before us today will do some good and it will save lives. And I just like to say uh, that the recent uh, polling indicates that 89% of Americans support universal background checks, 86% of Americans support red uh, flag laws, and a whopping 70% of Republican and Republican-leaning voters support universal background checks. Uh, we do know that um, gun violence can be countered uh, through some of these uh, provisions. You know, I was uh, out uh, listening to constituents in the last couple of days, and several of my constituents, gun owners, came up to me pleading with me to do something. They pointed out that in their view, it was unwise to allow immature individuals, 18, 19 year old kids uh, to go out and buy legally uh, assault weapons. And as one of my constituents said, you know, that kid can't go out and buy a beer. That kid can't go out and rent a car till he's 25, but we're selling these lethal weapons to him that doesn't make any sense. So uh, I hope that we can stop being the only country on earth where mass shootings are a near daily occurrence. And I think part of achieving that will be to pass uh, the bill before us and to stop talking and throwing dirt in the air and confusing the situation with uh, extraneous discussion. I think we owe the American people better than that, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. General Lady yields back for purposes, Ms. Dean seek recognition. Uh, Mr. Chairman, to strike the last word. General Lady's recognized. I just wanted to tell a story about how I started my day. Uh, it's one of the best ways to start a day. I started it with school students. Uh, Abington High School, junior high school, uh, members of the National Honor Society, eighth, ninth, tenth graders. And they had a series of questions for me. They wanted to know about how I got into this line of work, what inspired me to do it. But guess what? That all got set aside because their first three, four, five questions were about us. What are we doing to make them safer in school? What are we doing to make them safer on their playgrounds, in their grocery stores, in their synagogues, in their churches, and on and on and on. These wise beyond their years, eighth, ninth, 10th graders from Abington School District asked, what are we doing? And I tried to say the very thing we're here to do today is to respond, I, I know it's later than it ever should have been, was to respond to the scourge of gun violence in this country. When I ran for Congress in 2018, I remember going to meeting after meeting and telling folks, parents, voters, what I care about. I said, I care about the, the problem of gun violence in this country. I want to do something about it. It is not right uh, that our children are now fearful to go to school, don't feel secure in their school. And one father stood up, this was 2018, one father stood up and really hollered at me. He said, you care about gun violence? What do I do with my third grader who last night couldn't fall asleep because they had an active shooter drill and they were coached to find scissors run and throw scissors, weapons, at the would-be shooter. What are we teaching our children? So I want those Abington High School students to, to have hope that there are leaders across this dais. Join us. Say that you take this problem seriously. Say that you believe you have to save lives. Stop saying we got to study this some more as the coffins are going in the ground. We don't have to study this. We know what the problems are. Mr. Chairman, I yield the remainder of my time to the gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee. I thank the gentlelady from Pennsylvania for her kindness and uh, her indulgence. And I want to answer her question by saying that we will do something. I'm absolutely disturbed by the continuation of insanity. And I can say that because I have sat in this room 
my fellow colleagues. And this insanity has continued every time we come to this moment in history. And it continues on the bodies of dead children and dead Americans, not at war, but in their homes, their communities, their schools. It is important that we move away from this constant babble of rejection. And I beg to differ with the interpretation of my friends, because it is not an interpretation of the Constitution, which is a living document. There have been several cases on making it very clear that there are limitations to gun use. It is actually ignoring the fact that we are proud in America of one being the overseers of democracy and a constitution that is alive, that is breathing. That is the argument Mr. Jones was making, but the rejection comes from overall tone deafness and the sense that continues to have a crowd of people that want to hear insanity. And the reason why it is, because if again you read the case of one of the most conservative jurists, in the Heller case, it continues to say it finds support in the historical tradition. This is in the case. Common use at the time finds support in historical tradition of prohibiting the carrying of dangerous and unusual guns, pages 54 to 56, or that certain people that are felons or mentally ill should not have possession of firearms, or that they should not be in sensitive places like schools and government buildings. I already said to Mr. Cap Shabbat that we can do these things that they're already able to be done. But this is what I have to contend with in a state that has absolutely no relevant gun laws. And I will recite them time after time. Dallas, Luby's, Walter, Wedgwood, Fort Hood, Second Fort Hood, Dallas Police. This is Texas, Texas First Baptist, Santa Fe, El Paso, Midland, Uvalde. How many dead persons? 183 injuries, 153 dead. This is insanity. The pain of Rhonda Hurt because her daughter, Kimberly Vaughn, the mother of Ethan, is in this room. She doesn't mind me saying. Who knows her pain? A san insanity that is going over and over again. The commitment, Congressman Dean, is that we will do something and that the Constitution allows us to do something, that the case law allows us to do something. And I would think the names of these dead children and the two beautiful teachers and her husband, imperative that we do something, ensures that we must do something. We will join that babbling of insanity if we do not do something. I refuse to do that. We will do something. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Time for the, gen the gentlelady yields back. The question occurs on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. No. no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Uh, the amendment is not agreed to. Roll call. Uh, roll call is requested. The clerk will call the roll. No, never, the clerk will not call the roll. Uh, at this time, the committee will take a brief 15-minute recess.
The committee will come to order. When the committee recessed, it had dispensed with the Shabbat Amendment. For what purpose does Mr. Tiffany seek recognition? I have an amendment at the desk, Mr. Chairman. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. Res point of order is reserved. Um, the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 7910, offered by Mr. The amendment will be considered as read. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes to explain his amendment. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this amendment addresses an issue that this committee has refused to address in the past as it relates to gun violence across our nation. The bill before us has been named the Protect Our Kids Act, but it does little of that. It does, of course, create several unconstitutional restrictions on lawful gun ownership. The American people know the end game here. It is to strip law-abiding citizens of their ability to defend themselves. My amendment addresses gun violence in a meaningful way. It doesn't create new laws, but instead enforces them. It would require the Department of Justice to work closely with state and local government and their law enforcement partners to assume jurisdiction of 922 G cases, which are declined to be prosecuted by the state. And this would have a real impact because it is the a gentleman problem yield for a question. The, the gentleman, what is 920? You said 922 G cases. Could you tell us what 922 G cases are? Absolutely. Yeah, um, 922 G uh, cases are when the, um, uh, the the federal government can take over um, felony gun cases. So let's say you have someone that has committed a felony in possession of a gun and uh, states can prosecute, but the federal government can also. In some cases, the states, because of and what I was getting at here, is because of weak prosecutors or rogue prosecutors in some of the big cities across America, they're sometimes um, pleading these cases down or they're simply not charging. And this would allow the federal DOJ, Department of Justice, to take those cases and be able to file charges for somebody that's carrying a gun who has committed a felony in the past. Does that, does that answer your question, Mr. Chairman? Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so uh, that is the explanation for the amendment. I, I want to make, a, in closing here, I just want to make uh, one point tangential to what we're talking about today. It's really interesting as we've heard the various mass shootings that have gone on in America, whether it's Buffalo, Uvalde, places like that, these horrific shootings that have been going on. And, uh, but I noticed no one brings up Waukesha, the Waukesha Christmas Parade. And this is part of what this gets at, though a different um, vehicle, in this case, a truck was used, um, uh, to kill six people in the Waukesha Christmas Parade um, here in Wisconsin just uh, five, six months ago. Um, I noticed no one brings that mass killing up. And in that case, of course, it was a vehicle that was used, not a gun. We're not outlawing vehicles, I can see um, with today's markup. Um, but I noticed no one brings that up, um, which I don't understand why, because we should all we should all, uh, whenever there is an unfortunate incident like a mass killing that goes on, we should all decry that. We should all be saying that Mr. this Mr. is Tiffany, a, will you yield to a, a question on the amendment? Of, we, will I'm you yield to a question on the amendment, Mr. Tiffany, just so I can understand it? It's uh, Cicilline, oh, sorry. Yes, I'll yield. So I'm just trying to understand. The amendment says the attorney general shall coordinate with a state attorney general and appropriate state law enforcement officials in order to prosecute a violation. So is it, is the amendment require the coordination or does it compel the attorney general to actually file charges if the state doesn't? Because, you know, one of them would be useful, I guess, to, to coordinate, but if it's directing the attorney general, then it seems to me we run into some problems about compelling the executive branch to take certain actions so yeah, per the, um, per, um, if I may, per sure. the um, language that you see in there, it requires them to coordinate with local units of government. But it says in the order to prosecute term, a violation. Yep, the, the, the operative term in there, uh, Mr. Cicilline, is coordinate. 
Could you say uh, coordinate in order to consider prosecution? Of it? Is that way you give prosecutorial discretion to the – it just seems like otherwise we're compelling a prosecution, which I'm not sure you intend to do. Now, DOJ just has to coordinate with the local unit of government. My understanding, and I hope I'm allowed additional time here, Mr. Chairman, um, my understanding the term coordinate is um, um, equal – uh, where, where both the federal government and state and local governments have an equal seat at the table, so they're going to sit down and coordinate the um, decision that will be made. Does the gentleman yield back? Does the um, I, um, I would just like to, uh, if I could take a couple more seconds in sure. closing. Um, there is uh, uh, Mr. Cohen uh, challenged us um, and uh, to come forth with proposals today. Uh, Mr. Jones asked, what are you willing to do? This is exactly what we're willing to do. You're seeing these amendments come forth now, like this one, and I'm asking for everyone on this committee to support this amendment. Um, this is what you're seeing from Republicans now. We could have included my amendment here if we would have sat down and worked together earlier in the process rather than me having to bring it as an amendment now in a markup. With that, I ask for your support and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Does the gentlelady insist on her point of order? No. Excuse me, I withdraw my point of order. Point of order is withdrawn. I recognize myself. Uh, this is a very good idea, but the amendment is unnecessary and redundant because state and federal prosecutors already cooperate in cases of prohibited uh, persons in possession of firearms in many jurisdictions, including my own in New York, there are task forces, federal state task forces, to coordinate these efforts. So while Mr. Tiffany is absolutely right, it's already done, and so the amendment is really uh, redundant. So, so I, I would oppose it simply as redundant because it's already done and the amendment would do nothing, therefore. Uh, who seeks recognition? Strike the last word. Uh, gentlelady from Florida is recognized to strike the last word. Um, uh, Texas, I'm sorry. I, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I'm very um, eager to find uh, an answer to Mr. Jones. I move to strike the last word. I'm very eager to um, find an answer to Mr. Jones' question from our friends um, and I would ask the question to Mr. Tiffany um, that if this amendment was included, uh, that would then make you likely to support the Protect Kids Act. Is that accurate? Mr. Uh, Tiffany? Yeah, I'd be happy to answer your question. Um, early in uh, the summation that I just gave here a minute ago, um, uh, this would be a good change. But as I said, it creates – this bill creates several unconstitutional restrictions on so lawful your, gun ownership. All right, sir. You said and, your answer would be no. I appreciate it. I, as, I have little time. It, as a member of the Judiciary Committee, I'm not going to be in the habit reclaim, of reclaiming my time. Or voting for, <laughs> your answer voting is for no. Unconstitutional laws. Your answer is no. Um, again, um, as indicated, um, this may be um, already done. But, but let me speak to um, the uh, conditions of Texas. Uh, I don't know what laws uh, my prosecutors could, in fact, operate under. We have no universal background checks. We have no ban on assault weapons. We have no red flag laws. We have no age 21 requirement to buy a rifle. We have no waiting period to buy firearms and ammunition. We have no closing of the gun show loopholes. We have no limits on open carry. In fact, we have open carry. And no ban on concealed weapons at universities. Uh, in fact, we are completely without an infrastructure for which our prosecutors basically could operate under. Um, obviously, uh, if the mass shooter at uh, the school in Uvalde had lived, Rob Elementary School, there might be a trial. Um, in Buffalo, of course, uh, this young shooter 
was motivated by white supremacy. Um, and there certainly are no laws, because I know my good friends will call that speech and the protection of free speech. Um, I don't know whether they would view that as disinformation. But the difficulty of your, the larger picture of what you're doing is, that is why the federal government needs to act. Because there's an inconsistency of protection that does not violate the Second Amendment in our states. Uh, there are states like New York and California, uh, Illinois, that have put in strong laws. And they have seen an impact. Maybe not on the individual issues of gun violence, which we are, in fact, responding to in this legislation. We're not leaving out those circumstances, but it is well documented that states like Illinois, New York, and California, people bring guns in. We understand that uh, these circumstances allow your coordination, and I, I would much uh, find it stronger to say um, that the Attorney General uh, is directed to do such where there is a gap, or that the Attorney General can rely upon federal laws. I don't, I don't think I see this clearly here in order to prosecute a violation um, of the state, uh, and you use uh, Title 18 USC, the state declines to prosecute such conduct under substantially similar state law. Well, we don't have any much in the state of Texas. Uh, we certainly um, have felons who uh, cannot rob a bank, and I assume if they had a gun, that is an element of prosecution. But we're talking about the incidences of mass murders. Uh, and so uh, this amendment, of which I certainly am empathetic to your intent, uh, does not work or give any help to the mourning parents uh, in uh, Texas who are mourning quite frequently, including Rhonda Hart, uh, whose daughter, Kimberly Vaughn, was killed because the gun was not uh, securely stored in Santa Fe, Texas, and nor would have helped the circumstances in Uvalde. With that, Mr. Chairman, I have to oppose the underlying amendment. The gentlelady yields back. Is there any further discussion on the amendment? If not, the question occurs on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. No. No. The, no. In the opinion of the noes have it, and the amendment is not agreed to. Um, are there any further amendments? For what purpose does Mr. Massey seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I seek to offer an amendment. A, 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 um, the clerk will report the reserve amendment. Reserve a point of order. Point of order is reserved. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 7910, offered by Mr. Massey of Kentucky. The amendment will be considered as read, and the gentleman is uh, recognized for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One of the six titles of this gun control bill is called Title II, Prevent Gun Trafficking. Um, I'm not sure why it's necessary. It's trying to outlaw something that's already illegal. Uh, it says it shall be unlawful for any person uh, to knowingly purchase or acquire or attempt to purchase or acquire a firearm for possession of a third party. If you do this today, mm. if uh, you go to an FFL and you buy a firearm, you sign on the form, the 4473, that you are purchasing that firearm for yourself, not for another individual. In other words, you are attesting, you are swearing that uh, uh, you are I not a straw purchaser of this firearm. So why is Title II preventing gun trafficking necessary? It, it says that it's gonna outlaw the exact same thing that's already illegal. So when somebody offers a law or a new law that does something that an old law already does, the question is, what more does it do? Yeah. Or what more does it intend to do? And one of the things we should make sure that this new law doesn't do is create more victims, in, you know, in defense, undefendable victims of domestic violence. So the law that's proposed today here, prevent gun trafficking, has exceptions. It says 
that if the firearm is purchased or acquired by any person that wants to give it as a bona fide gift to another family member, that they're not a gun trafficker. Okay, that makes sense. Or if it's purchased by an agent of a lawful business in order for another agent of that business, let's say a rancher, I presume, buys a firearm because one of their ranch hands needs it to shoot coyotes or something. But it's, it's lacking something here that I think it needs, and that's why I'm offering this amendment. My amendment says this section, this gun trafficking section, shall not apply to any firearm if the purchaser or person acquiring the firearm transfers the firearm to a victim of domestic violence for his or her protection. Would the gentleman yield? I will yield to the gentleman from Georgia. How do you define domestic violence in this no amendment? No reason to believe. How, do you, how would you define it? Well, there's a whole lot of domestic violence. I mean, that, that's an open term. Some, somebody who has been uh, a victim of domestic violence. Well, I, can't see I mean, that, so that could be anybody. That could be anybody. It could be a bullying victim. You want to yield to me? I'll yield to Mr. Bishop. So uh, I would say in response to the inquiry by the gentleman from Georgia that uh, a, a term in the absence of a definition is construed by the court according to its normal and natural meaning in, in uh, a dictionary sense. So I, I don't think that would there be any that limits? Much. Would there be well, any I, limits? Look, I, I what think is domestic violence. If I may continue on Mr. Massey's time, sir, you yield. Sure, please. Yeah, uh, I, I would say that I don't know what limits there would be. For example, I've seen you know you might think of domestic violence as between married people, or you might think well, but we need to make sure it covers people in committed relationships who are not married. So I could see how you could you could have a more expansive definition of domestic violence. I don't know how you'd miss the essence of it though. And I would also think this being a remedial measure, the court would interpret the term liberally to reach all reasonable constructions, including people in a domestic relationship. Uh, that, that would, and so I think it's pretty clear what domestic violence is. If, I yield back to Mr. Massey. If, if the gentleman is concerned that it's an overly broad term, I will accept perfecting amendments to this to define uh, domestic violence, and I reclaim my time. I think that anything we do today here we have to think of the unintended consequences, and if this amendment would save one life, then it's worth voting for. Will, will the gentleman I, yield to a question? For I, a question? Mr. Can Massey? I, I am, uh, sure, absolutely. Don't be reluctant, you can, you can handle it. Um, so I, my question is, I think uh, the reason that this provision is included in this legislation is that there is currently not an explicit prohibition on straw purchasing. And so you're, the first claim you made is that it repeats. And actually, I think if you look at prosecutions, the, the requirement that the gun seller represent who's buying the gun, Re that that person has a background check, doesn't... Re reclaiming that person my had, time because I don't have much okay. left. People are prosecuted for straw purchases. You are lying on a form when you fill out the 4473. And maybe they should be prosecuted more, but the law is already on the books. And I don't think that anybody who's trying to protect the domestic violence victim should be convicted of gun trafficking. And I yield back. The gentleman I'm yields back. I'm gentle lady and sister. I withdraw my point of order. The point of order is withdrawn. I recognize myself in opposition to the amendment. This amendment uh, is unnecessary because if you look at uh, page six of the um, amendment nature of the substitute lines 11 to 16, it reads, D, this section shall not apply to any firearm if the purchaser or person acquiring the firearm has no reason to believe that the recipient of the firearm will use or intends to use the firearm in a crime or is prohibited from purchasing or possessing firearms under state or, or federal law. Um, in other words, the, uh, this amendment does exactly what the bill already does. It's the, same, it's the straw purchase uh, provision of the bill. And I assume, based on your amendment, that you support uh, the ghost gun provision of the bill. Would the gentleman, I, would, I would oppose would, the amendment simply because it's redundant since it's would, already done in the bill. Would the chairman yield sure. real quickly? Um, the provision that he just read also requires that the firearm is purchased or acquired by any person or person that wants to give it as a gift to a family member or that they are an agent of a lawful business and intends to give it to another agent of that lawful business. It requires either one of those in addition to what the chairman stated. It's still, a it's still a gift. It does not... No, it has to be a gift to a family member, which is defined in here, and family member 
is defined as stepchildren, uncles. A uncle, family siblings. member is 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 covered by the term any person. No, the term family member is defined on uh, the previous page. It has to be an uncle or a niece or a nephew. So if you transferred under this uh, law here today that seeks to be passed, if you transferred a firearm to a victim of domestic violence and, they, and you were not related to them, you would be in violation of a federal law punishable, I believe, by up to 10 years. And I, I seek to rectify that with this amendment. Yeah, well, the issue is, the issue, Mr. Massey, is you have to draw the line somewhere, otherwise. But, it, but it's not redundant. My amendment is not redundant, uh, with all due respect, as the chairman stated. Yeah, well, as I, as I was saying, you, you have to, the issue is you have to uh, draw the line somewhere, otherwise you're allowing open transfers. And that's what the bill does, and that's what, and the amendment wouldn't change that. No, the, the amendment does change this law so that somebody does not go to prison, to federal prison, for trying to help a domestic it violence. It doesn't actually require any proof of domestic violence. So it, it doesn't change the, the bill at all. It, it would be a defense for somebody who uh, was convicted under this. They could offer that they were assisting a victim of domestic violence. And if, if they could. They would still have to prove that. That's Correct. right. That's and, right. And that doesn't change the bill. That's, it, absolutely, because that is not a defense if the bill isn't uh, improved with my amendment. That's not a defense. The amendment doesn't change the bill at all. They would have yes. to do that with or without the amendment. <laughs> I, yield, I yield to Mr. Bishop, who can <laughs> maybe explain. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure I can do better than that, sorry, Mr. Mr. Chairman's time. I it's oh, oh. time. Um, I'll yield to Mr. Bishop. <laughs> I don't know if I can do better than that. Mr. Massey's very explicitly explained why the segment that you read does not provide protection to all domestic violence victims. He has set out a separate defense in his amendment for a domestic violence victim not to be prosecuted for receiving a, uh, a, uh, a, 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 a trafficking in, in guns. I'm reclaiming my time, we'll work with you if we can come up with a better definition of victim of domestic violence. That's, that's what it comes down to. I don't yield? think we can, but if we can, fine. Would, would the chairman yield? I'll yield. Well, I, I think the scenario is you have a lady who has been a victim of domestic violence and her neighbor, under, or she goes to the neighbor and wants some kind of protection and he helps her. He says, okay, we want to help this lady so it, she can protect her life, protect herself. And that is not covered under the legislation. Mr. Massey's amendment is really that scenario because the neighbor is not a family member. It's a neighbor who understands what's going on and wants to help her out. Mr. That's Chairman, will you yield for reclaiming my time? It's an interesting story, but we still have to come up with a definition of victim of domestic violence. Mr. As Chairman, I said, as I said, we're willing to work with you on well, that. No, that. You've changed your. You, you initially said the, the text covered it. The text doesn't cover it. So now, if we've got to come up with a definition, we'll do that. The text does cover it. No, it doesn't. But, but, Mr. Chairman, the text covers it. But if you think it doesn't cover it enough. I, I, sufficiently, we'll work with you for a better definition of victim of domestic violence. But I, I think the, the, the bill covers it. I, for, I'll yield to Mrs. Cicilline. I was just going to say, Mr. Chairman, I think if you, if the scenario that the ranking member just used, I think would ex be covered by the subsection D, which says this section shall not apply to any firearm if the purchaser or person acquiring the firearm, that is the neighbor, um, has no reason to believe that the recipient of the firearm will use or intends to use the firearm in a crime or is prohibited from purchasing or possessing firearms under state or federal law. Why wouldn't that and and, and keep reading and that's the recipient. We're talking about the and the firearm is purchased or acquired by any person or that any other person intends to purchase or as a bona fide gift between family members or is purchased or acquired by an agent. So I, why would that example not be covered by the existing language of the state? Is there not a family member? No. Or is purchased or acquired by an agent of a lawful business or that agent of a lawful business? Well, they're not a business agent. Look, you're having a hard time understanding what domestic violence is, but it's not a family no, it's not, member. I don't, it's not a, it's not a business day. agent. It's not a hard time understanding what domestic violence is. It's a hard time understanding why you think the provisions that are in the bill now do not already cover my, that scenario. And I'll yield to my uh, Mayor Gates. Well, my I believe it's my time, Mr. Chairman. No, actually, it's my time. time. <laughs> and it's well expired. Oh, it is? I'm sorry. I'll, uh, I, you I think it's our turn, right? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Who seeks who's I do. Who seeks recognition? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Who seeks recognition on the amendment? I do. Mr. Bishop, Bishop. is recognized. Thank you, sir. 
is no, I no, was my time. It just well, yeah, yeah. Um, whew. <laughs> I think I'm gonna. Are you ready to take some time yielded? Because I'm not yeah, sure I'm getting I, myself straight. I now. just wanted. Well, oh, let me let me say this, let me say this before Mr. Massey comes back to it. Let's assume this is a superfluous amendment. Let's assume that Mr. Massey's amendment to protect victims of domestic violence from being prosecuted as gun traffickers because they receive a gun to protect themselves. Let's assume that particular protection is superfluous. That means duplicates the protection in the subsection you're reading from. I don't think it is, but let's assume that. What is the problem in stating it twice so that a person who's been suffering domestic violence is protected? And, if, and, and just as a general theme here, I think what I've heard across the aisle all day long is that Republicans are intransigent and won't cooperate to, to come up with reasonable mechanisms. And third point, this is a great issue. It's core to the question of whether it's an appropriate new law to put on the books. If you had had a conversation with us about any of the stuff in this instead of just ramming it onto a markup and, and bringing us in here, we wouldn't be having the discussion from the dais trying to sort this out. With all that said, I'll yield to Mr. Massey. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. I mean, it's kind of frustrating here to debate the knowable and what is in plain language and what has been written and introduced by the other side of the aisle. Their, uh, their bill has no provision to protect domestic violence victims. It does not apply to them. And the fact that they are just now discovering it in this hearing that was rushed, we got 48 hours of notice, Maybe they didn't think through all of these bills. Maybe they didn't realize you're going to create gun traffickers out of neighbors that are trying to help domestic violence victims. And just read the bill that has been introduced. It's not superfluous, what I'm, what I'm saying here. And I think it's important. But let me close with this before I give it back to Mr. No. Bishop. No. I think it's indicative of the lack of thought and the unintended consequences that will stem from these bills that they're trying to pass today. And I... Their, their lack of knowledge of what it does and doesn't allow, and I yield to, back to Mr. Bishop. One hundred percent, and before I give a specific example that will not be covered by the exception to which the Democrats have referred, I want it to be clear that when a vote is taken on this amendment, Democrats are going to vote against protecting victims of domestic violence from possibly being prosecuted as gun traffickers because they receive a weapon to protect themselves. That's what's at issue. Now, let me give you a specific example. If people are cohabitating as roommates in a property and one is beating the tar out of the other one on a regular basis and the one being beaten gets a gun from a friend, they're prosecutable under your bill. Both the friend, the, the friend and the victim, absolutely. So Mr. Massey wants to have a very modest amendment to provide for that. You're against it. Fine. Anybody else want on our side want time? Anybody want to con contradict what I just said on the other side? Didn't think so. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. What purpose does Ms. Scanlon seek recognition? I seek to uh, move. I'm sorry. Strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. I just I'm I'm really gratified to hear that our colleagues have concerns about victims of domestic violence um, because they've been so resistant to helping us pass an evidence-based protection for victims of domestic violence, and that would be closing the boyfriend loophole, the loophole that pre, uh, precludes us from removing well, the firearms woman yield? from the home. I was going to finish my thought first. Okay. Um, uh, prevents us from removing um, weapons from the homes of someone who's been convicted of domestic violence, and that would be a place we could look for a definition of domestic violence, certainly in VAWA. Um, but our colleagues all voted against um, VAWA because of that very provision. So I would urge that if we want to do an amendment, we, we do one that deals with removing guns from the homes of stalkers, people who've been convicted of stalking or domestic violence, um, because the evidence shows that's where there is actually a risk of gun violence. And I yield the back to yield? the chair. Yes. The gentleman yield. Uh, let me, gentlelady yield. I, I just want to add that the, there is no research to support the idea that women's gun ownership increases their safety regardless of whether they're um, uh, in-person violence victims. In fact, studies show the opposite, that women living in households with a firearm are at greater risk of homicide. 
A study of female intimate partner homicide risk factors found that even for women who lived apart from their abuser, there was no evidence of protective impact from owning a gun. And a California study found that women who purchased a gun died by firearm homicide at twice the rate of women who did not. I'll yield back to the gentlelady. Do you wish to yield to me? Before? Sorry, no, I What's yielded back to the chair. <laughs> Yes, Mr. Time. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to submit. It's, it's the gentlelady's time. No, 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 I yield it back to the chair. Oh, the, I, Mr. Chairman. I, I yield back. Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman. Who seeks recognition. I, I have a unanimous consent request. Mr. Massey. I'd like to re, uh, submit to the record an article uh, from the New York Post, November 4th, 2019. Pregnant Florida mom uses AR-15 to kill home intruder. Without objection. Who seeks recognition? Mr. Chairman. For what purpose is Mr. Jordan see recognition? Uh, I'd yield to the gentleman from North Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. And, I, and recognizing that this might be uh, taken one step too far, I, I just want to make sure I understand. The gentlelady from Pennsylvania, was she, did she respond to this concern by talking about another bill? That's what I thought. Um, and so it, that's where it stands. Uh, no one has an answer to the example that I gave of a domestic violence situation that is not protected from being classified as a gun trafficker under this bill. Mr. Massey proposed a, uh, I, I can't, I mean, I guess you guys are for uh, victimizing domestic victims, domestic violence victims. But you will not respond to it uh, substantively. And the only answer coming from the other side in response to that, you can't rebut that example. The only answer of Ms. Scanlon is to talk about another bill that somebody didn't support. Fine. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's great. I don't think you could make a clearer case for the nature of the dialogue, the nature of this proceeding on this particular bill, this package of stuff, um, than, than that example. And I thank you, Mr. Massey, for a, a great, uh, great bill. I yield back to Mr. Jordan, a great amendment. Mr. Jordan, you yield okay, to me, thank please. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, I'll, we, well, I'll give you a second. The, um, the Good Samaritan in the illustration Mr. Bishop gave is gonna be a trafficker under this legislation. The person who's been abused is gonna be a trafficker under this legislation and faced enhanced penalties under this legislation because they won't accept this amendment. That, that, that's what this does, which gets to the point we've talked about now for several hours. This is all about making it tougher for law-abiding citizens to protect themselves and exercise their Second Amendment liberties. That's what this legislation does. And we all understand it. It's a darn good amendment. I can't believe it won't be accepted. I yield to the gentleman from Kentucky. So I want to talk about where I started out here. If we have a law that does something that the law already <laughs> accomplishes, why, why do we need the new law? Well, the difference between the existing law, if you're a straw purchaser under the existing law, you can be convicted. In other words, a good Samaritan who buys a firearm, gives it to domestic violence victim. Only the purchaser, the original purchaser, can be convicted under existing law. This amendment changes that situation so that the recipient of the firearm, the domestic violence victim, can also be prosecuted as a gun trafficker. So that's, that's the difference between the existing law and, the, and what will happen if this law passes. Why in the world would Democrats want to prosecute a domestic violence victim who's received a firearm for his or her self-defense? Uh, Proud moment in the, in the formulation of legislation in this committee. Proud moment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield to the gentleman from Colorado. I thank the gentleman from Ohio. Um, I, I really think this is precious. It's a precious moment, I, and I hope uh, Americans get the chance to watch the last 15 minutes of this. Uh, the first argument that the chair raised in opposition to this amendment was that it was redundant, that the bill already covered it. And then when it was obvious that the bill already didn't cover it, then the chairman said, well, we don't really know what domestic violence is. We on the Judiciary Committee don't understand domestic violence. So, um, you know, it may not be redundant, but define domestic violence for us. And then when it was obvious what domestic violence means, and it's, it's, it's covered in state law and federal law, uh, but then, they, then they, we, we hear from the gentlelady from Pennsylvania, well, 
women can't really protect themselves. They're not capable of protecting themselves with guns. I hope you tell the women of this country that the Second Amendment doesn't apply to them, that they're incapable of, of uh, because in Colorado, frankly, the concealed carry permit classes, there are more women who are taking those classes in many jurisdictions, from what I understand from the sheriffs, than men taking those classes. So women uh, should have the right to protect themselves. And I hope uh, take advantage of that right to protect themselves from uh, anyone, any, any predator who, who intends to harm them. Um, maybe the Democrats can come up with a few other red herring uh, reasons to oppose this very good amendment, an amendment that would strengthen the bill, an amendment that would make uh, America a safer place. Uh, but right now, you failed on three counts. And I think that it is time that you acknowledge that Mr. Massey has a good amendment and uh, uh, agree to his amendment. And I yield back to the gentleman from Ohio. The gentleman yields back. Uh, for what purpose does the gentlelady from Texas seek recognition? The gentlelady from Texas. I move to strike the last um, word. The gentlelady is recognized. I think the one thing um, that the American people should know is that Democrats can absolutely not be classified as not fighting to protect women in particular from the scourge of domestic violence. That, that is just something that I will absolutely not accept. Uh, we've been painted with many colors today that I will certainly not accept in fact, I will reject very loudly and openly because I remember the pain of trying over and over and over again to get the Violence Against Women Act passed, authored by myself and many other co-sponsors of a comprehensive omnibus bill dealing with every aspect of domestic violence, including, of course, the boyfriend loophole, which still became an obstacle in the Senate and never got passed but it left the House with that provision in it to protect the victims of domestic violence. I've had officers in my jurisdiction to admit that the domestic violence call is the most dangerous, and some have lost their lives. For everyone that offers an explanation and Democrats are not both emotionally tied to and cognizant of the limit or the levels of violence in domestic violence, of which we can expand this definition. It is soundly rejected by our history and by the legislation that we've offered over and over again. And so I would say to Mr. Massey, some modification of his legislation may be well placed. But I do think the underlying support for allowing the transfer in a domestic violence circumstance is in Section D on page 6. And if it was read simply, it says the section should not apply for to any firearm if the purchaser or person acquiring the firearm has no reason to believe that the recipient of the firearm will use or intends to use the firearm in a crime or is prohibited from purchasing or possessing firearms under state law. Did the gentlelady yield? There's an uh, and at the end of that. Not, not at this point. Not at this point. There are 10 dead people in Buffalo choose to show their faces, their names I will put in the record before the end of this markup. And there are, some of them are women. And with that in mind, I think that we are trying to use falsities to label those of us who've been working on this issue very long. We've extended the olive branch, Mr. Massey, for some modification 
of your language. And that is a decent offer. The bill can move toward the floor and a more defined amendment might be appropriate. But apparently, with all well intention, my good friends grab on to one issue, Second Amendment. They go on and on and on and on about the Second Amendment, complete false argument, because there are no limitations on the restrictions that could be implemented under the Second Amendment. Several cases uphold that. For every case you have, the Supreme Court has upheld that. And the same thing, but using an argument about our opposition or lack of sensitivity to the victims of domestic violence, I could refute again the argument about a good guy or a good lady with a gun doesn't always rule the day, particularly against weapons of mass destruction or in a volatile situation like domestic violence. This is about trafficking, straw purchases. We want this section to stand for what it is supposed to stand for, and that is the outright outrage of people passing off guns and creating havoc and killing people in urban rural communities. So um, I think there is merit to your intent, Mr. Massey, but I will not accept the high road uh, in contrast to what we have done and what this committee has tried to do, my subcommittee in particular, with its members on protecting persons against domestic violence. And I ask you to reconsider your amendment. I yield back. General Lady yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? To strike the last word on this amendment. is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Massey is right. He's proposing an amendment that will help with domestic violence. It will help protect women who are victims or have been victims of domestic violence. Because if they accept a gun from a friend after beatings, threats, the kind of thing that I dealt with as a prosecutor, I've seen, and, and by the way, to have more than one Democrat tell us, you know, we're not, we don't care about domestic violence or that, oh, they're pleased that all of a sudden we've shown interest. I've got decades of dealing with it. And uh, having had women, even the, all these years after leaving the bench, thank me that I don't even remember because I handled so many felony cases for giving them their lives back because I saw through the garbage of their husband or their male partner who was so abusive. You've got no high road, no right to condescend. You don't know what our lives are. You don't know how we have fought domestic violence. Uh, I carry some of the scars from dealing with that issue, trying to help people all the, over the decades that I dealt with it. But uh, so he's got a good amendment. We don't need the condescension. It's not superfluous, this amendment. It's, it's quite good, actually. And uh, to, to condescend and say why we voted against DAWA, there was a lot of garbage in there. There was some good things. But you don't, again, Democrats weren't interested in coming together but rather just trying to get a political win or notch on the belt. But uh, let me mention some of the things that continue to be brought up regarding uh, ending assault weapons in multiple uh, magazines. The Justice Department itself has said that um, uh, the impacts on gun markets and gun violence, uh, well, he was talking about the assault weapons ban, but included uh, multiple containments uh, in magazines. Uh, the Justice Department said should it be renewed. The ban's effects on gun violence are likely to be a small at best, perhaps too small for reliable measurement. Assault weapons were rarely used in gun crimes even before the ban. Um, 
and over the course of the 10 year assault weapons ban mass shootings still occurred, including Columbine. And according to data from the FBI 2015 to 2019, you're twice as likely to be killed by hands or feet than you are to be killed by a rifle. And that seems to be what has scared so many people. The Virginia Tech shooter did not use a semi-automatic rifle nor an automatic rifle. Um, I use those in the army, but uh, you know, what people are calling assault weapons, two, two, three round, it's just barely bigger than a 20, 22. Um, and and uh, which by the way, experts testify, organized crime like to use 22 because the rounds are so difficult to ever trace to a gun. But an assault weapons ban is just a talking point, does not deal with the root cause of violence. And that's, it appears so much is political today. You don't want our amendments. You're not, it, it seems like you came in with the attitude, even a good amendment like this, you're determined to stop it. Now, as a judge handling thousands of felony cases, I don't remember any um, significant felonies where the perpetrator went in, bought a gun, uh, got the background check or, or bought a gun without one, but they always had to get one. There is no uh, loophole for the um, uh, gun shows. I mean, if a federal firearm licensee is, is selling a gun, there has to be, no matter where it is, there's no online loophole. That's, that's false as well. But so many of these, most of these mass shootings, they got approved by the, the background check and they bought the gun. So uh, there is so much that's just talking points, but it's not gonna solve the problem. And we wanna solve the problem, I go back. General Neal's back. For what purpose is Mr. Johnson of Georgia seek recognition? I'll move to strike the last word. Gentleman's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a, a, a solemn hearing. Uh, it is uh, a place where personal experiences have been shared in terms of the loss of, of loved ones. We're grieving as a nation for the loss of 29 of our fellow citizens due to gun violence out of control here in America, mass murders another one yesterday, and this is a solemn moment, but yet my friends on the other side of the aisle are, are playing games, trying to uh, muck up the works of a very straightforward piece of legislation with the intent and the name of protecting our kids. We're trying to protect our kids. We're looking to raise the age uh, to 21, for someone to be able to purchase a long gun. And we're trying to prevent gun trafficking. That's what we're talking about right now with this amendment. And Mr. Chairman, it's my humble opinion that if you give my colleagues on the other side of the aisle an inch, then the NRA takes a mile. This amendment appears or would appear to uh, be quite reasonable, but what it really does is like a Trojan horse. It opens up the legislation. It puts a big hole that you can drive three Mack trucks through at the same time. Uh, you know, talking about uh, victims of domestic violence. What is a victim of domestic violence? What is a victim, by the way? Is that somebody who has just been threatened or who thinks that they've been threatened? Uh, is it somebody who received a phone call? Uh, yeah, I mean, what is a threat? What is a uh, victim of domestic violence? I mean, you can drive, I mean, you, unless that term is defined uh, with sufficient specificity, it will uh, hurt this uh, uh, legislation. And I would submit that just so, uh, just agreeing to this amendment would drive a hole into this legislation. I think we should do what we set out to do, which is to prevent as much gun trafficking as we possibly can, 
And we also don't want to open the door for untraceable weapons, ghost guns, uh, to be allowed to be transferred to so-called victims of so-called domestic violence, whatever domestic violence is. Domestic violence can be between a man and a woman. It can be between a schoolyard bully and, uh, and somebody in school. What's to keep uh, someone under this uh, amendment from transferring a weapon to someone who is less than 18 years old? So we don't want to get into that at all. We also want to do our work on safe you. storage uh, so that people like Ethan Young, 15 years old, his mother is here today, has been sitting dutifully through this hearing to see us do the work that she knows we need to do and so many other Americans know that we need to do. Let's stop playing games. Let's stop smiling and laughing, thinking that we got somebody on an amendment. And let's go ahead and just pass this legislation. This is good legislation. It, it is composed of components that have been out there for, for uh, this is nothing new in these legislative proposals. All of this legislation has been out there. It's been put together in this package to, pro to protect our kids. And let's protect our kids today. Stop playing games and let's, uh, let's, move, the gentleman yield? let's, let's move to uh, pass this legislation. And with that, I'll yield uh, to the gentleman from Rhode Island. Thank you. I thank the gentleman for yielding. I, I just think there's a fundamental disagreement between our friends on the side of the, side of the aisle and the proponents of this legislation, and that is this sort of suggestion that if you just inject more guns, you'll enhance safety of individuals. You want more guns in schools, you want more good guys to have guns, even though we have more guns in America than any place in the world, more guns than people, that hasn't brought us safety. And even though there's lots of empirical evidence that shows the presence of a gun in the situation of domestic violence makes it much more likely, almost 10 times more likely, that the victim will die of gun violence. So injecting guns is not a solution to that either. And so I, I think there's just a fundamental disagreement that the way we can enhance safety is by making sure more people have guns. And that's why I think this amendment, because of what Mr. Johnson explained, it would essentially gut this part of the bill and put it, allow someone uh, to claim that they're a victim or have given it to a victim of domestic violence without any of those terms being defined. It's just, it's, it's again, un, it is premised on this notion that I think our Republican friends believe the more guns. Gentlemen, this time has expired. For what purpose does Mr. Buck seek recognition? Move to strike the last word. Gentlemen, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I agree with my friend from uh, Rhode Island, uh, Mr. Cicilline. There is a disagreement um, on this committee, and the disagreement comes down to whether an individual should have the right to protect themselves. We're not talking about uh, forcing someone to take a gun, a domestic violence victim to take a gun to protect themselves. We're talking about whether someone should have the right to defend themselves and not be violating a law in the process of having that right to defend themselves. Now, uh, given the situation, um, my, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle may very well say, I don't want that gun. I don't want to defend myself uh, with a gun. I'm willing to uh, suffer whatever consequences there are from uh, the predator in, in the domestic violence situation, and, and I don't want the gun. That's fine. You have that right. You have the right to go hide in the closet and do whatever you want to do. Mr. Massey's amendment is something different for a man or a woman uh, who is a victim of domestic violence to be able to stand up and protect themselves is, is a fundamental right that we have uh, in this country. And for the, uh, my, my Democratic colleagues to suggest that they wanna take that right away, um, I think is really dangerous. I also, uh, it, it is just amusing to me that people on the Judiciary Committee in the United States House of Representatives are asking the question, what is a domestic violence uh, victim. We know what a domestic violence victim is. It's, it's an individual who is involved in a uh, intimate relationship that has, that it becomes a victim. It is a victim of a assault or threat. Now, to suggest that some schoolyard bully is uh, a, a domestic violence victim, we, we all know that's not true. You're, 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 you're raising issues out there that, that aren't accurate. Um, if you really cared about domestic violence victims, you would talk to Mr. Massey right now and say, let's define domestic violence victims if, if, if there is some doubt about what the definition is, and, and let's move forward with this amendment. 
And with that, I yield to my friend from Kentucky, Mr. Bass. I, th I thank the gentleman from Colorado. Everybody on the other side of the aisle is looking for the gotcha in this amendment. There is no gotcha. I found a fundamental flaw with your bill. I'm trying to fix it. I didn't even think there'd be a debate on this. I thought you'd recognize it immediately. And I would love to take my, my colleague, Ms. Sheila Jackson-Lee's offer up to work on this later behind closed doors. But the problem is, how do you negotiate later in good faith with people who don't even recognize the, the bill is flawed right now? There, nobody on the other side of the aisle has yet conceded that there is an and at the end of the sentence that they keep reading that in order to transfer a firearm and not be convicted as a gun trafficker, it has to be a family member or a, a lawful business agent. There is no domestic violence exception in their bill. I'm trying to add it. It's, I'm confounded and confused as to why they would not accept it. Because there should not be such wonder, an exception. I wonder if Mr. Buck would yield to would, me to supplement your point if you're done. Um, not quite. Um, not quite, but you know, we've, we've, we've gone through several levels here. First, they said that they didn't know what domestic violence was. I'm glad our Democratic colleague from Pennsylvania cleared that up for them, and they remembered they've introduced multiple bills to deal with domestic violence. So now they know what it is, but they still have a hard time reading this. And then we just were affronted by the claim that women can't defend themselves and that they shouldn't be given that right. And the fundamental problem with their bill is it changes the existing law such that not just the Good Samaritan can be prosecuted, but now the victim of domestic violence can be prosecuted for receiving a firearm. And that is wrong. I, and I yield back to Mr. Buck. And I yield to Mr. Bishop from North Carolina. I thank the gentleman. And I don't know, Mr. Massey, I, it took me, frankly, sitting here very candidly. Until Mr. Cicilline spoke, I wasn't getting it. Yep. I thought that what yep. we were arguing over is whether your amendment was superfluous, whether it or duplicated pieces that are already in the bill. As it turns out, Mr. Cicilline's made clear, that is not the problem from the perspective of the Democrats. They don't want anybody yep. to be able to defend themselves with a gun, even a person who's a victim of domestic violence. I yield back to Mr. Buck and hopes Mr. Jordan gets a chance. Mr. With gentlemen, you yeah, I yield to Mr. I'm sorry, I yield to Mr. Gomer. Does Mr. Jordan want time? Yeah, I'm please. Sorry. I'll take time. Yeah, I yield to Mr. Jordan. Mr. Bishop made the fundamental point. This is about taking guns away from people, not letting them have a firearm to protect themselves. Where the Democrats are going to take us, let's just be clear, they're going to take us to a world where only the bad guys can get the guns. That's where they're going to take us. That is intentionally, exactly. That is the world they are taking us to, and that's why we are opposed to this legislation. I thank the gentleman for yielding. The gentleman yields. And I yield back. Mr. Mr. Chairman, back. what purpose does, who's seeking recognition from, what purpose does the gentleman from Rhode, from Rhode Island seek recognition? Move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I'm just reading the legislation which is before us, and with respect to the issue of gun trafficking, if you begin on page 5, 932A, it shall be unlawful for any person in or otherwise affecting interstate or foreign commerce to knowingly purchase or acquire or attempt to purchase or acquire a firearm for the possession of a third party. So in the example of your neighbor giving a gun to uh, an individual who is a, a victim of domestic violence, there is no third party. And so this, this would not be prohibited under the statute. This requires the receipt of a firearm for the possession of a third party in you? its initial definition. So I think this is an interesting discussion, but I think it doesn't apply because it wouldn't be criminalized. The gentleman yield? With that, sure. The victim is the third party in the, in the hypothetical. No, no, in the proposed. hypothetical, you said a neighbor is giving a gun to someone who's a, a, a victim of domestic violence. That's There's two the people, the neighbor and the domestic violence. Oh, no, no. This, no, reclaiming my time. The statute <laughs> says a person who purchases or acquires a gun for a third party from... One party is what? the purchaser. The other party is the seller. The third party is the victim to whom you're giving the, the gun. the example you're talking about is when a neighbor gives a gun to someone who's a victim of domestic violence. There's two people. There's no third party. The statute doesn't apply. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purposes, Mr. Tiffany, seek recognition? I'll just strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. I yield my time to Mr. Golmert. And I appreciate that. I, I've been flabbergasted after years of hearing Democrats talk.
talk about domestic violence to now hear Democrats say they don't know what it is, they don't know what what a definition is. That's that's amazing, amazing. Uh, I think all the people on our side uh, understand what domestic violence is, uh, so we can talk about that later. But when it comes to, uh, I, I'm also amazed. The scenario that Mr. Cicilline talked about, there is a third party. If you're not acquiring a gun for a third party, it, it, you're, <laughs> you're not guilty of the crime. Of course, there's a third party. So uh, that's um, a good prosecutor would not be able to take that position. They would be able to go after the third party who is the victim of what those on the Republican side know is domestic violence. So, and, and like I said, bullies on a playground, that's not domestic violence. Uh, we, we understand that. So, and if you've ever prosecuted, perhaps if uh, you've defend, defended um, uh, people guilty of domestic violence, you'd be familiar with it too. But, uh, but having prosecuted, I can assure you, I know what it is and I'm surprised more Democrats don't. But this amendment will be helpful to the bill and will help to avoid doing terrible injustice, which is one of the reasons it's good not to rush into a bill uh, with an emotional basis for the bill. It's why a cooling off period is important. So you make sure you consider the very things like Mr. Masty has has found to, to fix one of the injustices in the bill. So if you care about injustice, you would say, you know what, he's got a good point. Uh, if you still don't know what domestic violence is, I'll be glad to work with Thomas to, to get a definition that will help you understand. It won't be that difficult in view of all the domestic violence uh, legislation that there's been. But in the meantime, please, just say this is going to create a hole you could drive a truck through. How about a tiny hole that it creates just enough to protect a victim uh, and not have more injustice inflicted upon a victim because our committee was hell bent on passing legislation without any input whatsoever from people on our side that have dealt extensively with this issue for decades. So I appreciate the amendment. I appreciate Mr. Tiffany yielding. I yield back to Mr. Tiffany. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, sorry, my camera is not on right now. Uh, somehow I lost it here. Um, but I would just add um, on to the point that Representative Gohmert just made, and it's germane to the amendment that I just uh, uh, produced prior to Representative Massey's, is that um, it's clear this bill has been rushed. And rather than coming in and working with Republicans um, to get additional items that we should be considering and working it out ahead of time, this is why we're here now with these amendments. Um, I think it was um, uh, Mr. Jones who said, you know, what do you guys got? Well, this is what we have. And you're hearing that there are really legitimate concerns. We have a rush process that is uh, not functioning properly. Uh, we should really take the time to do this in the right way. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The question occurs on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, Aye. no, no. Aye. In the opinion of Mr. the chairman, chair, the no's have it. Mr. Chairman, I request a recorded vote. Recorded vote is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Nadler. No. Mr. Nadler votes no. Ms. Lofgren. No. Ms. Lofgren votes no. Ms. Jackson Lee. No. Ms. Jackson Lee votes no. Mr. Cohen? No. Mr. Cohen votes no. Mr. Johnson of Georgia? No. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes no. Mr. Deutsch? No. 
Mr. Deutsch votes no. Ms. Bass? Bass votes aye. Bass votes aye. Ms. Bass votes aye. Mr. Bass Jeffries? votes no. I'm sorry. Bass votes no. Ms. Bass votes no. Mr. Jeffries? Jeffries votes no. Mr. Jeffries votes no. Mr. Cicilline? Mr. Cicilline votes no. Mr. Swalwell? No. Mr. Swalwell votes no. Mr. Liu? No. Mr. Liu votes no. Mr. Raskin? Raskin votes no. Mr. Raskin votes no. Ms. Jayapal? Jayapal votes no. Ms. Jayapal votes no. Ms. Dimmings? No. Ms. Dimmings votes no. Mr. Correa? No. Mr. Correa votes no. Ms. Scanlon? No. Ms. Scanlon votes no. Ms. Garcia? No. Ms. Garcia votes no. Mr. Nagoose? No. Mr. Nagoose votes no. Ms. McBath? No. <coughs> Ms. McBath votes no. Mr. Stanton? Ms. Dean? No. Ms. Dean votes no. Ms. Escobar? No. Ms. Escobar votes no. Mr. Jones? No. Mr. Jones votes no. Ms. Ross? Ms. Ross? Ms. Ross? No. Ms. Ross votes no. Ms. Bush? Bush votes no. Ms. Bush votes no. Mr. Jordan? Mr. Jordan votes yes. Mr. Shabbat? Aye. Mr. Shabbat votes aye. Mr. Gomert? Aye. Mr. Gomert votes aye. Mr. Issa? Aye. Mr. Issa votes aye. Mr. Buck? Aye. Mr. Buck votes aye. Mr. Gates? Aye. Mr. Gates votes aye. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana? Aye. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes aye. Mr. Biggs? Aye. Mr. Biggs votes aye. Mr. McClintock? Aye. Mr. McClintock votes aye. Mr. Stubbe? Yes. Mr. Stubbe votes yes. Mr. Tiffany? Tiffany, aye. Mr. Tiffany votes aye. Mr. Massey? Aye. Mr. Massey votes aye. Mr. Roy? Aye. Mr. Roy votes aye. Mr. Bishop? Aye. Mr. Bishop votes aye. Ms. Ms. Fishbach? Aye. Ms. Fishbach votes aye. Ms. Sparts? Sparts? Ms. Sparts? Sparts votes yes. Ms. Sparts votes yes. Mr. Fitzgerald? Aye. Mr. Fitzgerald votes aye. Mr. Benz? Benz votes aye. Mr. Benz votes aye. Mr. Owens? Owens votes aye. Mr. Owens votes aye. Clerical report. Oh, no, this, is, this is Stanton. How am I recorded? Mr. Stanton, you are not recorded. I vote aye. Mr. Stanton votes aye. Does, he, does Mrs. Stanton really want to vote aye? Okay. Quick report. Mr. Chairman, there are 20 ayes and 24 noes. The, the noes have it and the amendment is not agreed to. Are there any further amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? Mr. Chairman. Uh, for what purpose is Mr. Shabbat's Mr. recognition? Mr. Chairman. Reserve a point of order, Mr. Mr. Chairman. A point of order is reserved. Oh, wait a minute. For what purpose is Mr. Shabbat seek recognition? Uh, I have an amendment at the desk. Okay, point of order is reserved. The clerk will report the amendment. 
Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 7910. Mr. Chairman, I ask the chairman, the, the, the amendment will be considered as read. The, the uh, gentleman is, uh, will have five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I mentioned in my opening statement uh, earlier today, I'd like to think that there are ways that we could work together in a bipartisan manner to produce a, uh, a better legislative product than the one uh, that we're currently considering today. Uh, the amendment that I offer now, like the one that I had offered uh, earlier in this markup, is one of the ways that we could work together. My amendment is fairly straightforward. It would amend the Public Safety Officers Benefits yeah. Program to make eligible for benefits retired police officers who are killed in public or private security roles. To be eligible, the retired officer must have left police service in good standing and he or she must be injured or killed while actively protecting a community, a business, a school, a neighborhood, or some other similar entity in a paid security role. I offered a nearly identical amendment three weeks ago when we were considering changes to the Public Safety Officers Benefits Program for traumatic stress-related issues. At the time, Mr. Chairman, you may recall that you pledged to work together uh, on the issue going forward, and I agreed to withdraw the amendment at that time. Well, two things have changed since then. First, uh, the other legislation moved forward within days and passed the House uh, be before we had any chance at all to work to include my proposal. Um, I don't necessarily hold you responsible for that because I know sometimes these things are made at a higher pay grade, um, but uh, I was a bit miffed about uh, Ultimately, it, it didn't happen. Um, but more importantly, we witnessed another high-profile selfless act by a retired police officer trying to protect his community. Just days after the committee considered changes to the bill that I just mentioned, or the, that program, retired Buffalo police officer Aaron Salter Jr. confronted the shooter in that uh, supermarket where he worked as a security guard. Tragically, Mr. Salter a 55-year-old African-American former officer died as a result of that confrontation. But his selfless sacrifice helped to protect mm -hmm. his friends and neighbors and many others. He had shown that same dedication to his community as a Buffalo police officer for nearly 30 years before retiring in 2018. While the Buffalo Police Commissioner honored Mr. Salter by posthumously promoting him to lieutenant and awarded him the Medal of Honor, his family will not receive benefits under the Public Safety Officer Benefits Program. Just as we saw with another retired African-American officer in St. Louis, Captain David Dorn, Lieutenant Salter's family will not receive benefits under the program because he died after retirement and serving his community in a private capacity. Mr. Chairman, being a police officer is a very difficult and dangerous job. I think we can all agree on that but it's also essential to the maintenance of a civil society, a fact that has long been recognized by Congress. In fact, in 1968, Congress authorized the creation of the Public Safety Officers Benefits Program, which provides death and education benefits to police officers and their families when an officer Mr. Chairman, we have no audio. Yes, we know. We know that he's frozen. We're waiting to see if he comes back. Mr. Shabbat, you've lost your audio. Or can contribute to uh, society. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. I, well, okay. Oftentimes, uh, retired officers like Lieutenant Salter and Captain Dorn continue to serve their communities in a similar capacity as they had as a police officer. They work as school resource officers, provide security to hospitals, office building, places of employment, small businesses, neighborhoods, apartments, a whole range of places that they provide security. By all accounts, Mr. Salter and Dorn are the types of people we want serving as police officers. And yet, even though they both died serving the communities they loved, neither officer's families currently uh, is entitled to benefits under the Public Safety Officers Benefits Program because they retired uh, from the police force. 
Mr. Chairman, we have thousands and thousands of examples of police officers who are near retirement or have recently retired. And those officers have been trained with taxpayer dollars and many want to continue to serve the communities that they love. Making the common sense change that my amendment proposes will encourage more dedicated, properly trained police officers to do just that, which will ultimately make our community safer. And that's what my colleagues say they want to do is to make our community safer. Well, this amendment would actually do that. So I urge my colleagues to support this common sense amendment and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Does the gentle lady insist on a point of order? Mr. Chairman, I do not insist on my, I do insist on my point of order. It's not germane. Uh, I agree that uh, although I, I certainly appreciate where the gentleman is coming from, this, uh, this amendment is, uh, uh, is way beyond the scope of this bill. It has, this bill has nothing to do with um, uh, uh, public safety officers or their, or, or their rewards, and I am constrained to rule it out of order. Is there any well, I obviously disagree vehemently, but if that's the way the chairman is going to rule, that's the way it's going to rule, and I know we would lose in a vote. I won't waste the committee's time on that, so I yield back. back. I appreciate that. Uh, chairman, can I strike the last word very briefly? What? What purpose is the gentle lady? Strike the last, last word. I, I, I do think it's important for Mr. Chabot to know that this committee did pass a public safety officer's benefit during police week, uh, and for him to know and for our colleagues to know uh, that there was an offer, and the offer continues on separate legislation, uh, Mr. Chabot, that you are now speaking about uh, to be able to assist in the very issues that you're raising. So um, we understand and are appreciably uh, sympathetic on this important issue, uh, and I know that the committee, uh, with the chairman, uh, will look, as they have said already, uh, to work with you on some legislation. With that, I yield back. General Lady yields back. Are there any further amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? Mr. Massey. For what purpose does Mr. Massey seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment to offer. I the clerk will report the order. amendment. The point of order is reserved. Um, clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. And the gentleman is recognized for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Title I of this gun control bill would raise the age to purchase a firearm from a, an FFL from 18 to 21 if it's a, basically a modern rifle or a modern shotgun. Uh, the problem with this is the Constitution covers individuals beginning at the age of 18, not at the age of 21, and so does the Second Amendment quite clearly. But the, the insult to injury comes when we tell these 18, 19, and 20-year-olds that they can die for their country, that they can sign up, they can use a firearm, they can be shot at, and they can give their lives for their country to protect the freedoms and to protect the Constitution, yet they themselves will not be able to enjoy the rights protected under that Constitution. So what my amendment seeks to do uh, right now, the Title I of the bill, does the chairman have a, okay. Title I of the bill uh, would raise the age, but it has an exception right now that the Democrats have put in here for a member of the armed forces on active duty. My amendment adds to the uh, people that are accepted from this age restriction, any individual who has registered for selective service. In other words, if your country endeavors to conscript you into the service of that country, possibly to die for that country, to defend that country's constitution, then you deserve the rights that are protected by that constitution. And with that, I yield back. Mr. Chairman, the gentleman can I? yields back. Does the gentlelady insist on her point of order? The uh, gentlelady does not insist on her point of order. I recognize myself in opposition to the amendment. This amendment uh, guts uh, this provision of the bill because it says that uh, an individual is registered for selective service. Since every individual 18 years of age uh, uh, or over is required to register for us, every, uh, excuse me, every male individual is required to um, register for selective service. This would permit any male in individual at 18 years of age uh, to purchase a firearm. 
The purpose of this section of the bill is precisely to prevent people 18 years of age through 20 until 21 to purchase firearms because there, ma there is a massive body of research that shows that 18 through 20 year olds um, having not completed the maturation of uh, parts of their brains um, are, are, are far more likely to engage in violence uh, than people older than that. So on that, on, that, on that grounds, I oppose the amendment. Mr. Chairman. Well, and I yield back. Who else seeks recognition? Mr. Chairman. Uh, for what purpose does uh, the gentleman from Ohio seek recognition? Strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. You, you just said that, that they're, they're not mature enough to make this kind of decision. But these, I, if I'm not mistaken, the Democrats are wanting younger people to actually vote. They want 16-year-olds to decide who gets to make the laws in this country. But oh, no, no, 18-year-olds can't, can't purchase a firearm. And now we're saying that if you sign up for selective service and, as Mr. Massey indicated, will go defend your country, you're not qualified for the rights in that very Constitution. You've, you're, you're going to take an oath if you join our military to, to, to defend. So um, this is, I mean, this is just a, a good, another good amendment from the gentleman from Kentucky, and I would yield to him to uh, talk. yield for a moment? Sure. Would, is the gentleman aware that... Uh, until you're 21, you can't even go into a bar and, buy a sh and, and get a shot of bourbon? I'm certainly aware of that. Okay. In Kentucky, we would make an exception for yeah. that as well. <laughs> and and I, 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 when I went to college, probably when you went to college, Mr. Chairman, that, those weren't the rules, but they, they, uh, they've since changed. I so, understand that. I yield so, to the gentleman from Kentucky. The, the chairman says that uh, individuals 18 to 20-year-old uh, maturation of part, use his words, maturation of parts of their brains hasn't occurred. Then why do we allow them to make the decision to go fight for their country, to join the military? Uh, furthermore, we're conscripting, are we conscripting people who don't even have mature brains into the service of this country? That's why, I'm sorry, somebody needs to mute. Someone needs to mute the microphone. I t so that's why I tied this to selective service. And it's also not the case that everybody who is 18 is registered with selective service. Law-abiding individuals who are 18 have registered with the selective service. And it's probably the case, even though I don't know this for sure, it's probably the case that somebody without a father, somebody with mental uh, issues, somebody that hasn't been in school for the last two years, who uh, has committed one of these heinous acts, is probably not registered with the selective service. And I yield back to the uh, gentleman from Ohio. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Pennsylvania seek recognition? I move to strike the last word. Gentlelady is recognized. Yeah, I would have to oppose this amendment because, as the chairman noted, it does essentially gut um, the purpose of raising the age, but only with respect to young men, because only young men are required to register for selective service. All, almost all U.S. male citizens who are 18 through 25 are required to register. So it seems a very bizarre carve out to allow young men who, by definition, have not yet been trained um, for the armed forces and only young men to be allowed to purchase weapons. Now, there's already in this bill an exception for people who have undergone that training and are members of the armed forces. So on those grounds, I would oppose this amendment and I would yield back. General Lady yields back. Who else seeks recognition on the amendment? For what purpose does Mr. Yeah. Roy seek recognition? I want to speak on the amendment. Gentleman is recognized. I mean, the gentleman from Kentucky is uh, making an important point uh, about what we ask. Recognition. I want to speak on the amendment. Gentleman is recognized. I mean, the gentleman from Kentucky is uh, making an important point uh, about what we ask of, in the case of currently uh, men with respect to uh, registering for selective service. And then here we're saying, it, it, for all practical purposes, and the chairman said it, uh, you're mature enough to be drafted. Uh, you're mature enough to be forced into service um, in defense of the country. We can debate selective service separately. Uh, but you're not mature enough uh, to have a weapon and to be able to defend yourself. And I think it, it begs a question about what do we believe adulthood is, adulthood is in this country? And Chairman mentioned 21 for drinking. Well, drinking is a privilege, certainly not a right, but it's a, a, a uh, privilege. And so we make determinations about 
uh, age, an appropriate uh, level of, of maturity. Uh, but here, you know, we say in this country that you've reached the age of maturity for virtually everything at age 18, notwithstanding some of the, the stuff. Gentleman going on yield the, for a quick question? And so the gentleman yield for a quick uh, question. Who was that? I'm sorry. Uh, why is drinking a privilege, not a right? Well, I mean, I know what we set the age in the Constitution, but it's not a natural right uh, to drink whiskey. Um, I know the gentleman from Kentucky might have a coronary when I say that, both from his libertarian sensibilities and being from Kentucky. But, it, you know, it, it's not a uh, natural right from God, per se. Uh, what was that? I object. <laughs> I know. I know you do. I know you would. And I know you would. Uh, my point is just simply what we're talking about here in terms of uh, our rights to defend ourselves and what we're talking about as a country about how we determine what the age of maturity is, this is a very important debate and a very important amendment that the gentleman from Kentucky offers for its, for its raising of the principle and the question. Um, we, are, we are blurring the lines of distinction for what we are saying is or is not reaching the age of maturity in this country. Are you or are you not an adult for uh, you know, all practical legal purposes uh, when you're an American citizen and you're going to be asked to be drafted and go to war, you're going to be uh, a able to be tried as an adult, you're able to be uh, held accountable as an adult, you're able to vote and all of these uh, uh, things that get associated with being an adult. And here we're saying, no, you're not. You're not mature enough for that. That's, of course, at the heart of the constitutional questions, which the gentleman from North Carolina has ably uh, raised with respect to both the Ninth Circuit opinion, but but put put aside the Ninth Circuit opinion, right? What is our opinion of the constitutionality of it, right? I, I put aside the Supreme Court's precedent, put aside the Ninth Circuit. What is our opinion as members of the United States Congress and the House Judiciary Committee about how you start parsing out rights uh, based on uh, the sensibilities of your vote, as opposed to some amount of consistency and recognition that if you're an adult, uh, that we treat you as such. Um, and I would just add that this entire discussion, and going back to Mr. Massey's First Amendment, which obviously already failed, I didn't jump in on it earlier, but uh, you know, I still find it uh, really astounding that our colleagues on the other side of the aisle can't recognize the very significant flaw in there and seem to still ignore that and language, that and provision, uh, and the extent to which we're setting as a baseline standard that you can't buy uh, a firearm as, as uh, a gift or uh, for another person, even if you know that person not to be a prohibited individual or know that person not to be, uh, or you don't have any reason to believe they'd be dangerous, uh, you can't. We're setting a sort of baseline standard for that, which is not, that, that's a pretty significant advancement off of current law and the way we treat straw purchases with respect to, uh, you know, prohibiting them for, uh, you know, for prohibited persons. Um, but in any event, I think this is uh, an important amendment. I would support the amendment from the gentleman from Kentucky. I yield to the gentleman uh, from Kentucky if he has any, if he wants to use the rest of my time. Yes, uh, thank you, the gentleman from Texas. What is the morality of conscripting people whose brains aren't fully formed, as the as the chairman suggested? Would it be moral to conscript a 12-year-old, a 14-year-old? I think we all agree not, but we do agree that when you're 18, 19, and 20, you are an adult and you are covered by the Constitution. And if you can be conscripted, and if you do have the ability to make an informed decision as to whether to join the military and evaluate the risks of doing so, then you should enjoy all of the rights. Gentlemen, you? Uh, it's not my time to yield, but you, you should enjoy all of the rights that you are uh, defending by virtue of your service. And my, my colleague said it's a bizarre carve out because it only applies to males. They're the only ones who can be conscripted right now, and I would be happy to include females if they would also be subject to selective service, which I'm not in favor of. But. So then, uh, I, gentlemen, I, I, uh, Mr. Roy's time has expired. Well, the gentleman yields back. Of what purpose does Mr. Fitzgerald seek recognition? For what purpose does Mr. Fitzgerald seek recognition? Mr. Fitzgerald needs to unmute. Mr. Fitzgerald, if you want to speak, you must unmute.
If no one else seeks recognition, the Mr. Chairman, Mr. For Gates. What purposes Mr. Gates seek recognition? I'll move to strike the last word. If no other reason than to alert Mr. Fitzgerald that his mute was never undone. We've but I'm sure, I'm sure he'll be right. I have a few, I have a few thoughts on the, on the measure. It's would would the gentleman one. yield for a moment? Yes, sir. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, answer a couple of people. I'm not sure who's, <laughs> who at this point. Um, we recognize different ages for different purposes. We recognize 18 for the draft. We recognize uh, 16 for driving in some states. We recognize uh, uh, 21 for drinking. Um, so we recognize different ages for different purposes. That's all I want to say. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Could I have a second to engage that? Certainly. Would, I'll would, yield to the gentleman from Kentucky. Would, would the chairman join me in co-sponsoring a bill to raise the draft age to 21? No. And, but the chairman feels that their brains aren't fully formed at 18, 19, and 20. The, 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 the research does indicate that in certain respects, but the Selective Service uh, needs, I mean, if, if, if the country needs people, it needs people. It needs people whose brains aren't fully formed? In certain respects, yes. Uh, I yield back. <laughs> <clears throat> Hoping that mine is fully formed at 40. <laughs> I, I, I hope so. Do you, Mr. Gates? I hope <laughs> so. Yeah, we won't put that to a Not, vote. Don't wise. ask me that. Very wise. <laughs> I, uh, well in favor. <laughs> I, I support Mr. Massey's amendment. I think raising the age for uh, gun ownership to 21 of any kind uh, is problematic. And if it didn't offend the Second Amendment, if it didn't offend our recognition of the patriotism of people who sign up for the selective service, and if it didn't offend federalism, I also wouldn't support it because I don't think it would be particularly effective. So like assuming the typical school shooter scenario where you've got some like crazed 19 year old, if, if they are that determined, where they're training in a backyard like they were in the Parkland case, which was reported to the FBI, uh, if they're writing manifestos in the case of the Buffalo shooter, if they're stockpiling ammunition, like in the case of Evaldi, I think they're going to find their way to precisely this type of weapon despite this increase in the ability to buy it legally. And second, I don't think that these people wouldn't wait a year or two. I mean, I don't know that you gain a lot for people exercising their trauma a little bit later because you've artificially moved the line. So I think that, that raising the age for gun ownership comes at a really high constitutional cost and yields very little in terms of an ability to stop any of these violent events. And, and I yield to the gentleman from Kentucky for any of his neurological observations. I have no, no further comments. Yield back. The gentleman yields back. We'll try Mr. Fitzgerald one more time. Mr. Fitzgerald, you're recognized. Okay. Mr. Who? Does anyone else seek recognition? If not, then the question occurs on the amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Aye. No. 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 I had my hand up, Mr. Nevin. Mr. Mr. Biggs? Yeah. Did you see recognition? I did. I raised my hand by the little deal here. <laughs> the gentleman is recognized. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. And uh, again, I, I hope that Mr. Fitzgerald is able to get his, his microphone going. But I, I wanted to talk to a point um, that on this amendment that Mr. Uh, Mr. Gates was just alluding to. And that was, um, again, of the use or attempt of, to um, obtain weapons, plan mass shootings by people within this particular age demographic. So the, recently, well, actually, it's been a little more than recently, but uh, one thing that we saw um, about under a GAO study of some time ago was the frequent use or attempted use of fake ID of, of young people to use fake IDs to get weapons. And so that this is really not gonna do much with that, the underlying bill. But I would say out of just sheer respect of our of the young men who have to register for selective service, you would say 
if you're going to make yourself available to com by compulsory means to be drafted in to the service and have your entire life put at jeopardy and in con absolute control by the government, which is what happens when you're conscripted, then just pure respect would say, let's go ahead and acknowledge that and let allow these people, these young men, to be able to uh, obtain uh, weapons to defend themselves. That seems rational to me. And, uh, and so with that, you know, Mr. Chairman, uh, I will yield to the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Fitzgerald, if he is there. And with that, he doesn't seem to be still. So I'll yield back. Gentlemen, I'll yield back. back. Uh, does anyone else seek recognition? If not, the question occurs on the amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, aye. No. aye. No. 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 The opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. I, Mr. Chairman, I request a recorded vote. Recorded vote is, is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Nadler? No. Mr. Nadler votes no. Ms. Lofgren? No. Ms. Lofgren votes no. Ms. Jackson Lee? Ms. Jackson Lee votes no. Mr. Cohen? No. Mr. Cohen votes no. Mr. Johnson of Georgia? No. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes no. Mr. Deutsch? Ms. Bass? Someone should mute their microphone. So, they call in yes. Bass votes no. Ms. Bass votes no. Mr. Jeffries? Jeffries votes no. Mr. Jeffries votes no. Mr. Cicilline? No. Mr. Cicilline votes no. Mr. Swalwell? Mr. Liu? Lou votes no. Mr. Lou votes no. Mr. Raskin? Mr. Raskin? Thank you. Raskin votes no. Mr. Raskin votes no. Ms. Jayapal? No. Ms. Jayapal votes no. Ms. Dimmings? No. Ms. Dimmings votes no. Mr. Correa? Ms. Scanlon? No. Ms. Scanlon votes no. Ms. Garcia? No. Ms. Garcia votes no. Mr. Nagoose? No. Mr. Nagoose votes no. Ms. McBath? No. Ms. McBath votes no. Mr. Stanton? No. Mr. Stanton votes no. Ms. Dean? No. Ms. Dean votes no. Ms. Escobar? No. Ms. Escobar votes no. Mr. Jones? No. Mr. Jones votes no. Ms. Ross? No. Ms. Ross votes no. Ms. Bush? Bush votes no. Ms. Bush votes no. Mr. Jordan? Mr. Jordan votes yes. Mr. Shabbat? Aye. Mr. Shabbat votes aye. Mr. Gomert? Aye. Oh, there's, sorry. Aye. Mr. Mr. Gomert votes aye. Mr. Isa? Aye. Mr. Isa votes aye. Mr. Buck? Aye. Mr. Buck votes aye. Mr. Gates? Mr. Gates votes aye. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana? Mr. Uh. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes aye. Mr. Biggs? Aye. Mr. Biggs votes aye. Mr. McClintock? Aye. 
Mr. McClintock votes aye. Mr. Stubbe? Yes. Mr. Stubbe votes yes. Mr. Tiffany? Tiffany, aye. Mr. Tiffany votes aye. Mr. Massey? Aye. Mr. Massey votes aye. Mr. Roy? Mr. Bishop? Aye. Aye, sorry. Mr. Roy, you have to turn your camera on. Aye. Mr. Roy votes aye. Mr. Bishop? Ms. Fishbach? Aye. Ms. Fishbach votes aye. Ms. Sparts? Ms. Sparts? Yeah. It's a bill. It's a bill. Ms. Sparts? Sparts votes yes. Ms. Sparts votes <laughs> yes. Mr. Fitzgerald? Yeah. Now, Mr. Aye. Mr. Fitzgerald votes aye. Mr. Benz? Benz votes aye. Mr. Benz votes aye. Mr. Owens? Owens aye. Mr. Owens votes aye. Mr. Bishop, you are not recorded. Mr. Bishop votes aye. How is Swalwell recorded? Mr. Swalwell, you are not recorded. No. Mr. Swalwell votes no. Are there any other members who wish to be recorded who haven't been recorded? The clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there. Mr. Correa? Correa votes no. Mr. Correa, you have to turn your camera on. Correa votes no. Mr. Correa votes no. The clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 19 ayes and 24 noes. The amendment is not agreed to. Are there what purpose does Mr. McClintock seek recognition? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The, uh, the uh, clerk will report the amendment. The point of order is reserved. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 7910. Without objection, uh, uh, the, the amendment will be considered as read. The gentleman is uh, recognized for five minutes to explain his amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, several members of the committee have asked for the Republican solutions to the uh, growing violent crime we've seen in recent years, and I gladly do so. We know what works because we've seen these policies work before. Vigorously prosecuting gun predators and putting them in jail until they're old and gray, that works. Executing murderers works. Backing the police and prosecuting criminals works. Uh, identifying and confining the dangerously mentally ill so that we can treat them and, and keep them from hurting themselves or others works. And armed citizens who can return fire works. And it's this last provision that the, my amendment addresses. It, it assures that there's at least one armed guard able to defend our children if a gunman appears on a campus, if they're receiving federal grants for, for school safety. Uh, I've asked repeatedly why we take it for granted that um, uh, uh, we're, that there be an, an armed guard at a bank to protect our money, and yet we then go berserk when it's suggested that there should be an armed guard at a school to protect our children. And the amendment also says that if the district's receiving federal grants for school safety, they must allow staff with concealed weapons permits that are valid in their state to carry those weapons on school grounds if they wish to do so. Uh, a retired police officer who's, who's become a teacher as a second career, for example, who wants to protect himself and his students against the would-be gunman ought to be allowed to do so. That, after all, is the entire purpose of a concealed weapons permit. It's for self-defense. A concealed weapons permit isn't for hunting. It isn't for target shooting. It is solely for self-defense. 
a citizen who's met the requirements of their state to carry a concealed weapon to defend themselves ought to be allowed to carry that firearm to defend the children who are under their care. You know, I, I pointed out earlier the, the incident where a gunman with an AR-15 style rifle fired at a graduation party on private property in Charleston, West Virginia, the day after the massacre at the so-called gun-free zone uh, of Robb Elementary School. An armed woman was in that crowd. She immediately returned fire, killing the would-be mass shooter on the spot. Now think about this. If that graduation party had been held on school property, the result would likely have been dozens of innocent people dead and wounded because that woman would have been legally forbidden from having that gun on the school ground so that she could return fire. They would have had to, to wait many agonizingly long minutes until the police arrived while the gunmen run amok. That's what happened at our schools time and again when they've been attacked by gunmen who do not obey those laws. So the question is, are we willing to protect our children in our schools with at least as much force as we protect our money at our, in our banks or, or for that matter, the merchandise in our mall? This is something that can be implemented immediately that could well have stopped the massacre at Ubaldi, just as it did stop the would-be massacre at Charleston, West Virginia the very next day. This amendment doesn't depend on criminals obeying the law. It doesn't depend on someday, ever so slowly, maybe reducing the availability of the 400 million firearms in the country today. It does not make self-defense harder for honest and decent people. And in fact, it makes self-defense easier for honest and decent people, and it makes future attacks on our schools much less likely to succeed and infinitely more dangerous to those who are contemplating such an act. That's the simple issue this amendment ad addresses. Our children in our schools as worthy of protection as the money in our banks or the merchandise in our shopping malls. That's the question. I yield back. Would the gentleman from, uh, from California Does yield? The, would the, the gentleman, yes, the gentleman yielded back. Yeah. Does the gentlelady insist on a point of order? I insist on my point of order. Can you state it? Oh. This is um, out of the scope of the legislation, although a good intent, um, it is not tied to the programs in the legislation and therefore uh, is not germane. Uh, the chair is prepared to rule. Uh, I agree with the point of order. This, this uh, amendment amends a, a, a program that is not within the bill and is therefore outside the scope of the bill and is therefore not germane. The amendment is not germane. Are there any further amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? I, if there are no further amendments, I have an amendment. for what purpose does Mr. Massey seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk dealing with the uh, Nick's report. The, uh, reserve a point of order. Point of order is reserved. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 7910. That objection to the amendment will be considered as read. And the gentleman is, is recognized for five minutes to explain his amendment. My amendment is, is simply a reporting amendment. We need to get some information from the uh, DOJ, from the Attorney General, on the existing gun laws. Right now, the NICS background check uh, for the latest year that we have numbers issued 112,000 denials, yet only 12 of those were federally prosecuted. So presumably, they were rejected. I mean, the presumption is that you're rejected because you were an ineligible per person to buy a firearm and you tried to buy a firearm. Why weren't they prosecuted to a greater extent? Why were only 12 out of 112,000 prosecuted? It's because the dirty little secret is most of those are false denials. Now, you might say, well, it's better to be overly safe than to let a few through the cracks. The problem is that the current system is riddled with errors. It, uh, if you have a similar name, phonetic, phonetically pronounced or, or spelled, to somebody the else, yield? Uh, the gentleman yield. 
let me let me finish my amendment and then I'll okay. yield I'll happily yield okay. to the chairman. So what happens with the false denials is that um, within racial and ethnic groups that share similar surnames and first names, you get a higher percentage of false denials. And uh, a lot of some of these false denials are overturned, but a lot of them are not. And individuals who don't have the money or the resources to pursue the, this legally often uh, either have to turn to individual sale or they don't complete the purchase at all. Yet they were law abiding citizens who had the misfortune of sharing a similar name. The problem with this, and this is why I want, I want this report, is uh, we're fairly certain that black males are three times more likely to be falsely denied during the next background check, and that is Hispanic males are twice, two times more likely to be denied uh, falsely during a NICS background check because they share within their racial and ethnic groups similar names to people who are incarcerated. And we do have over-incarceration in this country, and there are a lot of black males incarcerated, so that you have the misfortune if you're a law-abiding citizen within that racial group and you with the similar name that you are more likely to get a false denial. So what my amendment seeks to do is to require a report and this wouldn't turn over any personally identifiable data. All of this data is collected on the Form 4473. They have the data. They need to give it to us so we can determine if there are racial disparities. And this report would require the, the Attorney General to, um, to tell us how many uh, background checks and were determined ineligible, how many people based and report this by race, ethnicity, national origin, sex, gender, age, disability, average annual income, and English language proficiency if available. And most of those demographic uh, data points are available. And I'll, if there's nobody else that wants to speak uh, during my five minutes, I'll yield back to, oh, I'll yield to the chairman for his question. Okay, I'll yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, does the gentlelady insist on a point of order? Mr. Chairman, I, I don't insist on my point General of order. General does um, not insist on a point of order, and uh, we are prepared to, take, to accept this amendment. Well, then I will allow you to accept it, <laughs> and I will not request a recorded vote. You, you don't want to question my judgment. I, you have great judgment on this regard. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Are there any further amendments? For what purpose does Mr. Fitz Fitzgerald seek recognition? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have uh, an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Point of order. Point of order is reserved. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 7910, offered by Mr. Fitzgerald of Wisconsin. That objection, the amendment will be considered as read, and the gentleman is recognized for five minutes to explain his amendment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, in uh, 2018, in uh, the state legislature, we actually were able to develop and uh, move a bipartisan effort uh, in relationship to a special session that had been called by our governor at the time. Uh, we worked uh, together to pass a bill, and then a act was put in place, Act 143, it appropriated $100 million in fiscal year 1819 to award school safety grants throughout the state of Wisconsin. They went to districts and private schools, independent charter schools were eligible, as well as uh, tribal schools. Uh, it, it required that uh, the schools submit safety plans uh, to improve their physical security uh, to the uh, Attorney General, to DOJ in Wisconsin. Um, the bill was an unbelievably tremendous success in our state. Uh, DOJ awarded $94.5 to 1,325 school safety grant recipients. Um, and, uh, you know, what we thought we would do after talking to myself and Congressman Tiffany is just kind of uh, repurpose some of the dollars that are already re 
related to the bill and and simply see if we couldn't uh, find a way of allowing either states that have already moved forward with something like this. And, and a lot of these things were initiated as a result of uh, Parkland, the uh, Stoneman Douglas High School. Uh, or if there are states out there that are contemplating making these moves. And, and you know, if you look at the eight bills that are before us today that have been pushed into this omnibus bill, and I even question whether or not some of this stuff has been cross-checked, especially on the personal uh, security items included. But if you look at them, none of them really address what just happened in Texas. Uh, it, there are definitely weaknesses when it comes to physical security in a lot of these school buildings. So, you know, what I have is an amendment that I think is crafted in a way it's not heavy handed. It doesn't just say that the federal government will in fact just issue these credits directly. It would be in working with the states to develop a strategy where, it, you know, and I heard some of the other members today say that, you know, hardening schools is not the answer, but quite honestly, I think, you know, a lot of people say if there's anything we can agree on, it would be to improve the physical security of these buildings. Some of them old, they were built in the 30s and 40s, and, and this stuff hasn't been addressed. And I mean, we could make this available. I think in a bipartisan fashion, there is support for this type of concept. And at the end of the day, I think that's that's one thing that we're kind of looking for here. So I, I would hope that we could uh, add this amendment uh, to this bill, and and it might be something that would garner some bipartisan support. And uh, and I, before I yield back, I did want to make a comment about one of the earlier amendments that was offered by Mr. Massey. You know, in 1981, I went to basic training in Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and uh, there were 40 17-year-olds, maybe some 18-year-olds. I remember uh, we were all issued M16s. And uh, we use those on live fire ranges. We uh, were taught to assemble, disassemble, and clean those weapons and take care of them like they were our own. So the idea that a 17 year old isn't up to or certainly doesn't have the ability to understand how a firearm works or whether or not they can be responsible or trusted with one, it's happening in our armed services each and every day a new group of basic trainees make their way through, doesn't matter whether it's the Army, the Air Force, or uh, Marine Corps. So I, I just put that out there as uh, something that is real and it's happening each and every day. And I hope that the members think about that before they may uh, jump too quickly on some of this legislation that I think is uh, moving hastily and uh, has not necessarily been thought through. So with that, I would yield back. The gentleman yields back. Does the gentlelady insist on a point of order? I do not insist on my point the of order. The gentlelady does not insist on a point of order. I recognize myself in opposition to the amendment. Uh, the amendment is well-intentioned, clearly. Uh, unfortunately, it would condition participation in the Firearm Safe Storage Program, which we want to uh, uh, promote. We want uh, wide participation in the Firearm Safe Storage Program for obvious reasons. And this would condition participation in the safe storage program on an unrelated program best addressed in the Ed and Labor Committee. So uh, I would, with all due respect for the, for the good intentions behind this amendment, I think it's ill-advised uh, to, uh, uh, to, to, to condition uh, participation in the firearm safe storage program uh, on any other program, because we want to encourage it, and especially on a program that's as, as best addressed in another committee. I yield back. Is, for what purpose does Mr. Tiffany seek recognition? Move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you. Um, in spite of what President Biden says uh, that it doesn't help to harden schools, we found out, as Representative Fitzgerald said uh, in his remarks, that it does help in Wisconsin. And I've actually seen it in schools that my kids uh, have attended over the years. I was one of those people that I was really skeptical of um, putting limitations on how people enter school buildings. After all, I remember 40, 50 years ago when I used to go to school and you know we we're it was easy in, easy out. But you know, the world has changed and we in Wisconsin, we changed in 2018 and we offered these grants. And as 
uh, Representative Fitzgerald said they have been successful. Um, the one drawback that I heard from a few school administrators that I called last night, they said, we wish we would have had it sooner because we had already acted, but many schools had not acted yet and they were able to take advantage of it. In fact, I think there was over a thousand schools in Wisconsin that took advantage of this um, to, in many cases, harden their schools and make them safer. So it was a successful program. Um, and in talking to uh, one of my former colleagues in the legislature last night, they said they're considering additional measures. Um, and I think that gets to the other point in regards to um, uh, putting this hearing out in such a rushed manner. Um, we should be taking a look at what is the responsibility of the states also, because even like in regards to red flag laws, I think it's chapter 51 of the code in Wisconsin that there is a commitment procedure that's already in place in Wisconsin to deal with someone that has uh, psychological problems, whatever may be a threat to the community, um, that is already in place. And I think as we're seeing, including with your comments, Mr. Chairman, about uh, just a minute ago saying, well, this is well-intentioned and uh, there may be a place for this. We've been hearing about this on amendment after amendment here today. And it goes to show when you rush a hearing on only a couple days notice to do it for um, messaging purposes and not consulting, um, not just with us in the minority, but with many other people also that are out there in the public, maybe having detailed hearings about this as far as what actually should be done and really being serious about this rather than just using it for messaging purposes we would end up with a much better product. And um, I think Representative Fitzgerald has come forward with a very good amendment here, and I really urge support of it. It's been successful in Wisconsin. I think it's been alluded to by others that it's been successful in Florida. And um, I think it's two good places for us to look as examples of what can work to stop and uh, hopefully prevent additional horrific um, um, events like happened in Uvalde. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back for purposes, Mr. Cohen, seek recognition. Strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. Uh, I watched the entire markup in my office when I was not here, and I've noticed several commonalities, common themes that go through the Republican amendments. Not one would result in any ammunition not being sold, produced, or out there. Not one would reduce a gun or a rifle, assault weapon, or any other weapon from being in society. Uh, nothing would hurt any of the NRA's business partners and they would lose a single penny because the ammunition and the guns would continue to be available and sold and legal and no matter what. And that seems to be their theme. They come up with some ideas about recommending that people that could be 70 or 60 years old, retired military or law enforcement, go to the schools and pr provide the uh, security, which was not provided in Uvalde by people who were trained and had been in training just in December of 2021. And despite that, they were totally incompetent. And some of them have said that we have rushed into this. We didn't rush into background hearings. Uh, we had two background check bills that passed this Congress, supported by 90% of the public. They were not rushed. They had nary a Republican vote. So regardless if we give the Republicans long time to think about bills and lots of notice or very little notice, they vote the same way. They vote no. There is nothing we can do to bring them along, except maybe one or two of the folks who had the guts and the courage and the honesty to vote to impeach Donald Trump or to impanel a January 6th commission to look into the worst and most concerning act ever done against this country, an insurrection to overthrow the government and destroy disturb the rightful election of the President of the United States. Other than the people who had the guts to do that, 
we don't have a hope for a vote. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. For what purpose does Mr. Owen seek recognition? Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as my colleagues have expressed today, there are no words to describe the horrific uh, tragedy that occurred at Rob's uh, elementary school. I'm a father and a grandfather. Every life is a gift. I know this from my experience of raising a beautiful family. I have uh, my entire life as a parent leaned on my Second Amendment rights to protect them. This markup is a hasty, unserious, and not designed to find true bipartisan solutions. We need to look at real solutions that actually improve the safety of the classrooms. This package is completely political, and this is the mark of true progress. It is a disgrace that we have we're, that uh, to those who we have lost and their grieving families. As we work across the aisle to champion evidence-based solution, it is very important that the victims and their grieving families are front and center in every conversation we have, not the politicians or the political talking points. Tomorrow, I'm introducing a bill to use the unused COVID funding from the American Rescue Plan to improve classroom safety and to harden schools through evidence-based security measures. I welcome my colleagues from across the aisle to support this common sense solution to protect our children. My bill will clarify that school districts can immediately amend their plans under the American Rescue Plan and to use those funds to address without delay their safety, the school safety needs. It will, be, it will require the states immediately approve any amendments that allow schools to begin this process without delay. <clears throat> the Luke and the Alex School Safety Act that is now in the House, shepherded by with the bipartisan support of, of Representative George and uh, Bellard, uh, directs the Department of Homeland Security to establish a fe federal clearinghouse on school safety best practices. This will be done in coordination with the Department of Education, Justice, Health, and Human Services. This clearinghouse will be the primary federal resource for, on best practices for schools, parents, law enforcement, and local officials. This bill does not require any additional funding. This bill was actually named after two of the Parkland, Florida uh, uh, shooting victims. How was this common sense bipartisan bill addressed by Democratic leadership, whose priority over the decades have been to progressively restrict law abiding and citizens from their Second Amendment rights? Remember, this is a simple clearinghouse database of state-by-state -state best practices. A day after the Uvalde tragedy, Democrat Senate, Senator Majority Leader Schumer ignored it. By design, he did not bring it to the floor. Let me make sure parents across the country understand how unserious the Democratic leadership is on this topic of securing this, the safety of our children in school settings. We have a president who states, he does not believe in proposals that's gonna harden our, schools, our children's uh, schools. We have a Senate majority leader who refused to allow for a federal database of best practices to be used nationally by schools, parents, law enforcement, and official, uh, local officials. The rejection of the Luke and Alex School Safety Act two weeks ago prevents us in the near future of gathering school safety innovative ideas to be recorded, saved, and shared nationally with other vulnerable schools like those in the Uvalde. We are committed to address violence in our schools. Our schools must return to the place of learning where students can learn free from the fear of violence of any form. This is what our students deserve. This is what our parents want. And this is what our focus should be as policymakers. The answer to this painful chapter is not continuation of the decades long progressive attack on our constitutional rights. Rights that we as Americans have not uh, that, that we are not, that's not available in, in other despotic, uh, despotic countries like Cuba, Russia, China, and Venezuela, and other countries that respect, that restrict their citizens from protecting themselves from evil. There's presently over $100 billion of unused COVID relief funds now sitting in the secondary school emergency relief fund. Let's get serious as a body and make it possible within the next coming months to harden our schools, to protect our children, and start nationally to share best safety practices across the country. For this reason, I support this amendment introduced to my friend from Wisconsin. I yield back. The gentleman yields back for what purpose is the gentlelady from Florida, from Texas seek recognition. It's a great state, but I'm going to continue to live in the great state of Texas. Mr. Chairman, thank you so very much. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, indicate uh, that where we can work together today and I hope uh, there is someone that captures that point. Mr. Massey, uh, your amendment was accepted 
Uh, and it, interestingly enough, uh, it captures my legislation, the Accidental Firearms uh, Transfer Reporting Act. Uh, and so um, uh, here we are with a moment where we can have uh, not only compromise, but agreement. So we thank you for uh, that amendment. I, I want, I rise, uh, Mr. Chairman, to strike the last word. Thank you, and uh, pardon me for not. Um, it is shocking to me uh, that uh, we continue to hear how rushed these hearings are. When your house is on fire, uh, there is no time for the fire department to build a new fire station to train a new class of firemen and women. You have no time for that. You need a fire truck. You need, as they say, the, the ladder truck. Uh, you need the pumper. You need them right now. You need them right now. I am stunned by this excuse of needing more time. If we look at the districts of where my friends have come for, from, we have documented thousands, probably in totality, or hundreds upon hundreds of deaths by firearms in your collective congressional district. Would you tell those bereaved family members, let's wait as we have done for decades? We waited in 2004 with a Republican president, Republican House, Republican Senate, and we couldn't get anything done to extend the ban on assault weapons. And we have seen a brazen rampage of young men using assault weapons mixed with the toxicity of white supremacy as evidence in Buffalo, New York. And let me take a moment to call those names. Roberta A. Drury, Marcus D. Morrison, Andre McNeil, Aaron Salter, Geraldine Talley, Celestine Cheney, Haywood Patterson, Catherine Massey, Pearl Young, and Ruth Whitfield. In addition, uh, it is important to uh, take note of the gentleman's amendment, uh, Mr. Fitzgerald, who wants to take money from the Safe Storage uh, Grant Program which would in fact undermine uh, the ability to secure young people by either, as the Kimberly Vaughan legislation provides for at the point of purchase to ensure that there's best practices that would keep young people from getting guns, and Ethan's law that deals with the issue of guns in residential homes. And why would you want to do that when we can read the role? January 23rd, 2018, Again, a situation where the gun came from an unlocked closet. Nacogdoches, Texas, 13 and 10-year-old. A four-year-old boy unintentionally shot and killed himself. A four-year-old boy in Galleon, Ohio. The previous one was in Colorado. Four-year-old boy again in Tempa, Arizona. Father in Shreveport, uh, Louisiana. Three-year-old is dead. Five-year-old is dead uh, in Pensacola, Florida or a seven-year-old, the five-year-old killed the seven-year-old. Auburn, California, 13-year-old boy, he shot himself. Uh, and after he, his brother, and others had unsecured guns. That means they were not caused to do so at point of purchase, and they had him in the home. A five-year-old in Bertal, Florida, was reaching for candy that was stored on top of a refrigerator, found a gun, shot himself in the hand, three-year-old, found his mother's gun in the living room of their home in Anchorage, Alaska, playing with the gun discharged, shooting himself in the head, pronounced dead later that day. Our house is on fire. Our house is on fire. These precious babies, we've already heard, one died trying to save others by dialing 911. Amory, others smeared themselves with blood. Others reported uh, that there are people or children alive, nine of us at least, or others. We're in a crisis, our house is on fire, and I believe that this amendment can be better suited 
uh, in working together with other committees and those of us who are interested in this issue. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Mr. Gohmert. What purpose does Mr. Gohmert seek recognition? Uh, move to strike the last word. Gentleman's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have heard that, uh, G 90% support, uh, certain things that are included. I, I can't help but wonder anytime I hear those kind of numbers, um, of support just exactly.